Hello again, friends. The great Brian Last here, you there, and we continue with Omnibus Season here on Jim Cornette's, I was about to say Jim Cornette's drive through but on the Jim Cornette Experience. And of course, joining me here at the start of the show, and you'll hear us a couple times during the show, the leader of the cult of Cornette, Mr. Jim Cornette. Boy, you just got that one out of the way as quick as possible, didn't you? I tried. I stumbled a few times. Happy New Year, everybody, first of all. Um, hopefully everybody had a wonderful Christmas. We're so caught up in these time warps and these omnibuses and the all-new drive throughs and the bonus drive through and all this stuff that I don't know where we are in the, the overall scheme of things as a time frame of reference. But I was thinking, since this is the the New Year's episode of the Jim Cornette experience. We're on the bus today. I was thinking, and you just you just told me this before we went on the air, Brian. I was thinking, oh, well, this is going to be frivolity. This is just going to be, my gosh, New Year's merriment, drunken debauchery, and, and something like the blooper reel or the, you know, the omnibus of all the vicious names we've called people and let everybody laugh at them or whatever. But no... We're going to be serious for New Year's. This is a compilation of the tributes that we have done to people that we lost in 2021. And honestly, yes, uh, a lot of people have asked, and we're going to be putting some stuff up on YouTube also of more of a frivolous nature, because a lot of people have asked about that. But truthfully, the the episodes talking about some of these legends that uh, that passed away in 2021 has had the most interest of pretty much most of the things that we've done all year. So we wanted to give people, give to people what they were most interested in over the past 12 months. We did a show like this last year and some of the comments I was happy to see because of course you're celebrating the lives of so many people that people grew up watching, that maybe you had a personal relationship with, that other people out there know and love. But you read a lot of the comments and you see that it's people learning about stuff. And I like that. I like knowing that a compilation like this, talking about the lives of so many people and different kinds of people who've touched different areas of the business at different times, that it ends up being a great point for people to learn about someone and maybe propels them to seek out more information and learn more. Well, yeah, because it's always surprising to us when we hear somebody say, well, I've never heard of so-and-so. Oh, what? The, the devil, you say. But then... <laughs> We start to realize, because you're the wrestling savant that you are, and I'm so old when I was a kid, the Dead Sea was still sick, and I've, you know, read about this and, and lived through a lot of it. We just know a lot of different people from previous generations, and everybody is not up on this, so they get a chance to learn about some of the more unique personalities in some cases that have been involved in the wrestling business. That's right, and of course, due to the nature of this episode, it'll be a little more serious in tone when we compile these segments from previous drive throughs and experiences, but we do want to remind you, if you want the normal silliness. The silliness, the frivolity, the shenanigans, the falderall. And so much more. It's available, of course, on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. We have some more omnibuses that are going to be going up for people who subscribe to the channel. You get to check those out with the amazing Travis Heckle artwork, but... If you want the normal hijinks, they are available presently as we drop this episode. And and that's for the folks, if they don't already subscribe to YouTube, and why wouldn't you? We just gained almost 8,000 subscribers in the month of December. Um, if Some of you longtime listeners may have heard some of these things, but there's so many new folks as we're hearing about. This is your chance to maybe catch up with all of these clips that you might never have heard of in in one giant fat galloping gourmet of goodness i don't know what has caused the omnibus season to trigger thoughts of the galloping gourmet once <laughs> again graham care we, we we still love you we're glad to know you're still around he's 87 or whatever and uh hopefully he won't make next year's omnibus of people we lost in 2022 but nevertheless brian lead us out from here well from there once again a look at those we lost in 2021 jim and i'll be back shortly with some words here we go well jim you know one thing i did want to bring up before we got to any of the reviews and everything else we have to talk about today was a couple of recent passings 
in professional wrestling, one guy that may have been a little bit under the radar for a lot of people, and one guy who was a legendary performer who has been away from wrestling so long that most people, I would think today, yeah. never even saw him. But let me ask you about the person under the radar first. Jack Curtis Jr. I saw passed away this past week. Yeah, and and uh, I guess he was in his early or mid 80s. He would have had to have been at this point because he was uh, he was right at 50 when I was in Mid South Wrestling in in 1984. Um, Jack Curtis Jr. The Fuller and Welch family was similar but much larger in in number and in influence on the wrestling business, but the Curtis and Culkin family was the same. It was the, the real name of the family and then their wrestling name. And a lot of people might remember the mid South wrestling fans from the eighties definitely remember the name George C. Culkin. If they were in the state of Mississippi, because George Culkin was the promoter at the time and he was based out of Jackson, Mississippi, but he and his sons, Gil Culkin and Jack Curtis jr. Uh, ran the promotion in the state of Mississippi for years and years and years. And the reason why is because uh, starting out with Jack Curtis Sr., who was George Culkin's brother, uh, they were wrestlers, the wrestling Curtis family. George wrestled as George Curtis for a while. Jack Curtis was the bigger star, but he was one of those, you know, he was always figured in as one of the main event guys in Mississippi in that part. Jackson, Vicksburg, Greenville, Greenwood, Columbus, um, whatever that Biloxi did I say anyway? Uh, I guess George C. Culkin had probably his his wrestling days were probably back in the forties. I think he may have been been in the service at one point and then wrestled in the forties. And he got more into promotion. Jack Curtis, as I said, was the bigger star. Jack Curtis Jr. followed in their footsteps and became a wrestler. And then I guess by the Last several years of the Leroy McGurk promotion days, Jack Curtis Jr. had transitioned out of the ring and into a spot as a local town spot show promoter, event coordinator, worked with the buildings, worked with the commissions, and that's the the primary spot that he was filling in Mid-South Wrestling when Watts took over and expanded McGurk's Oklahoma end to the Louisiana end and et cetera. And Jack Curtis at the time in the 80s, he uh, and I think his wife's name was Lena, I think. She was uh, running a lot of the merchandise stands because they were really starting to sell a lot of merchandise with the Rock and Roll Express and Terry Taylor and programs, those guys. Uh, business was had picked up and, and the merchandise had picked up also. But a lot of people might remember George C. Culkin's name uh, because JYD used to mention him in all the Jackson, Mississippi interviews. We've mentioned it, that George C. Culkin, as as a man that was probably born in 19-teen-something in Jackson, Mississippi, was not a fan of African Americans. And JYD found this out. And when he got to be the biggest star in the fucking territory, he would never personalize the local promos to any of the other town promoters. Uh, you know, the the various local folks in different places like what was oh god did Jimmy Kilshaw down in Baton Rouge or whoever the fuck it was but he would mention George C. Culkin almost every promo he said I was just up in Jackson Mississippi just last week sitting on a front porch with my good friend Mr. George C. Culkin and we was eating some fried chicken and watermelon and he was telling me how glad he was I was going to come down there and beat the shit out of him. and then Nikolai Volkov or whatever and fucking Culkin would call Watts and why is he talking my name and saying he was over at my house in Jackson? I've got people that know me here in this town. And <laughs> Watts would just blow him off, right? The that the Curtis, the Culkin family promotion is the ones that when I can't even remember what the uh, instigation was, but in the late 70s, when Leroy McGurk and, and Watts were kind of splitting off Watts had a piece of the office but he was fixing to start his own thing but remember but maybe you know more about it than I do why did Mississippi split off from the rest of Mid-South Wrestling for that time there uh you know off the top of my head I don't know the exact reason and actually one of the shows on Arcadia Manga charting the territories with Al Getz and John Boucher has gone into incredible detail about the history of the McGurk promotion and they even did a special episode about the Culkins and 
Mississippi. But remember, they split off. And when Watts split off from Leroy, one of the first things he did was make amends with the Culkins and bring them in to what would become Mid-South Wrestling. Because yeah. he, he needed it. He lost Oklahoma. He wasn't well, going to have Oklahoma. He wasn't going to have Arkansas. See, remember, the, the, the but then also one of the good stories about that period of time was that since Watts was already McGurk's booker and, you know, the top star and et cetera, Grizzly Smith was already working there. Watts had fired Grizzly at one point, and that's when the Culkins were running the, their own opposition to Mid-South in, in the state of Mississippi, and Grizzly went to work booking for the Culkins. And after a period of time, he called Watts and asked for his job back. And Watts, because that's the one thing that Grizzly Smith never did for Bill Watts. He was the road agent all those years, and he he did everything. He was the right-hand man. He never booked. And he didn't even get to give the finishes. He gave us one finish one time, Grizzly did, and that was enough. Watts said, I tell you what, instead of bringing you back over here, I'll send you a check for fucking X hundred dollars a week. Keep booking for the opposition. And, and, and pretty soon he went back in and they made the deal. And, and the, the Curtis family came back to work with, with Watts after running on their own, and, and which... It was one of the classic wrestling stories to me and also a testament to Grizzly as a booker. But um, but Jack Curtis was a nice guy. Uh, he really was. Um, yeah, I didn't have, you know, close dealings with him, never rode with him or whatever, but he always he came in, treated the boys nice. And he was the one that a lot of times would come in and tell you what the house was because that's what that was the first year I started really religiously trying to record as many of the houses as possible and what our payoffs were and et cetera. Um, and one time, one of my favorite one-liners, I don't know why this tickled me, but I remember it 35 years later, I think because Bobby Eaton laughed, he got, he tickled, got tickled by it and mentioned it quite a bit. I, I can't remember what the connection was, but Jack, he loved Greece. He loved Greek stuff like the architecture and, or he would go to Greece. He would take trips. And they had been on a vacation. We hadn't seen him for a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden he comes in the locker room. And I'd say, hey, Jack, where you been? He said, I've been in Greece. I said, well, we've been in a lot of hot water around here ourselves. <laughs> it sounds like something Grouch Groucho Marx would say. I don't know. Following up on what you said before, so the way I always understood it was the Culkins and the Curtis, was it that Jack Curtis Sr. was the brother-in-law of George Culkin, but George Culkin wrestled as George Curtis? Something like that. I believe. And then Jack Curtis Jr., I guess, uh, through marriage, would be technically the nephew of George Culkin and the cousin of Gil Culkin. Yes. There you go. There was a brief time in either late 82 or early 83 where Reese or Bowden went on vacation, and they had Jack Curtis fill in as the ring announcer for Mid-South Wrestling at the Irish Video Boys Club. <laughs> I, I got a kick out of him because it was a very different energy from Reese. Yeah. I mean, Jack Curtis had had some personality to him, but he was he was a little he was a little sharp every once in a while with his wit and and some comments and everything. But yeah, it because Reeser was just I mean he was a human mannequin, and I loved <laughs> I loved Boyd Pierce when he was the ring announcer just so I could you know make fun of his clothes. He wore a suit one time. Somebody tweeted this last week and it reminded me of it. I said, my God, Boyd, you look like an explosion in a fireworks factory. Uh, but yes, yeah, so you had to see the suit, but anyway, so that's a, but you know, there was another guy that was one of the right-hand guys in mid South. And then after, um, Watts sold to Crockett, I'm pretty sure he got out of the business. And I mean, he stayed down there in, in, uh, I don't know whether he was still living in Mississippi or whether he was in Louisiana or Texas at one point, but he stayed down there. There was just no more wrestling really. So, um, I still love all the behind the scenes names you would hear in Mid South Wrestling. Jack Curtis, Jamie Kilshaw, Oral Link. That may be yeah. my favorite <laughs> behind the scenes name. Like, the director. Director Oral Link. He was actually the director <laughs> at, at what what was it? KTV or no uh goddamn Channel Three in Shreveport, whatever the call letters were. Oral Link. And you know, it it those had names had to be real. And the, Charlie Lay being the uh, uh, Mid-South Wrestling president always tickled me because <laughs> yeah. he was an old-time wrestler from the 40s that just re was, like, retired in Florida. And and Watts just knew him and decided, well, okay, I'll make him the president. 
You never saw him. He was never there, but that was that was good. Actually, the in the old days of the territories, when you never actually saw the president of whatever alliance, except maybe once a year, if that, that was better. And I guess uh, also uh, the the guy that you said a major influence on the business and probably has been forgotten today. Also, uh, he hadn't been forgotten. The name has not been forgotten by the hardcore fans and the people who read the books like the Buddy Rogers book and and have you know, read the historical stuff, but you've probably not seen him work because there's so little film left, but Bobby Davis, the manager of nature boy, buddy Rogers and the Graham brothers. And, um, he was the, the buddy Rogers book talks about how Rogers got over and, and got so much, uh, pull in so many different territories because he was a mega box office attraction and he did mean money. But he would bring his guys in, his crew, the people he liked to work with. Billy Darnell was a yeah. friend of his from New Jersey that turned out to be, a, you know, a Tarzan type baby face that could do all of Rogers' stuff. And he would bring him around. And later in his, in Rogers' career, toward the late 50s, he, there had been managers before. Wild Red Berry, who was a, you know, light heavyweight wrestler and an old time boxer in the thirties and, and, you know, had a, had a gift of gab, as they used to say, when the television era come around, he had, as he got older, he transitioned to being a manager slash mouthpiece. And there had been managers and valets for yeah. Lord Lansdowne and, you know, gorgeous George, whatever, but count Rossi, count Rossi, Leo, or, Lion Newman. Um, and Leo Newman, he was a wrestler first. Yeah. They were all wrestlers first. Yeah. Except for the, you know, the just stray valets. But Leo Newman was maybe closer to Bobby Davis flavor than anybody else because he spent so much time in Texas and they do the, you know, the wash the jackass stipulation match. And Leo would wear a suit and a hat and he'd get all fucked up and they'd rip his clothes off and everything. But Rogers with Bobby Davis, and then later on Davis worked with the Graham brothers in in Madison Square Garden. He was a big fixture in Capital Wrestling in those days. Rogers perfected the the weasel manager, the kind of wimpy guy you wanted to see your ass, you wanted to see him get his ass kicked type. Um, Bobby Davis obviously was the prototype for Bobby Heenan because when Bruiser made Bobby Heenan a manager. The only manager he knew was Bobby Davis. So he, he told him Bobby's name was Raymond. And Bobby told a story. He was hanging around the wrestling office because Bruiser had told him to show up. And some fans came up and asked for his autograph. He didn't know what to sign. He didn't know what his name was. And then Bruiser said, hey, come here, Bobby. Who, who me? Yeah, you're Bobby. Bobby Heenan. But uh, Rogers knew that instead of, instead of an ex-wrestler that... Uh, you know, the people had seen get beat up and had scars on their face and they knew how to take bumps and all that shit. It was, it was even better if you got this guy who was just a smart aleck, young, you know, fucking obviously non-wrestling, non-athletic putts. It was part of one of his heat tools. He had used nature girls earlier in his career, the, the girl that would come to the ring and take his cape and do all of his stuff. And now he's got a, a Bobby Davis was actually a teenage fan of Buddy Rogers and from uh, Ohio around Columbus and had met Rogers when he was a teenager and Buddy liked him. And then later on, when he was like 19, 20 years old, he said, hey, and he took him on the road and he used I, I'm I'm reading the book and I'm kind of imagining because there is so little film left. And I think a lot of the film of Bobby Davis is with him with the Graham brothers in, in Washington in the late fifties, but Rogers used Davis probably like Lawler used a lot of his managers in, in Memphis and some territory heels that would stay there for a long time would change managers. Instead of having the manager running the show, and the manager having all the heat and their charges being, you know, the the flunkies, it was the other way around. You had a star wrestler that had a manager that was there to pass the gimmick or pull the foot or interfere or distract the referee, and you wanted some heat on him because then, you know, the, the people want to see pay to see him get beat up. But at the same time, it's still your world. You're still the star in it. And 
that was the original reason for and and flavor of having a manager at ringside of especially a Bobby Davis's type and then of course he influenced because he was with Rogers the biggest box office attraction and used in this big territory in the northeast and in Ohio and in places when they were drawing huge money it was only a few year period that he was with him but he kind of set the standard and then of course Bobby Heenan had seen Bobby Davis oh that's how you be a manager and then I I saw Bobby Heenan. Oh, that's the way you be a manager. And everybody was doing different stuff, but it was the it was the flavor, it was the gist of it. And then as you know, television got more what's the word I'm searching for? More involved and more complicated and the the promos were still primitive even back in the late 50s. But guys, you know, evolved with the times, but still it was the basic flavor of the obnoxious, irritating, loud-mouthed wimpy heel manager and and bobby apparently not, he not only made some good money with rogers but he saved it and then invested it and i've always heard this was he was one of the original franchisees when dave thomas created wind wendy's out of columbus ohio bobby davis uh had a, got a number of those and is it true or it, it, the old sunny side gardens ended up a wendy's I know that is true. That part is true. But but somebody was trying to say that that was one of Bobby Davis's and that would be that would be too just too coincidental, would it not? That was the longtime rumor and actually it came up uh maybe a year ago cuz on one of the episodes of John Rezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now we reviewed an episode from 89 where Don Rivel said it on the air that the Wendy's at Sunnyside Gardens was Bobby Davis's and I believe it's not true. It is just a myth. However, well, that Donnie Libel's always been, he's on drugs anyway. No, I love you, Donnie. Sue him for Libel. But, uh, I'll sue you for Libel. Boy, oh, God damn it, if we only had Stephen P. New a spot on the program today. But I believe, from what I understand, you know, he knew Dave Thomas from Ohio. That's how he got in on the ground floor. But his partner in a lot of those stores, if not all of the ones that he, all the franchise stores that he bought, was Merle Haggard. Good Lord. Well, there you go. So, so Bobby Davis, that's why you have not heard that name and why he, as Brian said, he's forgotten by today's fans because he was really, he started young. He was only, like I said, 19, 20 years old. He was only a manager for several years with the Rogers group, but got, you know, really high profile bookings and stuff, made some money, then invested it, boom. And and the rest is history, as they say. He really invented the obnoxious heel manager. Yeah, and, and boy, you can see those facials that he had. I'm <laughs> sure he got incredible heat. He had to have, because he's with Rogers, who got incredible heat. And then he's got those facials. And you could tell also he was, on, on some of those wrestling classic interviews, the, the VHSs that they'd release, or so, I guess some of the stuff's probably on YouTube. It's kinescope. Uh, a lot of that stuff's off kinescope, and I think it may even come from Bobby Davis. Now that I think about it, some of but, it. But you can see that even even if it wasn't a modern style interview, he was just an obnoxious. I don't say he was a, as really this, but his gimmick was just obnoxious and condescending and a you know motor mouth little punk. So I I got a soft spot in my heart for stuff like that. I get we have to. I have to thank Heenan. And Heenan would have to thank Bobby Davis. I never stole anything from Bobby Davis because I was already well into the business before I was ever even lucky enough to see any tape. But I indirectly did because everybody else did before me. See, if you would have gotten into the business, you still would have been Jim Cornette. Without Bobby Davis, we would have had Raymond the Brain Heenan. Yeah. <laughs> but a question that we received from a lot of different people on Twitter and via email was to get your thoughts about the passing of Hacksaw Butch Reed this past week. Well, and yeah, and I knew we were, we were going to talk about this. And unfortunately, the one thing we forgot when we took three tries to record the experience a few days ago, we were supposed to let people know that we were going to talk about Butch Reed on this program and we didn't do it. Um, so we will do that now. And what, how old was Butch? Was he 66, did they say? 66, yeah. Um, 
I'm going to say he broke in in Kansas City, right? Because he was from Kansas City, but he broke in the Central States Territory. I believe so. And I think that was probably, what, 1979, 80-ish, thereabouts? Maybe 78-ish, somewhere in there? Sounds right. The, the, the point is, he was good really quick. And I'd never, I'd seen, you know, the newspaper clippings. First time I ever heard of him, he was working under his real name, Bruce Reed, in, in the Kansas City Territory. And you could see by the, the pictures that he was a, you know, a big jacked up guy, but I had no frame of reference because there was really no home video then. And let's face it, the people in Kansas City in the late 70s weren't seeing fucking Kansas City wrestling on television. Um, but as soon as he got to Florida, which would have been what? Did he get there probably in 81 and then had a real good run in 82? 82, he was one of the highlights of Florida, yeah. Yeah, at, right at that time. Now, that's when VHS and home video was in full bloom, and I started getting tapes of every territory. And all of a sudden, you see this guy that's maybe wrestled one or two other places, and you've barely heard of him before, and he's in the main events in Florida, which always had a lot of talent. And was fucking great. I mean, you could tell he was green then, but what an athlete and his matches were good and he had excitement to him and he was a baby face there. So he wasn't doing those real, you know, over the top heel promos that he'd do later on in, in mid South, but he was still well-spoken and, and the same. He was sort of Ron Simmons always reminded everybody of a young Butch Reed. That's why we'll mention in a minute why they ended up getting, teamed up together because they wanted Butch in a, as the veteran to try to help Ron along when he was a, a inexperienced guy. But anyway, uh, the Florida run was great. They already had him in with flair for the world title and the people were buying it. This is a guy's barely been in the business for two years. Um, he was really a, a good baby face and you could tell he was, as I said, he was green, but he was starting to smooth up. And during that run, you could even see improvement. And then I'm thinking, did he go straight from Florida to Mid-South? Because he was there when we got there. No, I think he went to Georgia first. That's right. Yeah. Uh, no, you know what? I think he was doing Georgia and a little Mid-South at the same time because he was in Mid-South in definitely by the fall of 83. And he and who was it? Pez Watley won the 83 tag team tournament and on Thanksgiving at the Omni. Well, he was in mid South in the spring of 83. That's when he got there as a baby face. And that's, I believe where he first became Butch Reed. He had been Bruce Reed up to that point. Yeah. And, and, and I can understand that because especially Watts is thinking, look at this fucking stud as he'd call him. Look at this hoss. Big football player, his name's Bruce. Bruce Reed sounds like the millionaire alter ego of a superhero, right? So Butch Reed, and then they added the Hacksaw, and they had uh, they had uh, him and Hacksaw Duggan feud over the Hacksaw name. Duggan was a heel when he first came in, right? That's and, right. And Butch was a babyface, and then they switched later on during the course of the year. But anyway, point I'm making is by the time... Really, his first main event spots in 82 in Florida, but he's working with Flair. He's Eddie Graham was still alive. Kevin Sullivan was down there at the time. Dusty. He's learning from all these guys. Then he goes to Georgia and then to Mid-South and he and gets to work with Bill Watts. And Watts was perfect to promote a guy like Butch Reed. And I think that's why he had his best run in the ring. I don't know financially, you know, but definitely his most critically acclaimed stuff was in Mid-South Wrestling. Because there, Bill Watts uh, was a college football player that turned pro wrestler. Butch Reed, college football player, turned pro wrestler. Boom, he's a fucking legitimate athlete and a tough guy because he also did rodeo and, and he, you know, he's a legitimately badass guy. So he's perfect for Watts to push. And he was perfect for that territory because that's, you know, the kind of guys they bought. And, you know, a lot of people have said the reason why that 1984 business was so good was Watts' best year ever because the, the smaller guys came in when they'd seen a steady diet of the Giants and the smaller guys that Rock and Roll and Midnight and Terry Taylor, T.A., the guys that could bump came in. But thing is, Butch was as big as the, as the Giants that were over in that territory, but he could fucking move like crazy. Remember how explosive he was and how quick 
you know, he could get up and down and hit the football tackles and do the shit and take bumps too and throw the punches. You know, he was 260 or 270, but he moved a whole lot quicker and, and like a cat. So as much as the the crew that invaded from Tennessee, uh, you know, played a part in 84, Butch was huge. Even if not only the program with JYD, but then after Dog left, Butch was still in the thick of it with Doc and with Magnum and whoever the fuck. You and, know, remem- was- and remember, they said on TV the reason the dog left was he couldn't he couldn't deal with Butch Reed anymore. He right. was too scared of Butch Reed that he Butch couldn't. Butch Reed beat him. ran him out of town. Yeah. So and and I saw somebody on uh it may have been on PW Insider, might have been Mike Johnson, say, you know, it would have been great if Watts had just gone ahead and switched Butch babyface to replace the dog instead of bringing in master g george wells and then trying with i think a snowman at one point whatever the fuck but the thing is it may have helped new orleans because we've talked about it the loss of dog hurt new orleans and new orleans didn't recover but for most of 1984 the rest of mid-south was dog free and did its record business ever especially the oklahoma end in houston so I think it would have cost him money. People would have still taken it that uh, as obvious that they were they were trying to replace JYD with his arch rival Butch Reed. Um, it wasn't a thing where you could do the deal where when Ron Wright switched babyface when Whitey Caldwell got killed in a car wreck, and that that was an emotional you know heartstring tugging thing. Well, Dog hadn't been killed; he just left for the WWF, right? So it, to have his hated rival suddenly take that spot it would have been obvious and butch drew better as a heel the rest of that year than he had b- before it and they still used him on top and into 85 and then they switched him babyface a year or so later um well no he switched uh towards the end of 84 didn't he because they did the thing where you were in the mask still and you sold son of a bitch. That's, right. That, that's right that was Akbar. in november yeah well, we taped it in November. We were on the way out. We were doing the scaffold matches. I sold Hercules to Akbar. So they aired in December of that year. Point is, by and he turned on Buddy, too, and fucking, because Buddy was trying to, Akbar was giving Buddy bribes and Rolex watches and things to try to get his his good friend Butch Reed to sign with Devastation Incorporated. When Butch found out about it, he knocked Buddy, and Buddy took like the 13 of the most ridiculous, unique bumps ever every time Butch had punch him but anyway it later on yes he and butch was great and uh, as a baby face there because people believed in him by then and we've talked about when brandy did that that one epiphany she had where she suddenly became one of the greatest promos in the business for five minutes that one week she channeled butch reed in mid-south it and just the whole flavor of the promotion the style of the matches they had the way that the guys that Watts liked to push and the way he liked to push them, Butch Reed was tailor-made for that. And he was a great guy in the locker room, too. When we first got there, we hadn't met a lot of these guys because Butch, Nikolai Volkov, uh, Crusher Darso, later on uh, Crusher Khrushchev, and later on Demolition, um, Ernie Ladd, my God, I you know, I'd seen Ernie Ladd wrestle but I'd never got to meet him before these guys had never worked the Tennessee territory and that's where most of us had been Dennis knew a few people but you know we walked in not knowing anybody except the guys that came with us and all these guys are fucking giants and but uh, it it was the same kind of locker room everybody was joking around it's just Nikolai was a 330 pound fucking kid sewing everybody's fucking jacket sleeves together with his sewing kit and shit and Butch was he was fucking hilarious he would ride your ass or he if somebody was grumpy or cutting promos on somebody in the other locker room, they were going to do this. They were going to do it. Oh, you're selling wolf tickets again. You're selling wolf tickets on this. I know it sounds like I'm doing Ernie, uh, but that was his favorite. You're selling wolf tickets, which means you're you're crying wolf. You're promo in a fight that's never going to fucking happen. You're crying wolf, right? And when when Watson Dundee put buddy landell with butch is kind of like the the little buddy that was fucking because butch could go out there and blow v8 and cut that promo and fucking be badass and then buddy could get even more heat than butch by just that's right butch that's right that's what that's exactly what i said and nodding his head they were a great fucking pair um i told you about the car wreck in bunky right 
Should I tell that story again for the for the modern listeners? Tell it again. However many we've got, we don't even know these days. Um, we're we're gonna wrestle at night in Biloxi, Mississippi, at the Gulf Coast Coliseum, and that's a long way from Alexandria, Louisiana. That's a long fucking way. It's like 250 miles. A lot of it's state highway. So me and the Midnight Express have left early, and we've got out there, and we're sitting in the locker room, and apparently. Butch Reed at the time lived in Baton Rouge, but he was in Alexandria, wherever they'd been the night before. Buddy was driving in his car and Butch was driving in his car and they were following each other from Alexandria, Louisiana, down over to Biloxi, Mississippi. And they're driving down the state road in Bunky. And anyway, I'll, I'll tell you how we found out. We're sitting in the locker room, all of the heels and Dundee, the booker walks in. He says, well, Budro and Butch won't be here tonight. What's the matter? They've had an accident. Who'd they hit? Each other. What? They ran into each other. Or more effectively, Butch ran into Buddy. Buddy Landell, I've told the story a million times, was the world's most distracted driver. You were taking your life in your hands anytime you got in a vehicle with him. And finally, along about March of that year, I swore off riding, riding with Buddy because I was afraid we were going to get killed. And I started driving myself whenever it was his turn to drive. And Bobby and Dennis made about another two weeks, and then they quit too when they ended up in a fucking mud field covered in fucking dirt on the way to somewhere. So what had happened was Buddy was in front, Butch was behind, and they're going through downtown Bunky, Louisiana, which in those days was about three stoplights or whatever, and it's a two-lane road, and it's through the middle of this little town. And Buddy's doing the thing that Buddy does out in the front where he's looking out the window and whistling at the girls, and he's looking in the rearview mirror with his brush in one hand, brushing his hair just like Flair would do, except Flair wouldn't do it when he's driving. And somebody pulls out in front of Buddy and fucking hits the brakes for a stoplight. Well, Buddy's not paying any fucking attention, and at the last minute sees it and hits the brakes, but it's too late, and boom, he hits the the car in front of him, and Butch is in behind Buddy, but since there was actually no warning because Buddy was just continuing on until he hit this car, he don't see until he's too late. And I guess I can tell this story now. Butch, at the time, had been partaking of a substance that you would normally find in a small glass vial and dispensed with a small silver spoon. And that's what he'd been doing in his rearview mirror, which is another reason why he didn't see Buddy Landell come to a screeching halt in front of him. And bam, Butch Reed plows into the back of Buddy. Well, when that happens, Buddy's fucking head flies forward and he headbutts the goddamn steering wheel and busts himself open. And now he's bleeding. Now there's this three car pile up in downtown Bunky. And Buddy fucking opens in. The woman in front is like, what the fuck? She sees Buddy Landell get out of the car. And I, just, I think she's like, what the fuck is this going on? But Buddy wants to, to see if Butch is okay. So he goes back to Butch's car. Butch is has his car door open. And he's on his knees on the ground, leaning uh, in, in where he can get to the floorboard of his car, where he's trying to scrape up all of the cocaine that got spilled when it fucking went forward when he plowed into fucking Buddy. And Buddy leans in and he's going, I'm sorry, Butch. I'm sorry, Butch. And Butch looks up and says, Buddy, goddammit, get out of here. You're bleeding all over my shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so finally, they got all that shit scooped up before the cops got there. And it didn't take long because Bunky wasn't that big of a fucking town. So, but then their cars were fucked up and there wasn't no way they were going to make it to Biloxi. So we had to do the fucking substitution and everything. But I think Buddy had taken, he might have taken another day off because he had to get stitches over that. But but that was the, that was the fucking great comeback to a fucking question ever asked in a dressing room. They've been in an accident. Who'd they hit? Each other. <laughs> I I said, did you know I saved Butch Reed's life one time? No. I had, I had to take matters into my own hands physically when he was getting the shit kicked out of him. Had to come to his rescue. Oh, come on. I swear, well, I swear this happened, but it wasn't like I just described it. So I hated to do run-ins in Mid-South because you couldn't smarten the cops up. So we had police 
to the ring and back when we were entering or exiting for our match. But if you had to do a run in, you couldn't smarten the cops up. So you were on your own and you were hoping that you were going to get there before they fucking saw you. Right. That's that story I told about Hercules Hernandez knocking that guy out for 20 minutes and hospitalizing him with an open handed slap because he had tackled Herc on the way to the ring for a run in. Well, one night in one of the Midnight Express matches, and I, it was somewhere or another, we were involved with Duggan. I think it might have been Duggan and the Fantastics against uh, the Midnight and somebody with me in the corner, whatever. I can't remember the specific match, but the point is Butch Reed had to do a run-in and hop on Duggan, right? So, God damn it, I'm up on the apron of the ring distracting the referee while there's a big six-way or whatever the fuck going on. You know what? It might have been just Terry Taylor and Duggan. Might have been a regular tag match. I think that's what it was. But anyway, there's the fucking four ways going on. I'm distracting the referee. Butch is going to come down the heel aisle and jump in and fucking glom Duggan, right? As he comes down the aisle, and Butch was so athletic, he's running fast. He beat everybody. But by the time that they realized that he was coming down that aisle, he was already past them, except where he made his mistake was, I mean, he could do this, and it looked great when he did it. He would just dive and slide head first, like Pete Rose sliding into home base, but he'd dive under the bottom rope, slide into the ring with his momentum, and come to his feet in one motion. He was really athletic when he did it. Problem was, on this particular night, <laughs> when he fucking dove underneath the ri the rope head first and tried to slide into the ring his fucking redneck from ringside he butch got by him but the redneck was right on his tail and he fucking tackled him and grabbed him right around the legs around the thighs and had him hooked and butch was on his stomach <laughs> underneath the bottom rope his top half was in the ring his crotch was on the apron and this guy had him wheelbarrow hooked uh, by both legs out on the floor and had the leverage on him. And Butch can't turn around because he's, you know, he's on his fucking belly and he's trying to reach back, but the guy, the guy's trying to pull him out of the ring. Well, fuck, it was up to me because the cops were lagging, right? I run down the apron of the ring and start fucking kicking the guy on the side of the head as hard as I can to get him to let go. And wham, I, I, the first one, I got him good because he didn't know I was coming. And holy shit. He fucking sold that, but he still didn't let go of one leg. And now I'm trying to reach out and kick, and I don't want to fall off the goddamn ring. But I'm kicking him. Finally, the cops get there, a couple more kicks, and they drag him all the way off, and Butch gets in the ring and fucking does the finish. And then we all get back to the fucking locker room, and I was fucking, and the boys were laughing too, Bobby and Dennis, because they'd seen what was going on. And they're like, look at Cornette's having to save Butch from this guy. So I told him afterward, I said, now, Butch, I said, I don't mind every once in a while, but don't make it a habit that I've got to bail you out of these situations and come to your rat, <laughs> save your ass, stand up for yourself. I, and he was dying laughing. Of course, I wouldn't have said that if he'd have thought I was serious or else he would have killed me. But we got for a couple of weeks, we, 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 everybody in the heel locker room got a halfway decent fucking chuckle out of Cornette having to save Butch Reed from the fucking marks. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, but that, that was the thing, whether it was the, the football matches, watch like to do those with Butch and Doc and Duggan or the, the ghetto street fights, you couldn't do that today. Uh, but it worked for, for the people they wanted to see. And they would come in with the belts and the spurs and the boots and there'd be blood. And it looked like, a you know, a, I guess they don't have too many spurs in the ghetto, but, uh, and that's another thing. Butch was a rodeo guy too, which he actually did after he got out of the wrestling business. That's what one more run that I was associated with him was when they brought him into WCW and in what 89 or into 90, 89 he came in in 89, early yeah. 89. Yeah. The rumor was yeah. he was going to be in the horseman. Um, and you know, I, I honestly, at that point in time, that probably would have worked. I know that flair was a big fan. I don't know. I don't know if Flair if Flair wasn't the booker when he came in. The committee had brought him in, I believe, because Jr. was a big fan of Butch Reed's. Um, I don't know whether whether it was Flair's idea to put him in the Horseman or that was one of the committee ideas, but they wanted to do something with him, and I don't. I, I think they didn't actually present him 
as as best as they could, and that's why when Flair took the book, he decided to put him and Simmons uh, under the hoods as Doom. And I even said, I said, isn't everybody go- who else looks like that? How the fuck is anybody not going to know who this is? But it made them, it made them look like they belong together. And instead of because not many people, especially on a national basis, knew Ron Simmons at that time. And as I mentioned. That's the one thing that Rick had mentioned, Kevin Sullivan had mentioned. They talked to Butch about, you know, help Ron. You've got more experience. You guys similar backgrounds with football and Florida, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, Ron was able to learn a lot there from from teaming up with a, a guy that had more experience. But then when they dropped the masks, they didn't have to use Ron Simmons and Butch Reed. They could still just use Doom. It worked anyway. They looked great together. And... You know, I I think they had a great run there. But then uh, think about this. Butch was born in, because he was 66, he was born in like 1955. In 82 in Florida, he's 27 years old. Wow, what shape he's in. In 84, 85 in Mid-South, he's 30 years old. And that's his, you know, best work. By the time he'd gone to the, had the run in WWF, you can't hold that against him. Because everybody fucking everybody's quality of performance fell in a hole up there, um, whether it was the schedule or whether it was just the fact that they didn't really care about the matches. Uh, most of the guys at that point, everybody gained weight, everybody slowed down. Um, the Doom Run was the best, the last best run of his career, and they had great matches with the Steiners and everybody else. But at that point. In the early 90s, now Ron's almost 40, or Ron, not Ron, but Butch is almost 40, and his knees had been bad since before Mid-South, and I think that's there was no territories to work anymore. He'd been to the one place, what didn't really like it. He'd had a good run in the other place, and there wasn't much left to do. I think at that point, he, you know, that's when he decided to do the rodeo thing. But I, I remember when we first got to Louisiana, and Dennis Condry had kind of a sarcastic sense of humor, but we watched Butch one time getting dressed, putting his knees on, putting his knee braces, uh, the wraps of the knees, and then the tape of the knee, and then the knee braces. And finally, Dennis said, fuck, Butch, if you go any further, it's going to look like you got polio. And then Butch <laughs> gave him, I don't know, Butch gave, because that's the way the guys talk to each other back then, but Butch gave him a look like, hey, motherfucker, and Dennis, I'm, I'm just, I'm just ribbing, I'm just ribbing. But he, they were bad then. So, I just a, a lot of guys had bad knees coming from a football background. So, I think by the you know by the early nineties, he had probably, uh, even if there were territories, he had done his best stuff in the ring at that point. But I, I you know, I always liked him. Got a kick out of him. Fucking promos day, promo days. He was hilarious. He could turn that shit on and off when we'd be sitting there at Channel Three in Shreveport. Uh, doing the local promos for all the mid south towns, it was the the most reliable guys. Obviously, were JYD when he was there because he could talk. But Duggan was an all star. Buddy Landell, Butch Reed, and then you know uh, me and 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 Magnum TA. He didn't have the fucking promos that would just have us rolling in the aisles, but he got pretty consistent then but most all the top guys could talk and and they you know they'd pop you and and butch was great to fucking listen to so i i really liked him i hate that i i guess he wasn't in bad health for a long time did i hear he just had recently had a couple of heart attacks and then boom that was it yeah that's what i had heard as well but uh you know and and he's another guy that a lot of people are overlooking because they saw him in with the bleach blonde gimmick and the WWF and what 88 and the, uh, 86, okay. 87, 80, 88, whatever. Yeah, the thank you. Thank you. You savant, uh, the natural, I said the natural Dustin was the natural and Butch was the natural. Uh, but anyway, it, it, go back and look at the mid South stuff. Tr- try to find some of the Florida stuff. Mid South is probably easier. The Houston arena matches, you know, Butch Reed could go and a lot more. Uh, di- as a matter of fact, didn't uh, it was even on Twitter, old powerhouse Hobbs, Will Ho- Willie Hobbs, as they called him over on AEW. Um, somebody had made mention that Butch had had good things to say about 
Hobbs, and that's is the same kind of fucking guy, raw talent, big guy, but with a lot of explosiveness. And so I think Butch saw some of himself in in Hobbs. We'll see if that works out for him. But that's that's who some of these guys like Hobbs and et cetera ought to be watching tapes up to to see how to fucking make an impact and have people taking you fucking seriously. Fantastic in Mid South. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get that version of Butch Reed in WWF. I wish we had had Butch Reed in UWF in '86 when Watts went national. He would have been amazing on that roster with everyone there. But he had been burned out on that schedule. Imagine being burned out oh. on the Mid South schedule and then going to work for the going WWF. To the w- <laughs> well, as a matter of somebody said, that's why he ended up. Um, he didn't he didn't no show and and just quit like Steve Armstrong did when the mirror cracked. He just woke up in the hotel room that morning and said, "Fuck it, I'm going home." <laughs> um but he had no showed some days and then they they cooled off on him and then he was more underneath and then finally he got burnt and said, "I ah, fuck it." And that was kind of it. But yeah, going for the I can't imagine besides the NWA champion, it, let's say from 1982 to 1987 Besides the NWA champion or somebody that was on the road constantly for the WWF, I can't imagine a worse travel territory situation to be in than than Mid South and and or the early UWF expansion when they were covering even a, a bigger area. Uh, that it was just it was well DiBiase said one time that first real good main event top run he had in, in the mid South territory, he had worked for McGurk and he'd worked Louisiana, et cetera. But the first main event run for Watts, he was there for a year and a half. His hair started falling out and he hated the wrestling business and he didn't want the money anymore. He just had to fuck. And he went to Georgia where he wouldn't have to drive longer than 180 miles. Uh, you had to get out of there every once in a while, or you'd go out of your fucking mind. Jim, let's get some, uh, topics and questions that the listeners want to know about. And here at the top of the show, I'm going to mention a couple that over the last week and one over the last several days, we've heard from a lot of people. So we're going to address them right here. One, the passing of the wrestler Josephus or the question mark in the NWA, who I guess you had just worked with a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, and that came out of nowhere because he was only like 40 years old and, um, I guess they said it was either some kind of uh, stroke or aneurysm or something like that. And, and I guess there was no uh, advance notice that he was in any bad health or anything like that. I didn't know him very well, but I did work with him on those NWA shows uh, in Nashville and Atlanta over the past couple of years. He had, had worked with them uh, quite a while back because he was from the Nashville area. and. He'd worked all the independence there. He was a nice guy. He really was. And I, I hated to hear that. I guess he's got, you know, a wife and kids. Um, You know, that's uh, that was the thing is that he knew he was not a world-class athlete. And that's not to knock him because, you know, he, he knew that. Uh, he, he was uh, just a hard worker and he liked being in the wrestling business. And that's why, the, you know, he had... He did the same thing that I told a lot of the guys in OVW or I told everybody always do. He was good at different things. Um, he was doing a lot of the editing work for the revamped NWA and, and when they were doing the YouTube stuff and, and the shows in, in, in the studio in Atlanta. And he had worked with the dark side of the ring guys when before he shaved his head at one point, he had long hair so he could be their bruisey, br- bruisey, bruiser Brody duplicate in in their reenactments in silhouette and he'd had a variety of different gimmicks. I mean, you know, Billy Corgan and the, and the guys in the NWA, everybody that worked there liked to find things for him to do. And the question mark thing was, and and I can't defend it because it was, it was silly. It was silly, but the fans, instead of the, promotion are the ones that kind of pushed it i think because they realized who it was and they just liked the guy and they wanted to cheer for him um and he had fun doing it so you know i feel bad for as i said for his wife and his kids and everything and something like that to happen and and you know him not to 
he didn't have any bad habits that I was aware of. He didn't have any reputation for abusing anything. There's no reason for a guy like that, you know, to, to have bad health. So anyway, I, w I was sorry to hear about that. He was a nice guy. And even though I was only running, you know, on the NWA shows, uh, it, it was clear that everybody enjoyed working with him. And, and he was a nice, he was, he was smart too. He wasn't, you know, Joe Cephas, I'd seen the name before I met him. And here's the thing. I guess his name was Joseph. And it's a Southern nickname. I've said that before. And then I've had to say, not the wrestler Josephus, after I heard him about him being a wrestling, because Josephus is one of those Southern nicknames. Uh, and you expect to hear it. Well, Josephus went over to find Cooter at the gas station. You know, it's one of those. And it just means any fucking guy, right? But he took it and ran with it. So anyway, um, I don't know what else to say. Otherwise, then you never know what the fuck's going to happen. Well, Jim, let's take a short break in the action. I wanted to talk to you while I actually have you before you run off to do something. There's so many things you have to do, as we all know, and the store is not even open. Well, that's right. You know, but I had Hotchkiss Featherbottom over here to the castle just yesterday, and we got some big plans for 2022, including me not working my fingers to the bone or furrowing my brow as much as I have been and, and better service for the people. Cause you know, I'm getting older and it's harder when I get up in the morning, I'm lugging those three or 400 pounds of boxes over to the post office, or I'm putting in the new shipping supplies, whatever the case may be. My shoulders are sore. My back is sore. You know, I got the bad hip. I've also got the bad knees and my taint, my taint sometimes just kills me it just aches especially in cold weather well folks whatever you've got in the way of body pain and soreness whether it's age or activity or whatever the folks at home medics can fix it out or fix it up well they can fix it up and work it out that's why you got to check them out they've got a whole line of massage products from a massage gun with built-in hot and cold technology, and Brian Last mentions to me that it does not use bullets. No bullets. It's just a massage gun in name only. Yes. You can't hurt anybody with it. Well. But you sure can massage those sore places in your back and various other places. It's for external use only, though, this type of thing. Of course. And they've got, <laughs> of course, yes. Well, they used to have the labels on those things at Spencer's Gifts for external use only. Anyway, there's also... The massage cushion. You can put this thing in your chair, even your squeaky desk chair, Brian, and and it massages you the backs of your legs and your shoulders. I'm leaning back now away from the microphone to show you how versatile it can be. Um, or you can lay down on the floor and lay on this thing. Don't lay face down because it will potentially rattle your teeth. But um, they've got a three-in-one foot massager. You stick your feet in this thing. And boy, it's vibration so powerful, it loosens the muscles in your legs and lower back. But they will pay to have them reattached if for some reason they come all the way off. However, the moral of the story is Home Medics has massagers that address your pain points from head to toe. They are a family-founded Detroit company. They've been around since 1987, and they want to help make people's lives better. They are the established leader in wellness and home health innovations backed by traditional wisdom and modern technology and a bunch of that Detroit doc muscle. They're backing you up, boy. They've got an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. They went to the Business Bureau and said, you better give us an A-plus, and you can join the millions of customers who trust the Homedics family, Mr. and Mrs. Ho and all the little hoes, to take care of their families. Folks, Right now, if you go to homemedics.com slash Jim Cornette, that's H-O-M-E-D-I-C-S dot com slash Jim Cornette and use the promo code Jim Cornette, you're going to get a free portable phone sanitizer with $100 or more in massage products, which right there, that's a $60 value. Homemedics.com slash Jim Cornette. Use the promo code Jim Cornette for your free Portable phone sanitizer. Can you imagine all of the earwax and the nose boogers and the slobber and the mess and the fingerprints and the germs and the pathogens and the amoeba and the molecules and the whole molecular makeup 
of what is on your portable phone, you need that thing sanitized, even if you don't let Home Medics rub you the right way. HomeMedics.com slash Jim Cornette, promo code Jim Cornette. I wonder how many of the things that are on your phone come directly from your fingers, as opposed to anything you would actually pick up through the air. Well, a lot of it. And I would think most of it. For heaven's sake. Yeah, most of it, because you got your fingers right there on the thing, and who knows where your fingers have been, as my mother used to say. Well, I think you would know where your fingers have been, but... Let's find out where... Well, not always. There was this night in Milwaukee. All right, let's 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 stay on target here. And let's get back to the omnibus, of course, those we lost in 2021. Jim and I will be back shortly. Let's go back to the omnibus. Jimmy Crockett passed away this, this past, just a few days ago, as we record this. And we had done... Was it last week on the experience or was it this past week on the drive-thru? We it was the drive-thru that? on Tuesday. Because we had just heard that he was sick and in the hospital and in bad shape. And so it that's last week's drive-thru that came out on March the 2nd or elsewise. You, it's, the clip is on YouTube, but it's a considerably lengthy discussion of Jimmy Crockett and my, some of my experiences working there at the time and, and the Carolina territory and just the history of the Carolina territory. But, you know, it's kind of funny and ironic in a way that the wrestling war of the eighties, that was really, I mean, I, I'm so over the attitude era and the Monday night wars. I didn't like the product in a lot of cases on either side. And even though I was on one side, I was at, at one point ambivalent about which one won. But the real wrestling war that shaped what we're still looking at today as modern wrestling uh, was the one in the 80s with Jim Crockett Jr. and Vince McMahon Jr. Their fathers had both started in promotion in the, in the 30s. And it came down to two second-generation promoters Two Southerners, but one that wanted to be a Northerner, one that was proud to be a Southerner. They, it was almost like, goddamn, you know it's a fucking trivia fact. In the Civil War, both of the presidents of the United States and the Confederate States were born in the state of Kentucky. And both of the promoters in the two-horse promotional race in the 80s were born in the state of North Carolina. But Vince had an unhappy childhood and could never get past that and had a grudge against the South since that time. And Jim Crockett Jr. came up in a well-to-do family uh, with the probably the relationship that Vince wishes he had with his wrestling promoter father and w- loved and was proud of being from the South and would never have gone anywhere else and just wanted to promote wrestling, like we said, in the Carolinas. And I think that's the... That's another one of the ironic parts that, you know, maybe it was personal with Vince and, and Jimmy Jr. because he could Vince could see some of himself and what he might have done or what he could have done or been or whatever in Jimmy. Would I wonder would Vince if Vince had a better relationship with his father, would he have wanted to conquer the world? Or would he have just been like Jim Crockett and happy to be a family business and and well-respected in his area and successful enough for people that didn't want to own the world. I don't know, but it's, uh, anyway, this is, you know, who's left, uh, Bill Watts of the great uh, Bill Watts, Jerry Jarrett of the great territory promoters. Who else? I'm trying to think Vern's gone. Fritz is gone. Graham's gone. Um, yeah. It's, it's, well, I mean, like, Antonio Inoki. Well, I mean, the territories in the United States. I'm just States. thinking but promoters you, from that, that period that of time. Era, yeah. yeah, Baba's gone. Emile Dupree? Is he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, I, yeah, I said this on, on Twitter. I said it last week on a program. I'll say it again. If Jim Crockett Promotions was still in business, I don't know that I would have ever left Charlotte. I loved working for that company, not only because the talent was great and the wrestling was outstanding and the the territory, the people loved wrestling there. And I loved living in Charlotte, North Carolina. 
since I've been back in recent years, it's gotten big. It looks like a big northern city now, but when I lived there, it was green and it was southern and it was the weather was mostly good and people were friendly and great places to eat. And but the the wrestling promotion there, you were a a local superstar. You were more over than you know than the local television news celebrities or there was as we mentioned no professional sports back then in the carolinas except for auto racing but you know even though the heels had heat and there were certain places you didn't want to be in public uh because of that heat they respected the wrestlers in that territory too they hated the heels and still respected them if that makes any sense but it wasn't like looked down on like a substandard form of entertainment or, you know, the, the wrestlers were stars and wrestling was big. And that was because of Crockett promotions and the way they took care of their business all those years. And to exist in anything for as a business for 55 years with only three people running it, Jim Crockett, senior john ringley for a couple of years the francis's husband the son-in-law and then jim jr three people running a company in 55 years ain't bad and the records they set and the attendances they had so jimmy crockett did turn out to be now that all things are considered probably the second most successful wrestling promoter of the 20th century behind vince mcmahon jr so is there something to be said there for someone who had wrestling people? He was a wrestling promoter, but he wasn't really coming up with the angles and no, he, doing he, he was hands off in a lot of ways. The only time that Jimmy Crockett was ever a booker in his life was that six week period between the time they fired Dusty and the time they brought George Scott in when TBS had bought the company. And he came to us and at the time he said, I'm not a booker. He said, I've been given this spot. I'm going to do maintenance, a maintenance show in those days. You would know a maintenance show would just keep everything going. Don't start anything and don't really cut anything off. Just keep it going. And of course, he violated his own rule when he booked that match for Randy Rose to leave town. Uh, but he knew he wasn't a booker. He hired, he had bookers and he had wrestling experts his whole run as, as in running the company. Um, whether he inherited George Scott when he first took over the company and then there was a period of time there where they, they tried the deal where they had a couple of different bookers because they had such a, even though it wasn't a big geographical territory, as we mentioned, North and South Carolina and Virginia, they would have up to three live events per night running. So for a period of time there, Ernie Ladd, I think was booking part of the territory and Wahoo was helping out and, and who gosh, and Dory Funk Jr. Dory Funk Jr. 83. Uh, yeah. Was 83 was actually the booker, the nominal booker when they did Starcade, but that was an idea that had been fed to him by Dusty. And then he brought Dusty in and Dusty of course brought JJ to be his assistant, but Cro Crockett ran a great territorial business. We said all the reasons why that he couldn't keep up business wise with Vince on the other show the other day. But it was a perfect setup for a territorial wrestling promotion. If business went down, his overhead was low at the start. Like I said, the three secretaries and Sandy Scott and the accountant and Gene Anderson being full-time employees and then other guys, you know, local promoters in different places. But if business got lean, overhead was low. He could still keep talent, keep running his shows. If business flourished, then everybody made money. It was the highest paying nwa territory really if you were on top in charlotte the only place you were going to make more money just working one territory was working for vince and uh you know it, those towns ran like clockwork the tv shows uh, they were always on top of them they had great relations with the tv stations so it was a model territory promotion that grossed, as I mentioned, and this is lawsuit material, so this was under oath, $21 million in 1986 out of a converted convenience store. Um, and that was not the only good year. They had, they had every year in the 70s was steady. The guys on top 
in, in the seventies and early eighties were making 150 grand a year a piece or more. And like I mentioned, when I was there, me and the midnight made close to 200 grand a piece in 1986. And I know flair made two and a half times that and dusty probably as much or more between wrestling and booking. So, you know, that's the thing. And that's, if all of this other shit hadn't happened, we even mentioned on the show that even with Vince's national expansion and all the other territories going under, if Crockett had minded their own business and not have been talked into chasing Vince national and not bought all the other territories, Florida, Kansas city, maybe UWF, but then maybe not. Um, at least they got some talent and good TV slots out of the deal, but still it would have been, through most of the decade of the 90s that they could have still stayed in business in the Carolinas. Nobody, Vince didn't draw one crowd anywhere in the Carolinas territory until 1998. He barely ran live events in that territory and didn't draw any crowds of sizable nature until the middle of the Monday Night Wars. And it had been 10 years since Crockett, uh, you know, had had sold. So it, it had to be a, a turnover of a, of a complete generation who remembered, let's face it, the folks in the Carolinas from the 60s on saw the absolute best in-ring talent on a regular basis, the best matches, the, you know, the top television production of the time. They They were used to the best and they didn't want that, you know, cartoon New York wrestling. That's what all Southern people thought of it, but especially the the standard that had been set in the Carolinas, they didn't want the cartoon wrestling. That's why it had, literally it took an entire new generation to come up and be caught up in Stone Cold and The Rock and all those other guys before they could sell tickets on a regular basis, on a large basis in the Carolinas. And that's not just opinion. And that's not just me saying, oh, our wrestling was better because I was there. It's fact. They would they would come to on that first eighties expansion. Remember, they came haltingly into the Carolinas and Virginia. Ric Flair cussed the fucking Virginia Athletic Commission guy out one night in Richmond because he was letting the WWF come into the state and run against Crockett, who'd been there for 30 years and and supported all those athletic commissions. So you know, it, it, it's not hyperbole to say that people just rejected the different style. It was the same thing when Vince had bought the Atlanta TV, and it's been documented that people were calling in the station, we want our Gordon Soley wrestling. What the fuck is this? We don't understand this. It's not what we want. And I think Vince took it personally, and that's what gave a little more juice to the war between him and Crockett was that he was hearing from a lot of people. They, the Southern people want their Southern wrestling. They don't like this shit. And Vince would, did not like hearing that his wrestling was not the, the best in the world in every way. But um, anyway, it's a tribute to, to Crockett Sr. and to Jimmy for that last 15 years where he, he did take the company bigger than it had ever been before. Uh, but that they put something together like that that so many people still look fondly on. And and you know the Carolinas, the people that grew up there, the reunions always do better. Independent wrestling with the stars from those days always does better. I was on some of those big-time wrestling shows a couple years ago in the Carolinas, just the Rock and Roll Express, me, Baby Doll, whoever. The people go insane because it was their childhoods on a widespread basis, probably second in the United States only to the city of Memphis itself as to where wrestling was more popular per capita in a, in a, in an area than any place else in the, in the country. And look at what we just saw on all friends wrestling. Who are the legends? There was Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson on, you know, national television in 2021 based on what they did working for Jimmy Crockett that impressed everybody, including the billionaire money Mark. 30 years ago. So I would, I've, I've said this also before dusty would have got restless or want to go to Florida or want to do something at some point or some change would have been made. And because I was the youngest one there and I was willing to fucking 
you know, uh, walk through hell with gasoline britches on. If Crockett had lasted into the 90s, I would have ended up booking that promotion sooner or later. And I would have loved that because those buildings and those towns and those people, it was wrestling fucking heaven. And I, I can't see in, in with all those things not having changed. And t if TBS hadn't bought the company and sports entertainment become a thing and all the nineties gone to shit and the territories died, I can't imagine unless they just fired me, I would have never left Jim Crockett promotions. And I can't imagine them firing me because that's probably the one company that until TBS got involved, I never had a single crossword <laughs> with any of those people because we were making a fortune. It was the best wrestling show on the planet. And I was happy to be there. There was no reason to complain or yell at anybody. Anyway, uh, we send our sympathies out to David and Francis and, and all of Jimmy's family and friends and of course, and Jackie, uh, Jackie was always my favorite Crockett. I just saw him last year when we went to Charlotte for the uh, NWA pay-per-view. Uh, they were, they were there then, by the way, as a matter of fact, uh, and, you know, uh, between wrestling and the minor league hockey team and the minor league baseball team and the Harlem Globetrotter shows, uh, almost every traveling show for 40 years was promoted in that area by the Crockett's. So people still remember them that never saw a wrestling match. Anyway, I uh, I don't know what else to say. Well, Jim, we have some breaking news into the drive through Uh-oh. I've just received a text message from handsome Gary Kamensack. Captain Ed George has passed away. Oh, no. All right. Okay. I hate to hear that. Um, Of course, handsome Gary Kamensack, one of the Detroit mainstays. Mancuso, Kamensack, and the whole rest of the gang from back in the old days. But Captain Ed George is the son of the Sheik, the original Sheik. And we've talked about many times, is was integral in some of the famous Sheik territory stories of the, the later years, in the late 70s. The last time we spoke about Captain Ed George on the show, I believe, was after we had done some segment where we talked about the Sheik blading himself and at times just blading job guys uh, for joel goodhart he just bladed everyone yeah <laughs> and captain ed george went crazy on facebook about you how dare you accuse his father of ever using a razor blade to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was protecting the business i guess and i guess the and one of the greatest wrestling stories i've ever heard involved captain ed george from terry funk and for years, I thought it might be apocryphal. And then I asked Terry Funk about it, and he specifically said, no, that was the exact quote. But it was the late 70s, and the Sheik's territory was on its ass, and it was aging out. And But the Sheik had been very close to Dory Sr., and it used to come to the Amarillo territory when he was the hottest heel in the business and worked for Dory Sr. when he, you know, he could have been in New York, Los Angeles, wherever, but he's in Amarillo. And so the Funks go in and work a program with the Sheik and Abdullah the Butcher, and they're hot shotting because they have to. It's at that point where they've lost the TV viewers, they've lost the people coming to the live shows. They got to do something shocking. They're blading arms and they're bleeding and they're having the wild chaos and the fire. And finally, they hot shot the thing up to where the big grudge tag team match and the Kobo of the first decent house they've drawn there in a few years. <laughs> and they go out and they tear the fucking house down and boom, what there is of it. And everybody's bleeding and they have the brawl and they're back in the locker room afterwards. And Dory and Terry and they're there blowed up on the bench. And Terry said, I just said to Junior, I at least will get a goddamn decent payoff for this one, Junior. And just then, Captain Ed George, the Sheik's son, <laughs> runs in and says, we've had a robbery. They've stolen the receipts at the <laughs> box office. <laughs> well, goddamn, Junior. <laughs> Oh, fuck. But Captain Ed George um, shares 
a, 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 a another famous second generation wrestling personalities uh, a trait with them because George Goulas only ever worked for his father and the Sheik, and Captain Ed George only ever worked for huh. his father and Nick Goulas. That's fascinating. Because the, when when Nick had lost his friends and Jarrett had split off and and the only the, the NWA didn't want anything to do with Nick, the only promoter that would help Nick was the Sheik, yeah. and he'd send Bobo Brazil and Ripper Collins and himself? you know the guys that he and himself and all the guys that he had in Detroit down to to Tennessee to help Nick for that brief time. And George was such a pariah. In in wrestling circles, that the only uh, he he got sent one time he got to work in the Kobo Arena. I've seen the program George Goulas on the program, but he never worked any other wrestling territory. As a matter of fact, Bobby Eaton told me this story, and I've seen a picture of them together in the Sam Houston Coliseum. At one point, Nick and Paul Bosch, there was some kind of business deal, and George and Bobby got to go to Houston and see a Houston Astros baseball game because George liked baseball too. And they went to the Coliseum, <laughs> but they wouldn't let George wrestle on the show. <laughs> wow. Because, I mean, you know, it was Houston for fuck's sake. People wouldn't have got that at all. Who's this guy? But a very interesting. Of course, the uh, really unfortunate news that just broke. The other day, right before the experience came out, so unfortunately everyone wanted to hear right away what you had to say about it, but here we are on the drive through the passing of New Jack. Yeah, I know that. I guess that it had, it had happened by the time that we recorded, but nobody knew it yet, I guess. It, so literally everybody found out like just shortly after we finished recording and and then, of course, you know, a lot of people have been asking on Twitter. And I, I mean, I can't say that I couldn't believe it because I'm never surprised anymore, unfortunately, at, you know, at anybody in the wrestling business. But this came out, uh, out of nowhere. Um, and this is uh, sometimes when this happens to people that even I've known in the past, but haven't, you know, you haven't heard of them or seen anything of them in a while or whatever. But we've seen more of New Jack. He read through the cameos and 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 just the, the the dark side of the ring last year and the stuff he's been doing and and there he apparently wasn't in bad health. It was just a heart attack. Well, I mean, all right, that's a stupid state. He was in bad health because he had a heart attack. But you know what I'm saying? It's not like this had been an illness. Uh, he hadn't been going about his normal activities. Not that I'd heard of. It just it was sudden, right? So that's surprising in that part and i gotta be honest with you i never realized and he worked for me i should have had his <clears throat> his information on paper i don't know if i ever had jack's information on paper i had some i don't know if it was correct um to turn into the government but i didn't realize he was only a year younger than i was uh because he was 58 and he he started in wrestling late. I, and I guess that's I always think when you first see somebody in wrestling, they're 20 years old, right? It just because, you know, that, uh, the, the old territory days in me, but, um, but he looked, well, he looked like new Jack. He looked youthful. He sounded fresh. He had all kinds of oomph. Uh, so I always, I, I just took him as younger when I first saw him, but anyway, uh, you know, <laughs> We started talking about this just a minute before you and I went on the air, and I said, I don't want to tell all the same New Jack stories from Smoky Mountain Wrestling that everybody's heard 15 times, including on Dark Side of the Ring last year. And we had done a show about that episode and New Jack at that point in time, and it's on the YouTube channel. I'm not trying to, you know, fucking encourage everybody to go out of their way but if you just want to hear the same smoky mountain wrestling stories we did them all and talked about jack as far as a talent and and his career and how i had seen him and and got him to smoky mountain and but it, this was this was kind of 
rotten, especially because he was just starting to, he might've ended up having a little third fucking run here. Or did he have a second one? I don't know. The first to say, whatever. He was starting to do cameos. They did the TV show about him. Um, I assume as, as fan fests come back to, you know, uh, pre pandemic stages, he would have been even more popular off of that. And the thing is he'd even been, I, you know, everybody knows, I don't know how Facebook works. I'm not on face. I couldn't get on Facebook if you held a gun to me. Um, but after we had done those cameos and, and talked about some of his and people had bought them for me and everything, I, he got on the, the cult of Cornet Facebook group, uh, and was on there recently, but he had sent a message not two or three weeks ago to Stacy, you know, just to say, Hey, who would have thunk it? I'm, I'm married. I got a family. I've settled down. I'm, I'm happy. And of all the things in our life that has never happened before, that would be one of them that new Jack had never sent us a message saying, Hey, I've settled down. I got a wife and family and I'm happy who to thunk it. And then this two or three weeks later, that's fucking strange. I've had some messages from Jack in the past, but they weren't that, that sunny and positive. Right. <clears throat> but I don't know. You know, people tweeted. I didn't tweet anything because I've, as I've said before, and I'm holding to that. I don't tweet about dead people anymore. It's just bizarre, positive, negative, whatever. Somebody's always got an opinion. I don't want to hear it at that point. Um, but I did look at some of the stuff that obviously everybody was tweeting Smoky Mountain promos and et cetera. But several people tweeted the clip of the, I was doing a kayfabe commentaries video shoot. I don't know how many years ago. Um, and we're in the middle of the shoot. And then suddenly there's, there's a knock on the door and ah, somebody's knocking on the door and there could new Jack and Mustafa bust in singing. Why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? And by the book, by the time he got over to me and been over to hug me in the chair, he had forgotten the rest of the words. So he just said, and I forgot the words to this song, <laughs> but <sighs> At that point, it had been almost 20 years, right? So it had tickled me. And we sat down and uh, told some stories for 10 or 15 minutes. And they went, well, New Jack and I did. Mustafa never speaks that, you know, hello and goodbye or whatever, maybe. Yeah, you said um, they came in singing. He came in singing. Yeah, Mustafa Jack came in singing. singing. Well, actually, <laughs> Mustafa is not a mute, but he has oftentimes played one on television. Uh, he can speak. I've heard it a time or two. But anyway, uh, but I kind of, you know, I, I kind of got misty at that. And then what really got me was I saw the clip of the statement that Paulie made on Talking Smack about him. And <laughs> Heyman's just a fucking an oratorial genius, a savant even. Even the shit that he doesn't like to say, he can say it. He says it in the right way. I, in addition to turning into Alfred Hitchcock, he's starting to get Buddy Wayne's tongue. But it it actually somehow the fat tongue and the and the fat face gives him more gravitas and more expression when he makes everything work for him. He's a fucking genius. But Paul managed to make a statement and make it not be a downer thing, but an up thing. And, and actually brought almost uh, Paul Heyman brought a tear to my eye, uh, on behalf of new Jack without doing a traditional, uh, uh, eulogy. He still managed to get, he said the, and, and that actually, that would have actually, when I think about it, maybe he stole my idea. Cause it's, that's the same thing I thought about Pillman. Because there was kind of parallels with Pillman and New Jack when they got on the edge and you couldn't figure out whether they were working or not. I thought, you know, Pillman was pulling a rib. He said that would have been the perfect thing for New Jack to do is pull a rib. Hey, tell his wife, call everybody and tell them I died. See what, you know, the fuck they say. Um, And then I got to thinking it was ironic 
that it was Happy Heyman that was the reason that me and Jack were mad at each other for 15 years anyway, if, if we will recall. And I got started thinking about and just uh, without going off topic here of, of Jack for a minute. Do you think that it was part of the plot now in hindsight to make Paul E and ECW baby faces when he had Jack come up there and cut promos on me in Smoky Mountain Wrestling in Philadelphia where they were it was it was like an ICW and Jarrett situation so that Jack would say that they left uh, because I owed him money rather than the truth, which was they left because Paul told him to fucking leave and no show me so he could start them early. Which is, which is what led to me and Jack being on the outs for a while, which now in hindsight looks like a way that, that Paul Lee might have baby faced himself out of that situation. I don't know. But anyway, um, everybody that was, saying anything about Jack said the same thing for, for good and bad sometimes. And, and Jack admitted in a lot of cases on that show, there was some bad. He, the reason why he got over, he was real. You could believe him even when he was really still. So that's the thing. And I know everybody uh, says, well, you have, you had good things to say about new Jack, but you knocked the garbage match wrestling. Jack started out as a real professional wrestler. I think ECW pigeonholed him into all of the the bad points of New Jack that they could capitalize on, but that doomed him getting a job anywhere else. And, you know, and then he just, you know, he had to keep topping himself. But let's remember, Jack, as a wrestler, he wasn't the most experienced guy in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. He'd only been in the business a couple of years, but he he half he understood working, and he could halfway execute it, um, uh, you know, physically. Even at that point, he he, he was he was a promo savant genius. Uh, that was the outstanding part of his his goddamn presentation, and he looked like he should to have talked like that. You didn't have some Beavis and Budhead looking motherfucker that was cutting that awful, that awesome promo. You had the guy that looked exactly like the guy that ought to be cutting that promo. And the more that he worked with guys that had experience and could, you know, were a step above just the guys he'd been working with in North Georgia, whether it be the Armstrongs or, uh, Rock and Roll Express or whoever the fuck, Tracy, white boy. He got better. And it's only really then when, you know, in ECW, it was, it was just all about chaos. So, you you know, and then they, he, he got more into substances and less into figuring out a way to protect your opponent. And because nobody at that point really cared in that company anyway, they just started bashing each other with shit so his progression as a wrestling worker stopped there but the promos were still there and they got better it's just he had no place to give them that anybody would see him on a major basis because everybody was scared by that point to give him a fucking job so he started as a wrestler and he and he could have and that's the thing. Randy Hales was petrified when to even touch them when I was trying to find them a place to go after they'd been in Smoky Mountain for a year. And in Memphis, I can see that, you know, race relations in, in Memphis historically being what they've been. But, um, and obviously, you know, Vince at, in 1995... If they had been available, the gangsters, three years later in the Attitude Era straight from Smoky Mountain Wrestling without having the the reputation for outside the ring as well as just the shit, the, the diving off the balconies and doing crazy shit. Brian, because the WWF, honestly, in 1995 said, no, we can't do this, right? But just because of the gimmick. But if I could have given to them four, three or four years later, they would have fit right in. 
in the attitude era. Do you, I, can you see them hopping in and <laughs> hopping on fucking the, the disciples of apocalypse and the goddamn Bariquas and there was the whole goddamn thing and the nation of domination. It was the same thing. They just got new gangsters that weren't as scary. But anyway, um, timing is everything. But I, you know, I just, I hated to hear that because after all of that shit, uh, and, and Jack finally seems a happy and B settled down and C normal for once and enjoying it. I couldn't believe it. And, and he, well, we've seen those cameos he was doing. You were laughing at one. He had a fucking knife the size of Delaware. Yeah, I was saying before that, you know, it's very sad about New Jack's passing. I will say I ran into him several times and would talk to him somewhat uh, on a semi-regular basis in 94 and 95. And he was never anything but nice to me. However, I've seen videos... I know the reputation and everything, but I have like, he was always nice to me. And I thought about it. It's like, you know, sometimes when someone passes away, you think like, what was the last time I saw them? What was the last thing they said? And the last thing I heard New Jack say was him whipping out the biggest knife I've ever seen in a cameo, threatening to chase <laughs> this fan that paid for the cameo around with his knife. That's my <laughs> final image of New Jack. And I said it could have been worse because of one of the ones I saw, he put the knife down and says, if I don't get you with that, I'll get you with this, and pulled up a crossbow. But that that's what people expected. That's why, you know, that's the thing. Maybe he, it, it, regardless of where he started in wrestling or where he ended up, it may have just been a case of timing. Because... I do in in once again in the attitude era if he without the the death garbage weapons match uh reputation I think he could have easily fucking gotten a spot in the WWE maybe not kept it unless he altered things about his personal life at that point in time but he was good enough to be to be involved in the territories in the 70s, when heels could say and do some outrageous shit and you wouldn't get kicked off television or even the promotion would, would only get complaints about the heel rather than itself, he could have been, a, and if, if obviously there would have been things he had to tone down verbally, but he could have been a fucking major fucking territory heel. But he came along at a time where there was only you know, one or two territories and everything else was still, you know, on the national companies was still Disney world. And then by the time that that changed, he'd already gotten the reputation for doing things to the point where no, no company was going to, with a budget <laughs> that could be sued and, and lose big money was probably going to do anything with him. So I, you know, Amazing fucking verbal skills. And what a, just a, a, another unique personality. That's the thing. You know, we say there's no Abdullah the Butchers anymore because nobody looks like that, right? Visually. But there's so many guys that used to be in wrestling, there's no personalities like that anymore. And I'm, you know, and. I almost feel bad that, that a lot of people think that, you know, that was the, the main calling card of Jax was the, you know, the weapons matches and everything when it was actually just the fact that it was like, yes, Cactus Jack did death matches in the early days before they got out of control and everybody said, what the fuck? Uh, but he actually had talent and could do other things and had the fucking verbal skills for it and the mind. Jack, Jack may have been a, an actor in the movies at some point in the modern era when people started casting wrestlers when he was that, when he was 30 years old. Yeah, remember he, he was in Barry Blaustein's documentary. The casting director said he can't be Denzel, but he could be Denzel's friend. <laughs> well, I think he'd have probably f fucking killed Denzel's friend and, and, and fucking carjacked Denzel and gone and lived in Denzel's house. 
But anyway, um, that live promo though, because I was there in Knoxville. <laughs> that was our first night, and I had read about New Jack. I had not seen him. I had not seen him in Memphis, but I'd read about New Jack and Homeboy. But they were gone pretty quickly, and yeah, hey, that and that's one thing that that somebody brought up, and you mentioned it. I didn't even remember he'd been to Memphis, and and uh, I, he, I don't think he ever mentioned it. But I guess they weren't there, but about what two or three weeks. New right. Jack and Homeboy, and I didn't think anything of it because this was a period of time where I was a kid. But just based off the wrestling magazines, there were random wrestlers just always popping up there, winning titles. They're gone the next week. So you don't hear about New Jack for a while. All of a sudden, you bring him in with Mustafa, who I knew off WCW TV. He was, despite him being a massive guy, he was doing jobs on TV on Saturday nights. He had never won a match on TBS television. Six foot fucking four or five, 270 something pounds, that face. And, you know, they just used him as a job guy. And But here's the thing. He's the kind of guy in the old days when there was territories whoever was running TBS would have called Kansas city and said, Hey, this guy needs three or four months, you know, just give him some experience. But they, so they just beat him to death. But anyway, go ahead. So I hadn't seen them yet, but I've been reading about you bringing in the gangsters. I didn't know what to expect. I had seen the great promos. I'd been watching you and flair and everyone else for years. You don't see too many promos live, at least like that in an arena. And that was early in the show. It wasn't like that was late in the show. I think maybe it was like one match, maybe two matches, and then yeah. Jim Ross and the Gangsters. And I've never seen anything like it. It was the damnedest <laughs> thing I've ever experienced because he was off and he didn't stop. And I was in a section of smart fans and you start hearing the murmuring like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> and then, he, then he's out. Well, that's... The greatest live promo ever. I mean, it was... Because you didn't know what to, I, I'd never seen him before. And this guy comes out there and I've never heard anyone speak like that in wrestling. I couldn't wait to see him after that. That's the thing that, and part of it, part of this, you could experience in the territory days when it was regional television instead of local. But very seldom does, especially a really dedicated wrestling fan uh, these days, see a talent for the very first time that blows them away in some fashion. Because now that you can see everything and you can hear about everything, and if anybody's any worth a shit and a real, you know, diehard fan will search him up on the internet or whatever. But back in those days, the way that, that major talent got over in new territories was because the people had not seen them. And so when you came in and did a first interview on television or had the first match in the arena where people saw you for the first time, if you were a major star, boom, that was, oh shit, okay, this guy's different. But like you said, back in, it, especially at that time period even, VCR's been around for 15 years and with national television and the whole nine yards, nobody in that building had really ever seen or heard or even heard of his name and suddenly the promo is like, what the fuck? This is better than the shit we see on national television. And this guy, whether you were a, and we've, we've mentioned that the majority of the fans in the Knoxville Coliseum in 1994 were not smart fans. There might be 10 or 12 observer readers, if that, in that crowd under normal circumstances. So the smart fan population with fan week was had boosted it to about eight times what it normally was. And none of y'all had ever seen this guy. And everybody's like, what the fuck? So, but whether it was the regular fans that were like, this, fuck this guy, because he got a ton of heat and kept going, and the people were fucking yelling, etc., or whether it was the smart fans that were like, well, where, where has this been? This guy's better than if he, you know, guys had been promoing for 20 years. He got over the way you used to, and that it, it, it's been hard to do that for more than 30 years because everybody now has heard of somebody at some point before they're fucking ready. I was always such a big fan of him as a talker. I remember getting mad last year after Dark Side of the Ring because the very end of the show, 
was kind of something that, that, again, they came to it on their own because of what he said, but you and I, a few years back, were having a talk off air, and I said, you know, if I had a promotion, I would bring in New Jack as my Ron Wright. It would be hysterical. New <laughs> Jack in a wheelchair cutting his promos and then <laughs> pretending that he's a weak guy in a wheelchair, but you all know he could walk. It would have been great. And then, of course, the end of Dark Side was him in the wheelchair doing cocaine. That wasn't part of my original vision, yeah. but what a but talker. That, that, that was his uh, his fucking idea for old age, him in a wheelchair with a knife and doing cocaine. Um, but anyway, I... I... Were you going to go, were you already thinking, I hate to ask a, a wrestling uh, geek question here, but if Jericho hadn't gotten hurt... Were you already thinking like long term thrill seekers, gangsters? What changed or what didn't change with Jericho getting hurt in terms of where you were gonna go with tag teams? Oh Jesus. That was would have been way far in the future because here's here's the thing, you gotta understand in a perfect world, yes, you figure, well, I'll bring this team in and I'll bring that team and then that blah blah blah. But right then the limited talent that was available to us we couldn't have anybody that was obviously regularly that was signed to the wwf we could have their stars for occasion but nobody under contract can could uh, was going to come in regular or wcw or ecw for, and we've mentioned that most of those guys were better off there because they were from that area and they worked that style but I just wanted a new babyface tag team because I couldn't, you know, just subsist on the Rock and Roll Express forever. I never intended to finish them up, but I certainly intended to have somebody else to help carry the fucking load. That's Storm and Jericho. Let me just see if I can get these guys over as babyfaces. With the gangsters, it was a low-risk investment because... If it didn't work, they were only, they both lived in Atlanta. They were driving up anyway. I hadn't asked anybody to move and they were not, um, they didn't start out making as much money as the top heels that they became. So I just wanted to see if we could get the rock and roll and a good program with the gangsters and run that for a few months and then get the thrill seekers over as baby faces because then I had other options and I knew that at some point the heavenly bodies were going to be coming back. So it wasn't like I had already planned out and then the thrill seekers can have this long run with the gangsters. I probably would have stayed away from some of that because those matches would have been greener than pepper trees, but you can't just go with one baby face team or one heel team forever. That's why I, I wasn't upset when the, when the bodies got the chance to go to the WWF, they got the chance to make some money and at the same time, how can they? How can I miss you if you won't go away? I, I, the bodies, the people were more happy to see the bodies come back than they were to see them before they left. So anyway, I didn't have a major program all planned out in my head between the thrill seekers and the gangsters. I didn't know. I honestly thought the thrill seekers were more can't miss than the gangsters because <laughs> they were just so beautiful. Ah, uh, but as I said, Jericho was picky and Lance was married. Well, you know, you and New Jack will always be connected because it was Smoky Mountain Wrestling that put him on the map. He worked USWA, worked for Sammy Kent, but really it was Smoky Mountain that yeah. discovered him and he was almost like polished and ready to go from day one as soon as he started doing those promos with well, now, a wait, very concerned Bob Cottle standing there. <laughs> and by the way, Bob Cottle used to be a fucking aide to Senator Jesse Helms in North Carolina, who was like the fucking combination of the most conservative religious person in the world and a grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, but Bob was a wonderful person. Uh, but, it, but whenever you see that clip of New Jack saying, I, I want to send a shout out to OJ. Yeah, keep up the good work. Two less to worry about. You just see Bob behind him shaking his head. No, Bob died no. a little inside. <laughs> that's what I, oh my god! Oh my god! But anyway, no. But what I was gonna say uh, was I, and that's the thing. I wish Jack and I now at this point we hadn't been on the outs for so long and over Paulie's fucking you know Kabuki ish cloak and dagger locker room politic bullshit. Um. But 
at the same time, at least we were able to to hug and not kiss. And and I've I've mentioned Jack's warts over the last several years as well as, but I've always put him over as being he was a unique fucking talent. And I'm glad that uh he got a chance to settle down a little bit before something happened. But I you know, again, you never know. Fucking heart attack. That's why I've I prefer to use my heart as little as possible. Therefore, it will undergo as little stress as possible. When you think back to New Jack's career, you can obviously think about Smoky Mountain, maybe even USWA with Homeboy, Mark Freer, <laughs> or ECW, where there were the Gangstanators. Wasn't it him and John Cronus? Yeah, the Terminator and the Gangsta became the Gangstanators. I mean, there's so many amazing moments, so many uh attempted murders <laughs> I mean, it's just so much <laughs> so many so many felonious assaults on video alone yes it would probably be probably hey, it would a, probably no, wait, I, I, I gotta tell you one more i don't know if i told this on the when we talked about the dark side of the ring but i swear to god one night i wasn't there but ronnie west promoted a smoky mountain spot show in in north georgia somewhere just right over the chattanooga tennessee state line there by chattanooga and hildebrand hildemuffin called me from a payphone. that's how long ago it was after the show to tell me what had gone on apparently jack got so much heat with these fucking there was 250 people there and they all apparently wanted to kill him He'd gotten so much heat that some incident happened and he was cutting promos and I don't know if they were shoving or hitting or whatever the fuck went on, but the goddamn police got involved in it. And then it, when the police got involved some way or another, Jack started fucking f having a fucking freak out. With, <laughs> they thought he's, he told him he's about to have a heart attack and he needed to go get his medicine or some shit, and he went back in the locker room, grabbed his shit, and took off. By the time <laughs> that the cops got back there to find him, it was like, what the fuck? Well, I, we think he went to the hospital or something. I don't know. Hildebrand was like, yeah, the cops were going to arrest him, but then he, he convinced him he was having a heart attack. Actually, no, Brian still believed at that point, I think, that he actually had a heart attack. And I said, if he had a heart attack, what do you think he would have got away? Oh, yeah. Well, but I just wanted to let you know that, that we had an incident, but nobody got arrested. Manu Jack may have had a heart attack. That was Brian's agent report calling in. But New Jack did not go to jail in that podunk town. Anyway. All right, Jim. Well, let's uh, get a couple questions in. Well, maybe more than a couple, but let's get some questions in starting now here on this show. And as I'm sure you're aware, a topic that a lot of people have sent in questions about is the recent passing of Don Kernodal. Oh, and yeah. everyone wanted to know your thoughts, and if you ever worked with him, were you ever around him, and how much did you get to see him? Because obviously him and Slaughter were fantastic, but were you able to see that as was happening in 1982, 1983? Uh, only on tape. That was before we got to the Carolinas, but I was seeing the tapes of the TV shows, and yes, we worked with Don. I saw Don... Gosh, just at several years ago at, at the Charlotte Fan Fest most recently. Um, but yeah, the Midnight Express, we had matches with Don and different partners. When At the time that we got to the Carolinas, Don was still there, but Dusty wasn't using him as prominently as George Scott had. And yes, Not just George Scott. I mean, that's the thing. Dusty, I hate to interrupt you. I'm sorry. But uh, well, go ahead. I do want to say Dusty blew it with Don Kernodal. Because there was something happening. He was a guy who got elevated with the program teaming with Slaughter. Coming yeah. out of that, they put him with Ivan Koloff. They turn him babyface against the Russians. He's super over. And then Dusty just, that's it. You know, yeah. your time's up. <laughs> well, it's and it's not that he finished him up, but he just, he just you know, used him uh, in the middle of the card as, as one of the guys. And Don was a great worker and he was a shooter too. As a matter of fact, the story was, and it's not just a story. It's real that Bob Roop was doing a, a shooter gimmick in the Carolinas in what? 72, 73, that, that era of time where he would, except challenges and if you could beat him in 10 minutes or something i mean you know let's face it roop was a 
nationally ranked amateur, you know, uh, fucking pretty hot shot wrestler in his day, and nobody was going to beat him in 10 minutes that was making any of these challenges, right? But Kernodal tried. He had had a, a good career as an amateur and a collegiate, and Les Thatcher mentioned on uh, Twitter that he's the one that had him sign the release because it's like you had to sign a release if you were going to do this. Hey, if you get hurt, you can't sue us. And they tried to talk him out of it. He said no, and so he didn't beat Roop. Uh, but the day after or that night or whatever, you know, Ole and Gene said, hey, kid, we want to break you into business. So that's how he got started. And kind of as a trivia note, do you know who else got started doing a shoot challenge with Bob Roop that they didn't win, but they were picked for to get the Roop angle over, but because he had a little amateur background in school? William Harding. No. Dennis Condry. Get out of here. I did not know that. Wow. Dennis Condry's brother-in-law was Joe Turner, who all worked as Joe Sky. Remember the team of Joe and Bill Sky, Joe yeah. Turner, Bowman? They had a <clears throat> kind of a cowboy gimmick. Anyway, um, Dennis had just, you know, he just got out of school and, and was, you know, visiting or doing whatever, and they knew he had wrestled a little bit in – school and they needed guys to get the thing with Roop over and they said just yeah, don't get too smart ass with him and he won't hurt you well you know but Dennis but he hung in there and and so they said yeah well you know we'll get you in the business anyway uh with Kernodal you know that was the thing he was in really good shape he was a really good worker he wasn't a uh, how can I say this he wasn't like a a out of control or over the top or really colorful personality on his own. But especially as a team with slaughter, you know, Sarge, you know, handled that part of it quite well. And Don had everything else going for him. And maybe that's the thing. Maybe Dusty just did, you know, cause Don was not a fucking wild man and Dusty liked, you know, big personalities. But, uh, but yeah, we worked with him a number of times and also his brother, his brother's name was Wally, but they called him Rocky. And Rocky did not resemble Sylvester Stallone. Uh, but he... Uh, he resembled Keith Larson. Yes. And Keith Larson <laughs> was another name they gave. But, you know, Rocky, Kernodal, was... was They teamed them up sometimes when you could have the heels get the heat on Rocky, the younger brother that everybody knew was the younger, smaller guy, and then give Don the tag. Uh, but, yeah, he he was a good worker and a nice guy, friendly. You know, no issues. It just uh, and and he's another one of the guys that he got out of the business quicker than he probably would have because there was no more territories when he was finished with Crockett. I don't know if did he ever show up in WWF. Or some of the guys did, and you've forgotten well, about. It. The problem was, and it's always so weird the way this happened. So him and Slaughter have this run against Steamboat and Youngblood that we're still talking about today. Yeah. For good reason. So Slaughter goes back to the WWF in 83, where he had been previously a top heel a few years before that, before he went to Mid-Atlantic. He brings Kernodal with him. They push Slaughter the way they did previously, top heel managed by the Grand Wizard. Kernodal's basically a job guy on TV. And I never understood what the hell just happened there? <laughs> and then he went back to Mid-Atlantic and got used appropriately with the Ivan Koloff thing. But I don't, I don't know what that was. And well, I don't, and that, Dusty did not, Dusty did not want to book him. It seemed like, but, but, but that answers that question. He didn't go to the WWF after the last run with Crockett because he'd already seen what was that there. was going to turn out like. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there was no place else to go at that point. So, you know, that's, he's another one of the guys that just got out of the business early. Um, but yeah, that, uh, you know, especially that program. And I mean, it, you can capture lightning in a bottle, as they used to say, um, sometimes in some places because of the exact situation and the combination of guys. And I mean, you know, it, 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 like we've mentioned, the dream machine should have got more chances than he then he got outside of the Memphis territory. Part of it was he never didn't want to leave home, but here was a guy with sellouts of an 11,000 seat, you know, arena on his record and still, you know, never went anywhere when you've got 
a tag team like Slaughter and Kernodal and Steamboat and Youngblood that that did that massive house in Greensboro that led to Starcade. They had to close the fucking interstate exits because and have the radio announce, don't go to the Coliseum. It's sold out. They turned away 5,000 people or whatever the, the, the lore is. I talked to Sarge about it. I talked to Steamboat about it. The stories about them not physically being able to drive their vehicles to the Greensboro Coliseum and having to just stop and park their cars and walk to the building are true to get in. Um, but after that was, you know, like you said, with Slaughter and Kernodal, that was a huge run. They drew mega money and then, you know, so. But and Dusty but, wasn't going to book. Well, I shouldn't say it this way, but after Slaughter leaves WWF beginning of 1985, he ends up working Pro Wrestling USA and then pretty much primarily for the AWA does indie shows. Dusty brings him in, I think, once. And it's like him and Kernodal and and maybe Dusty, I forget, against like the three Russians. Big deal. Kernodal and Slaughter reuniting this time as baby faces. But, you know, there's there's a reason Steamboat left. There's a reason a lot of guys said that Dusty wasn't going to bring in anyone that would get over more than he was. I don't well, know if that's why Slaughter didn't come back, but you would think after WWF Carolinas, he's now a bigger star than ever before. It would make sense. He lives in the Carolinas, I think. But he ends up going to work for Vern. Well, part of that was <clears throat> the national television, the ESPN, Sarge doing the G.I. Joe stuff. I think I would have liked to have seen S Slaughter regularly in the Carolinas uh, in, in for working for Crockett at that point in time because of just the fact that he was a fantastic worker. but. I don't, I don't know now looking back, it's just Dusty brought, and a lot of bookers do this. He brought his own combination in. And if you notice, he almost, except for Flair, which was a gimme, um, he almost stayed away from guys that were over in the Carolinas under previous administrations because he wanted to do his own thing and have his own crew. And, you know, they they did record business for a reason. So part of it is not just assembling everybody that's over in that territory. Part of it is when you're a booker has been able to see in your mind, all the combinations and who you want everybody to work with. And, you know, part of the thing with Sarge was maybe they thought, um, you know, it being, because part of the thing with GI Joe and being the hottest baby face in the business at the point in time, there was, you, you couldn't beat him very often or it kind of wore the fucking gimmick down. So I don't know, but that wouldn't have been the case with Don Kernodal anyway, with, when people say Dusty didn't book people because if they could get over bigger than him, because I don't know if anybody's made that claim about Don yet that he could have got over Dusty, but I, it, that is, it is odd that he, Don, especially in that territory was so over but when Dusty was in charge, he just used him in the middle because he was there. But I'd seen Don Kernodal in Louisville in 1975 when he was almost a rookie. That was, what, his second or third year in the business. And, you know, he was an exciting young babyface, and he got, a, he got to work a number of different promotions, Florida, I think Georgia for a while, uh, Tennessee, both ends of Tennessee at that point in time. He'd, he'd been in the business by the mid eighties, 10 or 12 years and, and, you know, had quite a bit of experience. So anyway, I hated to hear that last time I saw him, he'd, I, you know, it's funny. I was always a fat fuck. And then I got out of the business and lost weight and take and watch my diet. All these guys were fucking physical specimens and they get out of the business and they weigh 300 pounds. I'm liking the way I'm doing it. I'm I'm uh I'm thinking that's might be the best fucking path is to lose the weight at the end of the life instead of gain it. That's what I'm trying to do. Don Kernodal. Don Kernodal. <laughs> Never forgotten. <laughs> no, but he was he was a heck of a guy. And and I'll tell you something else. Buddy Landell used to do an impersonation of Rocky, his brother. It would crack us up in the car. Because Rocky had big buck teeth. 
And he's working with Buddy Landell one night on TV. And Buddy was giving him his comeback, right? Well, Rocky was feeling the people are screaming and cheering for him. And he's feeling it. And he's thinking he's a world beater. And he fucking shoots Buddy off. And as he shoots Buddy off, right as he lets go of him, he says, power slam. But the way he says slam, because he had the big teeth, power slam. And fucking... (laughs) He's waiting to catch Buddy coming off with a fucking power slap. And Buddy came off with a a right hand right to the fucking chops. Boom. Put him down. Hit him with the corkscrew elbow. One, two, three. And come back in the locker room. He said, he shot me off and called power slam. (laughs) I wasn't going to go for that. Anyway, I like the Kernodles, though. They were fun. I guess Wally still is. He's, He's still around. Well, Jim, let's take one more break in the action. I did want to ask you this time of year, omnibus season, or as some people call it, the holidays, we all know, we hear you every week. We all know what you're like. You really don't want to leave the house. Right. You don't want to do too much. So what about working out? Now, wait a minute. Don't make it, but don't make me sound lazy. Well, I wasn't. I do a lot in my home. I just don't want to do a lot in public. But you're not going to join a gym, that's for sure. Oh, good Lord, no. Because that requires going out in public, and then people are sweating and perspiring on you and slobbering on you and looking at you sideways. No, what you want to do in this day and age, folks, is bring the gym home to you. Because, you know, I mentioned earlier in the program that I get sore from lugging stuff to the post office, need to be massaged every once in a while. Well, folks, if you don't have those post office runs to stay in shape, because look at me, I've got the body of a 30-year-old. And I've been asked to give it back because I'm getting it all wrinkled. But (laughs) if you don't have those post office runs to keep yourself in shape, you need, in these days and times, you need to keep in shape. You need to work out, but you don't have time to get to the gym. You don't want to go out in public. You don't want people staring at you while you work out with all kinds of unsavory thoughts in mind or just scoffing at you. Well, right now, whether you're trying to reach your fitness goals or just wanting to stay in shape, it can help to have world-class instructors. It can help to have choreographed classes with music from your favorite artists. It can help to have a community of hundreds of thousands of people who can push you on to success and top quality workout equipment. Echelon gives you all of that. Echelon is the affordable way to get the workout equipment, the workout community, and an instructor's motivation right in the comfort of your own home. Now I know what you're going to say. How are they going to motivate me in my own home? I can just give them the finger and go grab a Twinkie. Well, folks. (laughs) No, that's not the solution. No, you got to have some personal responsibility, but Echelon's going to do their part. Their fitness app provides you with thousands of live and on-demand classes with great music. You can work out anytime, day or night. Pick your class. Climb that leaderboard. Just like there's a series on the air now where Morgan Freeman uh, host stories of famous prison escapes and they're climbing the wall well this leaderboard is just a big old wall you gotta climb but you've got other people cheering you on and you can give it your all because their certified fitness instructors are supportive engaging fun and they check these people out to make sure they have no unsavory backgrounds and they know what they're talking about anyway They offer a full range of affordable workout equipment, including stationary bikes. If you're not leaving the house, you don't need to go anywhere. Smart rowers. Smart rowers don't just row. They row with a purpose. I don't know how you educate a rower, but nevertheless, these things have a college degree. Uh, They've got the great fitness screens and, of course, the ever-popular and highly discussed auto-folding treadmill. That's safe. That's safe and good for you. Just watch it fold and unfold all by itself. And they're all connected to provide the Echelon experience with around-the-clock classes for a family. One membership covers a family of five. And as we've mentioned, if you've only got one or two kids, you need to get busy to get your money's worth. Anyway, right now, for a limited time only, my podcast listeners can get up to $800 off the MSRP, and also how much this shit costs. 
But to get this exclusive discount, you got to text DRIVE, the word D-R-I-V-E, to 818181. That's DRIVE to 818181 for up to $800 off Echelon. Message and data rates may apply. See terms for details. I need to see those terms sometimes so I know what the details are. All right, Jim. Well, we'll talk more about the terms later on, but let's get back to the omnibus of those we lost in 2021. Before we get started with the rest of the program, um, there's another situation where somebody's passed away and it just happened. Well, I, I just heard yesterday, it may have been the you know night before previous or whatever, but Del Wilkes, the Patriot, uh, passed away apparently of a major heart attack and he was was he 58 or 59 now? I forgot. I think 59, my age. Uh, but, uh, you know, you would think to look at Dell, I mean, I haven't seen him in quite some time, but he was always, you know, tall, healthy, square-jawed guy. But I know he had the the problems with pain pills and prescription pills for a long time. But, uh you know, I hate to hear that. Uh, it just, I mean, I I know that uh, some people may think, well, what the fuck? He's been wrestling up here until just recently. But the Patriot, Dell's been retired, I guess, out of the ring since what? The late night, the late nineties when he the last the WWF run, he tore his triceps again. I think was that that was pretty much it. Maybe he made an appearance or two in a few years after that. Maybe I'm not, I'm but, trying to remember if he went back to Japan because that's where he would make an appearance of anywhere. I don't I don't think he because he had already had triceps problems. We'll talk about that in a second. Anyway, people are saying, well, I've seen the Patriot. No, Tom Brandy has been using the gimmick of recent years. I don't know if he's done that in a while. Tom Brandy's got to be getting up there. Um, but Dell the was the one to originate it, and as I said, he hasn't wrestled in in some time. He got into uh. Uh, car sales and he's from South Carolina but anyway I first saw him he was part of Petticino's Global Wrestling Federation as you well remember and I you know I I remember that that was at the point where where Joe had was starting to find out he didn't have access to as much money as he thought he did because the Nigerian backer wasn't coming through and at one point Dell as the Patriot was one of the major stars and actually one of the only guys on the roster that really looked like he could be a major star in wrestling and he, he did, started out as what the the trooper in the AWA yeah uh where he had a state trooper gimmick and and that was the dying days of the AWA and he was very green but you could tell I mean just with that look and he looked like a movie star facially um you know, the old fashioned movie star with a square jaw and, a, you know, curly hair, but uh, handsome, as they used to say about men who still look like men. But he was really green. But then with the Patriot gimmick, it was flashy. And I've, I've always, I mean, Mil Mosker has proved guys with good physiques and a colorful set of tights and a colorful mask are photogenic. They get over if they can do anything, if they can work and 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 fit the whatever the gimmick is that it calls for. It and and he was different because there were no more masked baby faces. And with the it was the 90s was perfect, the red, white, and blue, the Patriot. Um so even though Global didn't go anywhere, that gave him a, a gimmick that he could use for a while. And then, you know, he had several good runs in Japan. They, you know, they just loved, you know, big Americans there. And but really, the what everybody will probably remember is that brief run in the WWF as the Patriot, um, and and how it <laughs> that was, well, that was what perpetrated my fight with Kevin Dunn, which is on YouTube, and we won't go into the whole uh, detail there of of the production meeting in Halifax, but. He was so classic wrestling that they that neither Vince knew or cared about what to do with him. And I remember one night early on, 
Because Russo just basically shit all over the gimmick in private. He wouldn't, you know, not to his, not to Dell's face. But when we, me and him still spoke, me and Shitstain, he was riding back with, this may have been the night that I told him the story about the fucking uh, heels carrying guns in the car, and he morphed that into, I pulled a gun on some old lady in traffic. But we were riding back from a raw to the hotel and i'm going to say it was in oklahoma we raw had been in oklahoma city maybe we're driving back to dallas to fly out but we were in a car together and that was one of the nights that the patriot had first got there he comes out with that the music that they later used for kurt angle uh um waving the american flag He's got that cool fucking sequined red, white, and blue Patriot mask on. His body looks like a million dollars. He's six foot six. And he came out and tore the house down. The people loved him. They gave him an ovation. He got over. Whatever he did in the match that night, I can't remember. They loved him, right? <clears throat> and we're talking about it, and Russo was gobsmacked. He said, I can't believe it. I said, what do you... Because... He was looking at it like, well, if he had come out in New York at Madison Square Garden, they'd have booed him out of the building with all that patriotic crap. I said, you fucking moron. That's why you shouldn't pay attention to what goes on in New York. Because the rest of the country ain't like that. And we were just in Oklahoma City, and he's waving the American flag, and he's the patriot. You think they're going to fucking boo him? Of course, he looks like a million dollars, and he can work. And he can talk. I said, so what the fuck are you surprised about? This is a new baby face. We're short of baby faces. We need to push this guy. He can get over. He looks like a star. Can you imagine the merchandising on the masks, right? And then before the, the fight at the... Um, in the production meeting in Halifax with Kevin Dunn, I had I said, look, if you want me to work with Dell, I'll work with him. I'll produce his promos or work on his matches or whatever, right? I'll do whatever because we need this guy. And you, as you remember, the babyface situation on the roster in what was that very early 1997 was... Yeah, I mean, the, well, the, the, it's, there was some stars that had been there, but there was nobody new and there, and it wasn't deep. Also important to note, this is the period of time where I don't even know if you could say yet he was a full fledged heel, but Brett was baby facing Canada heel in America. Yeah. So when you talk about the rosters, who's a baby face and who wasn't, that created an interesting dynamic. And of course, it was Brett and the Patriot that was working together. Right. And. And that's uh, and the, the gist of the argument at the production meeting was they wanted to kick the shit out of the Patriot in some respect with the Hart Foundation and leave him laying. And in Canada, they were going to cheer the shit out of that because of what they were doing. And I said, no, I said, he can do it to Sean. He can do it to this. He can do it to Undertaker. He can do it to whoever, but he can't do it to this guy because he's not over yet. He just got here. And we don't need the people to on television watching around the world to see the crowd wildly cheering this guy getting the shit kicked out of him. It's too soon. But anyway, even before that, they wanted to introduce him. He was just, he was just there. So they wanted to, yeah, okay, let's do some promos. Well, instead of the guy was well-spoken and he had that deep voice and he could talk and he understood wrestling it was from as i said from south carolina he grew up watching the carolinas wrestling he was trained by fabulous moolah for christ's sake initially um so we ha they they give him a pre-tape interview because you know who's formatting the show shit stain uh a pre-tape interview in one of the boxes that was supposed to play during his entrance all right, well, then let's say what you got to say. And he cuts a fucking promo. It's supposed to be 30 seconds. It was a minute five. But it was good. It was a new baby face that could speak and could fucking get over. I said, that's perfect. Let them fucking use it. it they'll fit it in. So then we hear on the... No, nope, it's too long. I said, well, it's good. But it's too long. It's supposed to be 30 seconds. I said, but it's good. I said, he didn't think it was good. Kevin Dunn, meaning. I'm talking to the 
production assistant. He didn't watch it. I said, tell him to watch it. And then if he still thinks it's too long, then we'll redo it. Get the word back. He's not going to watch it. It's too long. I said, then tell him that he's going to have to get somebody else to fucking shoot it because it's good and I'm not redoing it. If he ain't going to watch it, I ain't doing it again. This is the kind of shit you had to do with this fucking Kevin Dunn, this Weasley Bucky Beaver motherfucker sitting in his fucking truck. But anyway, nevertheless, they had fucking, I think Bruce came out and redid it 30 seconds. It wasn't half as fucking good. And they put that on the air. They were sabotaging this fucking guy because Shitstein didn't understand it and didn't understand him and was too interested in people that he, you know, could fucking make silly. And Vince McMahon thought it was too wrestling because that's a classic baby face. And Kevin Dunn had his nose up Vince McMahon's ass and didn't care because as long as you just don't fuck with his fucking television, he'll be fine. So he had some great matches there, I thought, initially. And then... I can't even remember who it was with, but he tore the triceps again. He'd had problems with triceps injuries, especially for big guys like that, are fucking tough, and he'd done it more than once, in I think, in each arm, which in turn apparently led to or exacerbated uh, his prescription pill problem. And I didn't even know about that until... You know, here's the thing. You can know... Like, everybody knew that Michaels was fucked up on a regular basis you know in some cases it's obvious who's got a problem with pills or whatever but del wilkes you would have thought you were dealing with a south carolina state trooper he always showed up dressed on time professional never incoherent never not in any condition or even slightly in a condition not to perform i wish we'd have had 15 guys with the attitude of that he had and that was easy, as easy to work with as he was back then and we wouldn't have had any fucking headaches um but it just he's another guy that they didn't get it they didn't want to get it they couldn't see it and he got a crummy run there as a result of that and Obviously, as I mentioned, after getting hurt, whatever, it, it, nobody was in any, any hurry to bring him back, and I'm sure he wasn't probably in a hurry to go back if he could have. But uh, I, you know, I I just, I always thought that this guy, I don't know why, didn't it? At one point, did WCW pick him up, but it was like in 94, it was a couple of years before the WWF, and he was there for a little while, but that was at a point in time where they were almost in a federal witness protection program. And nobody was paying attention. He was actually pretty good in WCW. You know, he was good in global. And you said he was one of their big guys that built everything around him. He was the top babyface in the company. And eventually when Eddie booked, he booked his brother Doug as the Dark Patriot. Oh, God. I mean, and then there was, there was Doug in, in a complete full body suit and no physique whatsoever. And is all black with the, you know, the Dark Patriot. But you and were right. He but put Stan Doug Gilbert next to Del Wilkes. And what the f anyway. But you were right. He looked like a star. He had presence. He had a really cool theme song at the time. It was kind of like a takeoff of Van Halen Jump. And then he was kind of gone. And it was weird because so many of the guys from Global would pop up in different places. And you didn't see him pop up anywhere. I didn't know what he was doing in Japan or anything. And then when he popped up in WCW, they put him in a tag team with Marcus Bagwell. Who, despite, That's being, right. despite being Marcus Bagwell... And all that that carries, I actually like two tag teams he was in. Him and Scorpio and him and the Patriot. I think they were Stars and Stripes. But they were, they were both good tag teams, and him and the Patriot were good. And then, once again, the Patriot just kind of vanished from there. But that was 94, I think. And who, what was he, what name was he using in Japan? Was he going to Japan? I can't the see Patriot. the Patriot. Was he because, doing the Patriot in Japan? Because then they put Jackie Fulton with him as the Eagle. That's right. That's right. Because Jackie had had that eagle outfit. Uh, I remember Bobby telling me about it. He, uh, that you know, Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers had gone to Japan many times as the Fantastics. But when Bobby started teaming with Jackie as the Fantastics here in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and 
the other places on independence when tommy was on the other side of the country and couldn't just you know bop in anytime um bobby and jackie were the team but then he got jackie that outfit so that they could try to bobby and tommy would still go to japan but he was trying to get jackie over there as the eagle and finally did the eagle and the patriot what more Japanese uh, 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 idolatry than that. I'm sure they they worship the, the here's the fucking in Japan the American flag that bombed us 50 years ago. But we're gonna we're gonna cheer him now. Anyway, but he was and you were right about his promos. He had a great voice and he yeah. could get fired up and he didn't look ridiculous wearing the mask. It seemed reasonable that he was a masked wrestler. One well, of the and, last and, great American style masked wrestlers, really, when you think about it, to get on TV. Think about it. Jerry Stubbs looked like Ned without that Mr. Olympia mask because he had a he was a great upper body, big chest, big arms, hell of a worker, amazingly agile for two hundred and forty or fifty pounds or whatever he was. Had a, they called him P Head, the boys in the locker room. He had a small, tiny head. Jerry Stubbs did, and if you know, and he also he was balding, and and but when he put that Mr. Olympia mask on, holy shit. And it, but with with Dell, like I, like you said, the the promos he had a Southern accent, but not in a not in a hokey Ernest T. Bass way, but in a kind of a cool action hero from the South in a movie way, you know that the cool Southern accent, but with the deep voice, and he could get fired up, and he could cut a promo and make you listen. Um, I just, I really, you know, I wish he hadn't uh, been so injury prone and I'm sorry to hear in later years about his, the problems that he came out and admitted and talked about with his drug addiction. I, I want to say I saw him last probably at a Charlotte reunion, but one of the fan fests four or five years ago and hugged him and, you know, talked a little bit, but, uh, and he looked great back then. I mean, it wasn't like, Oh my God, what's happened to so and so? Like you sometimes react when you see somebody. So I, and I assume this came out of nowhere. Great opponent for Brett, too. Yeah. Great fit. And, and see, Brett w was trying to, within the parameters of what they were giving him, uh, you know, in terms of the booking to work with to, to help. Dell get over also as that gimmick because he knew and saw that we needed other top guys, but just it, it was it, the Patriot was the one caught in the mix in between DX and the heart foundation and who's a heel in the United States and who's a heel in Canada and et cetera, et cetera. And do you think anything would have been different if you got the Patriot a year, year and a half earlier, there in a yes. whole period of time where you had, you know, the goon oh, yeah. and all these guys coming in. When you needed guys, and you really needed bodies then. If you had gotten the Patriot then, you think they would have done a better job? Yes, because it would have been before that weird, okay, you know, I mean, it worked for the Hart Foundation and DX and Brett being a dual baby face and heel and et cetera. That worked in that instance, but it wasn't the best thing for the Patriot to be in the middle of it. Um, if he'd have come in a year and a half earlier, as short as they were on talent then, it was before Shitstain had anything to do with anything. Um, you would have been relying on Bruce Pritchard and, and I don't, I wasn't there till early 96, but Pat was still there till late 95. Pat Patterson, that would have been a gimmick that was right up his alley to fucking get over. Um, it, it, classic old time wrestling gimmick. So he would have, and he would have seen that, that Dell could talk and work. Um, I think, it, and that, if he'd have come in a year and a half earlier, provided he stayed injury-free again. I mean, that's always a wild card. But he would have had a lot longer to get established before Shitstain led Vince McMahon's worst anti-wrestling tendencies down the, you know, and magnified them all. So he by then, if he was a top guy by then, they wouldn't have fucked with him. But anyway, um... But I was sad to hear about that. Just, uh, just an all. I like I said, I don't know any interaction he's had with anybody else, but always a nice guy to me. And I really thought he was a, a good talent that should have gone a lot farther. Well, Jim, one topic that has come up a lot the last several days, of course, this coincided with the period of time that you were off the computer, 
unfortunately, and we had just been talking about his health issues, or what we had thought about his recent health issues, the passing of Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. Yeah, that um, you told me about that on the the phone on, I guess, Monday afternoon or whatever, but um, it obviously wasn't uh, totally unexpected with uh, what we had heard and seen over the past couple of weeks with him, you know, obviously his health had been failing and he'd had the battles with cancer that we talked about and everything. And, and the, the clip that we just did two weeks ago, we told some various stories and some things. And if you want it, that's on YouTube. If anybody wants to hear that, I don't want to, you know, go through the whole thing again so recently, but you know, just another example that that generation of guys is that because Paul was what uh, almost seventy or was he seventy? I think he was seventy one. I want to say yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, the guys that I was a fan of and right as I was getting in the business are you know five ten or so years older than me, and it's starting not to be you know unheard of. Uh, you know, or an early death or something like that. It's just age and time. And, you know, but uh, like we said, Paul was, he was such a, a great guy and such a fantastic talent. And I actually, as I got back on my email and everything, and I'm already bad with emails. So if anybody's emailed me lately, I'll see it eventually. But uh, one I did see was from Danny Davis, my partner at OVW, uh, because he had heard about Paul and he did an angle with Orndorff and Smoky Mountain Wrestling that that we all loved. Um, the the deal was when Paul came in to Smoky Mountain as right as we were getting started on the air, and uh, he was just starting to do as we talked about show, shows again uh, after having time off because of his arm and the nerve injury and everything. And so Bobby Fulton had had him booked on that show that I did by pilots at. So. Uh, I got him on the taping and then talked to him about some other dates and we had Ronnie Garvin. And so Orndorff and Garvin had worked an early program on Smoky Mountain Wrestling on television and in the some of the live events. But that gave me so much credibility having former NWA world champion Ronnie Garvin. People had seen him on TV for years, especially in the Knoxville market. Orndorff had been uh, Hogan's biggest drawing opponent, like, you know, five years before that in the WWF, and he'd been all over television. So that was credibility. But the, I, we didn't talk about the one angle that I did with Orndorff that I really liked that Danny was involved in. And it just, it also illustrates how you can make something mean something by not giving it to people until you really give it to them. I will explain. Paul Orndorff's finishing hold, as everybody knows, was the pile driver, and he did one of the best ones in the business. I mean, it was just the, you know, the leaping and the flat sit and the whole nine yards. He stuck people, but safely. He got the best jump of anyone. Yeah, because he was so strong and his legs were so strong, and he could t p take anybody up. You know, Lawler had a weight limit, <laughs> and then if you were past such and such, yeah, no. Nah. And the other thing, too, real quick, just Hulk Hogan has a reputation. He didn't want to work with guys that he thought could possibly hurt him. And there he is taking Orndorff's pile driver all the time. Yeah. So even he knew Orndorff was strong enough not to hurt him. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, Paul was just, he was the guy. But anyway, um, but when he comes into Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Commissioner Bob Armstrong obviously informs him the pile driver is illegal. And we didn't do that just because of Orndorff. The pile driver should be illegal because that way you can work angles and get heat with it. And that's what we did in Tennessee wrestling, folks. So I had Orndorff cut promos about how automatically he's being c conspired against and discriminated against. His, his best hold, everybody knows that, and he can't use it here? What kind of bullshit is this? And he jousts back and forth with... Bob Armstrong and Bob's firm, and anytime he would tease doing a pile driver, the referee would make sure to grab the guy and stop it. No, you can't do that. And finally, and, and it's been so long, you may know better than me. I forget what made him flip his fucking lid, but we milked it and milked it until finally nobody had seen a pile driver. Orndorff and him hadn't been able to do the pile driver. And then finally, on a TV taping, he goddamn loses his shit and not only pile drives the guy he's working with, I th but also I think Joey Mags and Hector Guerrero. Hector, we, yeah. 
we ran several people in and have, we had like five spike, not spike, but five big jumping, leaping pile drivers, one right after another. And the last one was on Danny Davis and God, he took the bounce and oh, he was, he had the nerve damage. His hand was shaking like he had palsy and he was whimpering because Danny could sell like crazy. And as they're carrying him out of the ring, oh, it hurts. It, it hurts. Oh my God. So. Orndorff had been working to program with Garvin. So, you know, they were obviously had been involved, but I wanted to freshen it up a little bit. And so we did that angle where he just went crazy and Bob Armstrong find him and whatever. And I think Garvin said he was going to get even or get revenge for Danny Davis, but we had Danny do a VHS tape promo from home. And he's doing the promo where he's still, he's holding the arm kind of limp and he's got the neck brace on and he's talking kind of subdued like that. But he did that. He, from the heart, he, you know, as a man, I've got to do something about this and I'm going to come back after Paul Orndorff and his cat, his cat walks over and he's sitting on his couch, right? And gets in his lap while he's doing the promo and he's just petting the cat, right? He, but he's... He's fucking doing a promo for real. I'm hurt, but as a man, I've got to come back. Well, Garvin, I can't even remember how we did this also, but we ended up booking a handicap match where Garvin came back in the picture, and it was Garvin and Danny Davis against Orndorff. And now Orndorff is bitching, wait a minute, now there's two of them. What the fuck? Because he was thinking he was going to kill Danny Davis, a guy not only smaller than him, but also who's fucking got a neck injury and can hardly use one arm. So had Danny worked with the fucking neck brace, he gets a little heat on Danny, but Ronnie would save Danny from fucking certain doom. And it, it kept that thing going and got the pile driver over. And from that was the first person that was allowed to do the illegal pile driver in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And after that angle and people were carried out and fines were levied and the, the fucking, the people were going crazy when all them guys were bouncing off their fucking heads. It made it something for the, and then when Terry Funk comes in, oh my God, he's going to pile drive Bob Armstrong. Oh shit. Or, you know, when, when that was the way that Bob Armstrong put me in the hospital, he gave me the, the, what was it? Two pile drivers. Um, it was always protected. You always saw people carried out or hurt or whatever. And there were repercussions. And that's why that people reacted to it whenever it was even teased in a match. But if I hadn't had, I was always going to make the pile driver illegal. We were always going to do, you know, angles around the heels, trying to do it or whatever. But if I hadn't had the world's best and foremost proponent of the pile driver to do that, that first angle on what show number 18, we'd milked it for about four months. Um, it wouldn't have gotten over nearly as good. And that's, that's when, when Al Snow did the angle that led to the big showdown on the scaffold between him and Ricky Morton, that's what he did to Ricky three pile drivers in Johnson city. And we called the ambulance and he was carried out and put in the ambulance and driven off. And there were guys waiting for Al Snow in the fucking parking lot and girls were crying at ringside. And we actually, we actually shot the fucking girls crying and fucking wringing their hands and clutching their pearls. And, uh, you know, that was, because it was something was made out of it and Orndorff kicked that off. And, and I was glad to hear from Danny Davis about, you know, his, him remembering that angle. Cause it was, it was fun for us to do because it, it led to something and it meant something and it laid groundwork for something in a new promotion. He may have had the best pile driver. He also may have had the best lockup. His collar and elbow Boy. always looked so competitive and so real. And, and, uh, you know, he just, he brought that intensity in most everything that he did. I mean, just throwing a punch or dropping those fucking forearms or whatever, it, everything was intense and aggressive with Paul. And that's, and the, when he was on defense and when he was bumping, he was bumping aggressively. It was, he, you know, he didn't, he didn't bump like a big muscle guy. He bumped like a fucking great worker that had the body of a big muscle guy. So, you know, uh, almost everything he did was just so believable and so intense. And he knew what to do for, you know, for himself. Like I've said so many times, the best wrestlers are the guys that know what they should do and what they shouldn't do. Even if they can do it, the person that they're supposed to be shouldn't do it. And that wasn't hard for Paul because he was 
basically the person he was supposed to be. You know, when I got into wrestling, it was really weird with Paul Orndorff. So I get really into wrestling in 89 and he's gone. And there were even whispers amongst the kids I knew that he was dead by that point in time. And when I started getting into it and looking back, he has such an interesting place in WWE history alone because he, in a lot of ways, is one of the first big hires of the expansion. In 83, they bring him in. And he's aligned with Piper and Schultz. He's in the main event mix. He's in a main event for WrestleMania, yet he's not one of the first batch of action figures. He doesn't make it on the Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling. He's not one of the animated stars. And then, of course, the big run with Hogan after he turns on him, biggest run of Hogan's title reign, and then he's not even on WrestleMania three. And then a year later, he's gone. It's just such a weird... His WWF run, because he wasn't on the cartoon and he wasn't in Mania three. it took me a little while to realize and appreciate just how big a star he was there. Well, you know, I think part of it is when you think about it on the cartoon, everybody had a gimmick. Paul would have been standing there in tights and the, the action figures, everybody, Iron Sheik, uh, you know, Hulk Hogan, everybody had a gimmick or was some, Paul would have been a wrestler in tights. I don't know, even though he was so integral and was the biggest drawing house show live event program that Hogan opponent that Hogan ever had. I don't know if Vince ever saw him as, you know, marketable in those aspects. Cause I didn't, I, I wasn't aware that he didn't have a figure. No, he had a figure, but he wasn't one of the first. Cause again, I mean he, that he did, he did that he didn't get the figure and commensurate with, you know, where he was at the time. I, do, I that's the only thing I can imagine is maybe and, and on the cartoon or whatever. Cause I, you know, I'd never watched the cartoon to be honest with you, but how, how does Hogan's biggest ever live event opponent not get a, or did they already have the cartoon planned out before that happened to begin with? Well, the cartoon was planned that in 85, but he was in the mix in 85 as early on as a heel. And then the big baby face turn that eventually aligned him with Hogan so that when he turned on Hogan, it meant something that all happened. He turned on, he became friends with Hogan and turned on Hogan within a year and a half. <laughs> well, most, most people, it doesn't take that long, <laughs> but that's only in private. Do you think Ole should have had Orndorff turn on Sting instead of doing the Black Scorpion? Oh, God, yes. Um, anything besides the Black Scorpion would have been an improvement, but ca yeah, Orndorff and Sting would have been incredible. And, and, you know, that's the thing is that Orndorff was great in, in pretty much in whatever place you put him, as long as you put him in something Orndorff should be involved in. As a babyface tag team, him and Jimmy Snuka, we talked about in the Carolinas, was great. He was a good babyface and a good heel in Mid South as a single. Um, you know he could he could he could do pretty much everything, and all of the guys that he got in the ring with had better matches. I think if Sting at that if in that time period Sting and Luger were having great matches like that, Sting and Orndorff would have been incredible. I just think it would have been a better decision. You had Orndorff there; he was aligned with Sting as a babyface, which was kind of miscasting Orndorff, obviously. He walks off after Sting wins at Great American Bash 90, which teased something that never happened. And he was just, what, four years off the feud with Hogan. It yeah. would have been perfect for Sting's first challenger as the world champion instead of a mystical wizard <laughs> who appeared and disappeared and eventually was exposed as being Ric Flair. But you know what? Now that you've said that, was that the time that Paul was about to take off because of the arm? No, because, I mean, he already oh. had the arm issue. And you know what? I actually think, you know, everyone says he hurt his neck during the Hogan feud and he didn't want to stop because he was making all that money and that led to the atrophy in his arm. I think if you look at photos of him, even as far back as Mid-South, he already has some of the atrophy. I don't know if anyone's ever picked up on that, but if you really look at him like in 82, the atrophy is already starting at that point. I had not looked that closely, but I can believe it. Because, you know, it's all, it, it, I mean, he had wrestled a hard style and he'd been in the business for several years by that point, And it's only going to get worse. And especially he was up there 83 through 86, especially those were those concrete rings in the WWF. So those concrete tours. Oh God. 
But yeah, I, I've got, uh, I took pictures of Orndorff in 77 in Louisville, him doing the double bicep and everything, and both arms were exactly the same. So we know he started out even in 77. Well, everyone obviously very sad about the passing of Paul Orndorff, and we've seen lots of stories and lots of clips going around, and we send our condolences to his friends and family. And very sadly, Jim, I have to ask you about another recent passing. Chris Youngblood, Chris Romero, recently passed away. Oh, yeah, when that happened last week uh, at some point. I'm in a time warp again. Uh, of course, the the Romero family, the son of Ricky Romero, the all-time top baby face in the history of West Texas that wasn't named Funk. Um, and, of course, Jay Youngblood's brother and, and Mark. Um, I think we worked with Chris probably the least... Well, we didn't work with Jay at all, unfortunately. He passed away before we came to the Carolinas and, and you know, worked in in that area. I think we worked with the Young Bloods when Crockett had taken over the UWF. Does that sound right to you, O Savant? No. No? I, was, I mean, you could have, and I'm not remembering it, but I remember you guys with them in 1990. That's when it was. That's when it was because they came in at WCW for a little while, right? Mark yeah. and Chris. That's yes. Right. Um, and really, I mean, you know, they were a great team. Of course, uh, all the family could work. Jay was the one that got the most notoriety, but, uh, like I said, we only worked with them a, a few times and, and, uh, that's really the only time that I was around them on any kind of regular basis, just at the, at the shows. So I know that, uh, you know, it's it's just a shame that two two out of the three brothers is when did did Ricky Ricky Romero is obviously dead by now, yeah, right? I, I'm pretty positive he is. I don't remember a date, but he was he was older than the Funks. I mean, than Dory Junior and Terry. Right. So I think so. Yeah, but I you know it's sad. Two out of the three brothers that you know were in the wrestling business. I get. Was there another brother? I'm not sure. And you know. I mentioned on a recent show being on Terry Funk's ranch in 98, I talked with Ricky Romero there. And even though it was 98, whatever, 14, uh, 13 years later, he was still talking about Jay. He was still so upset about the passing of Jay because he brought it up to me. I wasn't going to bring it up to him. Yeah. He brought it up to me and started talking about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, but we, uh, our condolences there as well to the Romero family. Unfortunately, I think the Renegade Warriors, uh, Chris and Mark Romero, or Youngblood, in the States, they were hurt by the change in what people expected from physiques in wrestling. If they had come along 10 years earlier wrestling the same way, I think it would have been a different trajectory in the States. Yeah, that may have been, because they looked like Jay. Jay looked great, but he didn't have muscles. You know what I'm saying? But when he was with Steamboat, Steamboat got him in the gym, so he at least looked... Really yeah, he fit. was. He I mean, was look at him shape. a year later yeah. after, you know, him and Steamboat broke up. It was night yeah. and day. But uh, one more wrestling personality I got to ask you about because some people have asked us. They don't know too much about him. The passing of Mac McMurray, who played a very interesting role in wrestling history that a lot of people may not know. Uh, Mac McMurray was the original investor that helped Ron Fuller get Southeastern wrestling off the ground when he, uh, bought the territory from, uh, from the Kazanas. And Mac also at the time, you know, refereed and, you know, did all kinds of Jack of all trades and office work for, for Ron during the Southeastern years. And as recently as God, I don't know, just a few years ago, I was at a fan fest where he, I think I'm pretty sure he refereed. He was definitely at uh, a number of them that I've been at over the last several years. But he uh, he was good friends with Les Thatcher. Les is at the one that got him booked on the uh, Night of Legends show. He refereed the Legends match, and then of course he saw the fucking he saw the last false tag instead of the one he was supposed to see. And and I didn't let him live that one down for a while. But uh, but yeah, I guess he was in his late seventies, right? I think so. I, I think don't remember so. the age, yeah. but you know, like you said, without him loaning Ron the money to buy Southeastern, East Tennessee wrestling would have a very different history. Yeah, and maybe not much of a history at all because if nobody had uh, if nobody had wanted to buy it from Kazana and he limped on for a while, it it would have because he was still doing business when they sold. 
he was just getting older and Ron made an offer and saw he could do something. But if they had limped on till they petered out, then it would have been left to either the Carolinas to annex it or uh, Jerry Jarrett to annex it. And if they, the East Tennessee territory needed a local promotion. They didn't do well when people came in from out of town, even sometimes, uh, you know, uh, guys that were over in the town, but if it was just a different promotion and of course, you know, the, uh, Crockett's did good to great at some points in the tri cities area until finally they got the whole thing in the mid eighties, but Knoxville needed to be its own thing to really be successful. I Ron, as a matter of fact, when he was trying to run it out of, out of Alabama, saw that later on himself. So yeah, Mac was very important in Southeastern, which as all the Arcadian Vanguard network listeners know, was the model of a small regional territory. That's right. Until Bob Roop got a hold of it. More news that we might as well just cover here all in, in one basic section. Um, we missed a couple of other passings, uh, over the last couple of weeks and also just found out about one a couple of days ago. I will lead with that. Uh, Peggy Lathan, who a lot of fans are not going to know who she was. She was not a personality in the wrestling business, but she was a personality in the Carolinas world of wrestling. Um, Peggy was one of the longest running fans in Greenville, South Carolina and in all of the towns around there. She'd been going since I guess back in the, I don't know if it was the seventies or the sixties even. Um, and she attended all of the Charlotte fan fests over the last number of years. Uh, all the guys enjoyed seeing her. She was real close friends with Tommy young and, and, and just a, a bunch of the guys and, and just, you know, she was a fixture there and she passed away uh, several days ago. Apparently from what I've heard of, uh, because she works in the healthcare field uh, and and has was vaccinated and then went home to quarantine, got COVID, even though she was vaccinated, went home to quarantine and died shortly thereafter. And I understand her father was at last point not doing he, he very passed. well. He, he did. He, okay. Yeah. I didn't hear that. Well, anyway, so, you know, and, and here's a trivia note for everybody. We were just talking about Ole Anderson. Peggy Lathan may very well have saved Ole Anderson's life. <clears throat> she was the one in Greenville the night that Ole got stabbed that she was, I believe, a nurse, and she has said she worked in the medical field. She held an old towel on his chest as a compress, waiting for the ambulance, trying to keep him from bleeding to death. And we've, you know, Ole has told that story before where he violated the cardinal rule. I can't remember whether somebody took a swing at him or actually connected or did something. And he took off after the guy. And especially back in the old days when there were no barricades and rails going up and down the aisle way, and there was no entrance stage, whatever you're walking out through the people down the aisle with your cops. And if you suddenly bolt and take off within 10 feet, you've left the, the cops that you've got the security around you and you could be dead. And he almost was because it wasn't the guy that he was after. It was some, I think the guy was either 80 or 82 years old yeah. that pulled a fucking hawk build knife out of his pocket. And just, here you go. You know what a hawk build knife is? I don't. You don't? Well, you're not a country boy. <clears throat> um, You know what a hawk's beak looks like? I believe that. That little fucking hook on it. Well, a hawk build knife has that Ooh. little fucking hook on the end. So when you stick it in, it does more damage coming out than it did going in. And he got only not only down the arm with a slash, but then in the chest with a stab. And it was within half an inch of his heart. And they took him to the hospital and he took, I don't know how many hundred and something stitches and you know some blood transfusion whatever the fuck he was back at tv two days later but uh but anyway peggy was instrumental there in in helping him out at that time and she had been going i mean whenever there was wrestling you know when crockett went away whenever there was you know some type of wrestling that she would enjoy and but especially the the fan fest and the reunion so that those won't be the same in the future without 
you know, without seeing Peggy. That was just, that was a shame. And just out of the blue, she had just been <clears throat> at the, um, at the Charlotte fan fest that they just had what, two or three weeks ago. Was it now? Anyway. Um, and another one we missed, uh, with more pertinent to the world of classic pro wrestling, Jody Hamilton, the assassin passed away at, um, and my gosh, was he, how old was he? 79 or 80? I will find out right now. Find out right now. Um, Jody was famous, obviously. It's another trivia note in wrestling. He was the youngest guy ever to main event Madison Square Garden. He and his brother Larry, uh, who's later become the Missouri Mauler, headlined against Rocca and Perez in 1959. 82. 82. Okay, well then, was it Rock and Perez in 57 then? Because he was 19 years old. Regardless, <clears throat> that was his, uh, you know, his early claim to fame. And then, of course, he and Tom Renesto became the Assassins and one of the great heel tag teams in history. And, you know, I never got to see the original Assassins work one time, and I have not seen any video. And here's a question for you. Does any video... The only video I've seen is eight millimeter clips, silent clips of a transfer that some guy shot in the city auditorium in the sixties. And there's all those old Georgia, you know, uh, uh, talents that were big in Georgia at the time on this, but it's just random clips. You could see Jody bumping, see Ernesto bumping. You could tell they had their shit together, <clears throat> but I've not seen one full match or, clip and i'm wondering is there is there anything professional out there of the assassins the original assassins that's left the only thing i could think of that possibly could be left would be any remaining and i don't know if they're definitely not a team on the two episodes that are out there even though jody is still is, uh, under a mask but any of the ann gunkle stuff from 73 and 74 that would be the only thing and you know on that topic Everyone talks about Jody Hamilton, the assassin, and his amazing promos. They were fantastic. What a diabolical yeah. heel. We never got to hear it when Tom Renesto was the lead promo of the assassins. <laughs> Think about that. He wasn't even the main guy, Jody Hamilton. He was number two. Well, I, I'll be honest, though. I heard Tom Renesto talk for Nick Goulas when he was booking in the late 70s, and I think <laughs> they'd have been wise to go with Jody. Um. But no, in all in all honesty, those guys and Renesto was the the elder member of the team. He had been in the business. What Tony Martin he used to work as uh, back in the fifties out on the West Coast. Well, remember before they were the Assassins, they were the Bolos because uh, Renesto had gone to the Carolinas and worked with Al Lovelock, who was the great Bolo. You are correct, sir. But it wasn't before they were the Assassins. They became the Assassins first. Oh, but then when they went to the Carolinas. They were the Bolos, also because of Renesto's previous tenure and also because oh, that's what it was, yeah. There had been outlaw assassins that had come in and they did so they just they were the Bolos. Uh but regardless, they were noted as one of the best heel teams of the sixties. And enough people concur with that that you can kind of figure that it was probably true. They they went to everywhere, to every territory, especially in the uh the South and Southeast. They had long runs. They would bring either them in and then bring in the Kentuckians, Grizzly Smith and Luke Brown, or vice versa, because the Kentuckians were an attraction standing there and the, the huge size and the pictures, and it was great, but they were limited at best in the ring. But these bumping heels that still had the size and the, the menacing look could get matches out of them, and they went to every territory. It was like a midnight rock and roll for the 60s where two tag teams followed each other around and drew, you know, money everywhere. Um, and then, as you said, Renesto, because he was older anyway, they'd been together 10 or 12 years when Ann Gunkel started her own company and the Assassins were the biggest name heel team in the history of Georgia wrestling, but Renesto unmasked and became Ann Gunkel's booker. Yeah. And Jody continued as a single for a while. And then what toward the, uh, Toward the late 70s, 77, 78, uh, he started bringing in different partners. Randy Colley was one uh, that worked with Jody. A lot of people, I don't, did Did Randy Smith work yes. with Jody? He did. Yeah. Okay. Randy Smith worked with Jody and also Randy Smith 
Uh, Randy, let me try this again. Roger Smith. Roger Smith. Uh, yeah. Roger Dirty Smith Rhodes. worked with uh, with uh, Jody, and so did Randy Colley. And then Randy Colley and Roger Smith became assassins on their own in Tennessee and Knoxville, places that couldn't afford Jody. <clears throat> um, and they did the assassin versus assassin feud in Gunkle. Yes. Or, you know, they did it uh, without their masks, too, so you could see who everyone was. But I will say my favorite of the non Renesto assassins, maybe Hercules Hernandez yes. as the assassin, because <laughs> what a visual, him with Jody Hamilton. Well, and that, you know, that's the thing. By the early 80s, Jody was, you know, in his early 40s, and he was carrying that much weight, and he got bigger. I mean, he was always a good bumper for a, a guy that size, but as he carried more weight, he got bound the promos, the name, the assassins, the the ability that he had to work without, you know, going crazy. And, and he always had a younger guy or a bumping guy to be the partner. But Hercules, Herc came to Louisiana straight from the Carolinas where he was assassin number two with Jody, right? And that was where you got the mask when you got your head shaved, right? Yes, because with typical thinking ahead, what they had done was... I think it was like the day of, or if not, it was a few days before that I got my head shaved. They said, okay. And I think Dundee said, and, and we want you to wear a mask. So that way we can pop the mask and make them pay to see you get, you know, your bald head. Right. Okay. That makes sense. But where am I going to get a fucking mask? And Hercules had one of the assassin masks and I believe he got it from Jody. So without even really thinking about it, I've got Jody Hamilton's assassin mask, but it's an assassin mask. I'd look like an idiot. As an, I need a black mask, right, that covers up my head but doesn't look like the assassin. Be like me wearing a Mil Moscaris mask, right? It would be distracting. So, and everybody knew that design. The assassin had, had made it into the Superdome five years before that. So I took a fucking big felt-tipped, not a Sharpie, but one of those thick magic markers, and I colored it as best I could, the yellow-black so that it wouldn't look like an assassin mask until I could get one. And I can't remember one of the other boys finally came up and gave me another one. And that's the one I used for a talking mask with no chin in it that I used for the next couple months. But for the first week or two there, I had Jody Hamilton's assassin mask that I'd colored in with a black magic marker. <clears throat> but that, you know, and then, um, I guess by what the mid eighties, when I was living in Atlanta, that brief period of time between Dallas and, and Charlotte, and I was watching Petticino's wrestling block, Jody had a, a local promotion at that time and was the flame. And I, you know, I, I don't, everybody knew it was the assassin, but he was throwing fire. And so he decided to switch gimmicks. I'm not sure why, but he was wearing that big red bodysuit. You remember that? Yeah, I remember the promo where he shot off his gun at a... Didn't he have a picture of Bob Armstrong on a tree? Yes. And just started shooting it? I mean, crazy. Yes. Uh, but I, it, the red bodysuit for a man 325 pounds at least was a crazy fashion choice also. But, but you know, with the fire gimmick, the flame, and then uh, he, just, he retired. He, he hurt his back in the late 80s and had to retire, but he had run on and off a number of local promotions in the Georgia area, including um, for a very short period of time, the deep South, you know, developmental program that ended acrimoniously. But uh, as a matter of fact, I bought, uh, when we started Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Jody had closed down. I think he called it deep South back then too, but he had closed down and, and shut his TV down. And I bought about a hundred three quarter inch tapes from him to use for station dubs for the Smoky Mountain show for like five bucks a piece or whatever. Um, they were I blank? Tried... No, they had his his Deep South show from like 1989 on them. So you destroyed wrestling history? <clears throat> no. I I fucking helped wrestling history. Did you ever see the Deep South wrestling <laughs> show from 1989? I have not, no. I covered it over with Smoky Mountain Wrestling and everybody involved with that show now has a better reputation because of it. Hey, let me bring up one of the great angles ever because it's an angle that was quickly copied and both versions of the angle are great for different reasons. But Jody Hamilton, the assassin as El Santo in Florida. Yes. 
which was later copied with Austin Idol and Lawler in Memphis. Yeah. Again, <laughs> the same angle, but done two radically different ways. Well, not radically different, but two different ways, and they both work. Two different ways to get there, but they got to the same place. Uh, but yes, uh, I, the the Austin Idol Jerry Lawler angle in Memphis was legendary for Lance <laughs> Hector Guerrero. It was one of the baby faces that ran out. <laughs> and Lance is saying, Hector, tell him in Mexican to get out of here. <laughs> and then he pops the mask and reveals it's Austin Idol. Um, Senor the King. <laughs> yeah, Senor the King. <laughs> Basically, in both cases, the the poor babyface victim was being given an award from a leading pro wrestler in Mexico. And of course, <laughs> Jody Hamilton looked nothing like El Santo, but nobody in Florida knew what El Santo looked like anyway, right? And I don't think many people were fooled by Austin Idol because even though he was wearing a mask, he wore a mask as, as Austin Idol in fucking Tennessee at, at one point. And he looked the same way. He was kind of covered up with, you know, with a, with clothing, but, um, but yeah, those, those, but as soon as he opened his mouth yeah, and, and you heard, Oh, see, see, oh, see, see, and then, what the fuck? And <laughs> no, then the, baby, no. <laughs> the baby face ends up getting his head bashed in with the, the award in both cases. But yeah, you know, Jody was, he was a very good worker, a very a great promo and a, a smart guy to the wrestling business. And we've mentioned he was on the allegedly on the booking committee in WCW during that period of time. Really? They, he wasn't on the booking committee and that he was the guy who unfortunately had to go to the office every day and sit in that office with herd and the rest of the people. And I heard they gave him a corner office, but he fell asleep so often. He snored so loud that they put him out in the middle in a cubicle where he, everybody could see him and he couldn't nod off. But they had him book in the rings and the job guys. And otherwise than that, he had no particular ally like Flair and Kevin, and I was along for the ride with them. They had control at that point in time. JR had to answer to Jim Hurd, and JR obviously was vocal with, you know, chiming in on things and offering suggestions. Um, Hurd and Hurd sat there to take the piss out of everything, and Barnett sat there to agree with him. And poor Jody was just left over in the corner. Every once in a while, he would say something, but nobody was listening to him. I'm not saying he was a genius, but he'd run a lot more of his own business than than Hurd had. Uh, but at the same point, you know, by that time period, the early 90s and, and beyond, I think, you know, he wanted to be in the business still, but it just, there wasn't, there wasn't going to be another local territory. He tried it with Deep South it being subsidized by WWE, but... Uh, they they were too they were too old school not necessarily uh smoothly run from an administrative standpoint and jody had his favorites that he liked to train and they weren't real good trainers uh but sergeant so buddy lee parker i didn't want to mention any names and you didn't and i didn't but you did um and uh and good old hugh morris but anyway uh, but but still, you know, another legendary name in in the wrestling business and the Assassins. That was, you know, they were a a big money tag team, and he was a presence as a promoter or a wrestler or in some capacity in wrestling for thirty five years. Forty? No, wait, forty years, counting the early deep uh, the early D deep South devel developmental run. I'll try that again. Here's a question I don't know the answer to. Who's the oldest living person in main event Madison Square Garden right now? Oh, Ma that's Mark Lewin. Maybe Mark Lewin, now that I think about it. Quickly. Bob, Bob Ellis never got a main event, did he? If he did, I don't know it off the top of my head. Yeah. I mean, for, uh, an, for, I, for a while there, it was mostly tag teams. I um, bet you, I bet you it might be Mark Lewin. Lewin and Curtis, right? Yeah. I think it may be Mark Lewin. I just saw, uh, I just saw Ted Lewin died. I I didn't see anything until well after the fact. I know he really didn't do too much in wrestling beyond being the third brother of the Lewin family, but uh, he put out a cool book years ago. You remember 
I was a teenage. I was pro a wrestler teenage pro wrestler. <laughs> with great artwork and had such yeah. really cool his paintings. I mean, he was an artist. Yes, and and he fortunately got out while there was still time, and uh, and and has lived a long and successful life as an artist and etc. Um, no, and actually, Mark and Ted and Don was the oldest, I believe. Don Lewis. Yeah, I think so. And he was in the business a little bit longer than than Ted. Mark and and uh, Don Lewin were a team in the in the fifties, but Ted actually, if I'm not mistaken, was older than Mark, right? I think Mark was the baby of the bunch. Mark was the baby of the bunch, and of course, the brother-in-law Danny McShane was older than all of them, and he married the sister. Yeah, we well, we say the sister like she's the only one. Uh, but, I don't know if they have multiple <laughs> sisters. Forgive me. Well, I mean, family. she's the only sister of anybody in history. The sister over there, but their sister. Uh, but yeah, Danny McShane, one of the greatest names in the history of wrestling in the what 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, and then through him being their brother-in-law, so introduced them to the ranks. But uh, as you said, Ted basically worked in the what late 50s, early 60s, and was kind of done. And Mark soldiered on till the fucking late 80s, I think. And still had a better body than half the people half his age. And then he married a princess, and now he's, like, living <laughs> on some island like a king. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, anyway, and also one more, and uh, I was especially sorry to hear about this, because I just talked to him literally three weeks before he passed away, Burt Prentice, um, who some might know as... Queen Christopher Love from the LPWA and Memphis at one point in time. And I think did he, he started out as Christopher Love managing Tully Blanchard in San Antonio, didn't he? In Southwest, Christopher Honey Love. Well, that's because that was his expression. Well, let me tell you something, honey, with that <laughs> in, indignant sound in his voice. Let me tell you something, honey. Oh, he was fucking hilarious as a manager. And Bert's another guy that a lot of modern fans may not know his name, but in the Tennessee area and around the Southeast in wrestling, he's been a promoter in a variety of places for years and years. And he managed before that. Um, he's always been around wrestling in some fashion or another. And I, he's got, as a matter of fact, he had worked on a book with Scott Teal that was going to come out. I don't know now what the status of it is, but I remember he's got a bizarre life story where he, his family came from working in carnivals and wrestling and different types of traveling attractions. And he was just a natural old time promoter, a carny in the best sense of the word in some cases, because he knew how to hustle and promote. And sometimes he'd start a territory and he'd have 12 or 14 guys in the territory. And all of a sudden they'd turn around and Bert was gone and nobody saw him for a couple of years, but that's part of the, Wrestling promotion business at the grassroots level. Um, I met him the first time when I did the LPWA. Joe Petticino had asked me to come out and do color. He was doing the play-by-play -play for old Tor Berg out of Minneapolis. And Queen Christopher Love was the manager of the Queens of Wrestling, who were uh, Leilani Kai and Judy Martin. The Glamour Girls, yeah. The Glamour Girls. And, and we were taping not in Las Vegas, but in Laughlin, Nevada. I guarantee if you ever want to find some place where you just look around the entire town and say every one of these motherfuckers voted for Donald Trump, Laughlin, Nevada, it, it was the redneckest backwoods. It, well, they don't have woods. It's out in the desert. The redneckest back desertish, low income, you know, fucking the people going to the casino more for the buffet than to gamble type of thing. And so there they're doing a girl wrestling show, but here comes Queen Christopher Love, and he's gay as a fucking $4 bill, and he's wearing furs, and he's doing his thing, and he's got no guys that can protect him, right? It's Leilani Kai and Judy Martin. Now, they could probably whip the average guy in Laughlin, Nevada, but it wasn't an, an intimidating visual presence, right? So... He goes out and does his shit. I can't remember what they did at ringside. He said some shit on a microphone, and by the time he got halfway down the aisle to go back to the dressing room, one of these rednecks had come out and clocked him right in the fucking face. And boom, and I saw a stir from ringside, and what the fuck? Oh, somebody's got Chris Love. 
Oh shit! And I'm I'm assuming I can't remember, but I think it was. I didn't check their credentials, but the security was more like casino security guards rather than actual police, right? And they're used to these fucking people, and and, and probably sixty seven years old, augmenting their social security. And I I told Joe, I said, hold on, I'll be right back. And I went back in the back and Bert told me years later that he really appreciated this because I went back in the back. I said, Hey, I said, I know we're just all fun in here and it's a girl show. I said, but you're going to send this fucking guy out in this fucking crowd to get that much heat. Then give him some fucking cops or some security. So he doesn't get punched in the face every time he walks out there. Cause as a, as a fellow manager, I was offended, right? As a professional courtesy. And so they <laughs> they got everybody they could in that casino that looked official and surrounded him to go back and forth from that point on out. But uh, it, Bert was promoting Music City Wrestling when I first got here to OVW, and he was doing a great job getting people back in the Nashville fairgrounds. And he would book some of the OVW guys. I mean, one here's a mixed match. A mi- I say a mixed match. You'll see why in a second but a mixed match that will live in infamy was me and David Flair against, I think it was Jerry Lawler and Brian Christopher. And then we had Leviathan down there in some way or another. I think I, I, th- I can't remember whether I teamed up with Leviathan against somebody else, but he was putting together all kinds of crazy fucking matches and drawing good crowds. And then TNA came along and started running the same building, the Nashville Fairgrounds, and given the tickets away for free and killed his fucking town. He had local TV. I was doing, I'd done color for it at some points. He was bringing in, he always, Lawler always worked with him. He and Lawler were good friends. Uh, but he was bringing in names and he was drawing. Didn't he have six- Christine Jarrett working the door for his shows? And- yes, Christine was, was still alive um, the first time that he started running Music City. She was working to to get out of the house and and ever the fans loved seeing her and to be back in the ticket the same ticket window she worked for fifteen years or whatever uh at that building uh so she yeah she would come down and sell tickets for him and it was it was a family thing and he knew all the people by name at ringside and he'd point them out and he'd make over them and he was drawing he was running regularly and drawing. Crowds of, I don't know, five, seven hundred, a thousand people sometimes. And then TNA started giving all their tickets away. And then I've recently talked about him. We had him on the program several years ago, but he started running Jackson, Tennessee. And I talked at the time about how it was the model again of a local promotion because he didn't just go in there and try to book indie darlings that he had to fly in and put, you know, ads on the internet. <clears throat> he went into the Jackson Coliseum, which is a miniature Mid-South Coliseum. It, only, it seats like 6,000 instead of, you know, 12 for the Coliseum. And they had run, Jared had run that building every month for years, same place. But he contacted the city because it's a city-owned building. And the city in Jackson, Tennessee also owns or operates the cable system in some fashion. So they needed events in the building. Um, and obviously it's revenue for the city. So he got a deal where he got a TV show on the local cable system that they could shoot in the basement of the, of the Jackson Coliseum in this big room. They could put a ring in, they put the TV on for him and he used that to promote the big shows. He'd run every couple of months upstairs in the regular Coliseum. And it, he brought in Jerry Lawler against Terry Funk the last time that they worked. I went down there to see it, and he drew like 1,200 people. And he did Lawler and Dundee. And did, fuck it, this was in 2016. He did Jerry Lawler versus Bill Dundee. It did almost 1,500 people. And then he started running spot shows with because the majority of the card were the local guys, the Tennessee guys, the guys that – either coming up needed experience or just live around there and wanted a decent payoff. They're working part-time, whatever. And then he'd bring some names in. So he was, he was actually the independent promoter that was regularly running the biggest arena in the country. We talking about running that Jackson Coliseum four or five, six times a year. 
um, so he just knew how to hustle and promote and get people interested in things. It is classic old time grassroots, carny promoting, wrestling promoting. You know, Bert was a just a great guy uh, to me. I never had any problems with him. I know, I know that in in the past, in some cases, people had missed him and and their money along with it. But he had reformed to some extent, also. And you, well, you've got a story. You had a story with the. Uh, well, there's something coming up. Not to spoil anything. Don't and spoil anything. I didn't know whether it aired yet or not. Not to go too deep into my plug, but on the next six oh five, there is a story, a follow up to a popular story from the past from Howard Baum about. His interactions with Burt Prentice in the 80s when him and his father were running a local promotion in Florida. And we recently got a big follow up to that that we recorded days before Burt Prentice died. So that'll be on the next 605. It's already recorded and, and edited, you know, actually. I mentioned that I had I had just spoken to him because he had called me and I hadn't had the occasion to talk to Burt a couple of years on the phone because I haven't done any shows. And, you know, it's not like there was any heat, but we just didn't have occasion to talk. But then. I got a call from him and I said, well, you know, I, I, I'm bad about calling people back, but, uh, this was before a lot of my chaos started going on recently. I said, I'm gonna call Bert back because he, he said, I want to ask you about a date. And so I called him back and, and I guess they're running an event, uh, at one of the casinos down around Memphis the day after my birthday, September 18th is what he was asking about. So I, I told him, you know, I explained, I said, Bert, that's the day after my birthday, but even though I've pretty much, you know, curtailed live events because of all this shit, and, and, but I didn't want to leave you hanging. He said, I perfectly understand. And then he, because it was known that he had cancer quite a while back, and he it was in remission, or he had beaten it, or whatever, you know, the proper term is. And then uh, he told me on this phone call, he said, well, I'm not, you know, spreading this around publicly, but I i don't know whether he said his cancer had returned, whether it was the same thing, or he, he had cancer again. And I said, oh, no. Oh, and, and he said, no. And this was his exact words of what spooked me so bad. He said, no, it's not like that. He said, it's a slow-moving type of thing. And he used these, these exact words. He said, my death is not imminent. Uh, you know, if, if he was planning for a few more years, two, three, four years, whatever. He said, I've, you know, reconciled myself with it and we're, we're moving on. I said, well, that's great, Bert. And I said, listen, I can't do this one, but if you, you know, if you're, if you're doing Lawler's 50th anniversary show or something, put me down the first fucking time or whatever, we'll talk. Okay. And three weeks later, I hear he pass away. So... That was not good either. But Bert was just, he was so, he was a very entertaining guy to be around. And, and he knew his shit as far as the wrestling business and how to get people in the building to see whatever the fuck he could put together to, to show them, however good it may be or, or not. I have a hard drive somewhere that, uh, I don't know if the person will want me to attach his name to this just because of uh, the bootlegging aspect of it, but someone gave me, <laughs> a hard drive of every episode of Ozark Mountain Wrestling. That was another one. The headbangers went out there. I th I'm trying to think. Mick Foley, obviously Colorado Kid was the big star, but used a lot of the guys that were either from Smoky Mountain or Memphis. Anyone in that part of the country, Burt was running yeah. and he had TV, so he used them. I can't remember whether it was Chaz or Glenn of the headbangers because after Smoky Mountain closed down, they went to, and Ozark Mountain was in, was it Missouri or Arkansas? Based. Oh, I don't remember now. I think it was Arkansas. Uh, but they called me sometime later. Like, we're out here in Arkansas. And Bert's gone. <laughs> and <we're> like, well, <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're going to miss all these characters. Eventually, there's going to be no yeah. more Carney promoters. No, yeah. And we're going to miss it. There's going to be no more unique, entertaining individuals in the wrestling business. Just going to be all this, all these fucking, oh, don't ask me to do a promo, fucking guys that want to sit in the corner of the locker room with their phone and play video games. All righty, I guess we ought to do the show now. Um, and uh, first thing is, we've got to mention, which everybody in the business did uh, has over the past couple of days, uh, Daphne. Uh, passed away a couple of days ago. She committed suicide, which was 
unfortunately, uh, attention was called to it uh, all over the internet. She put up some videos that scared everybody, and by the time they could find her, apparently it was too late. And, you know, I mean, what do you say about a variety of these things? How How is it that, you know, that somebody can get in that position and, and they can't get any help? Uh, whether it's uh, – everybody talks about the United States has the best health care in the country. Well, they do – or in the world, rather. They do. It's just almost impossible to get any of it sometimes. Uh, but anyway, we, we can talk about that in a minute. But the point is I hadn't seen or talked to Daphne probably in 10 years. I think maybe if she was at a convention, um, you know, several years ago. But uh, I did spend some time with her when we were in TNA. And nice girl and dedicated and worked her gimmick and liked wrestling and was was not bad. Was was uh, certainly um especially with the field at the time she was one of the more over knockouts that they had um but i guess and this was after i had left cuz i was asking you i said what the hell when i started reading some of the injuries that she had and we had, we had heard i guess years ago i'd heard from somebody who had been talking about the case i can't remember who it was so i'm not going to mention any names cuz i don't remember them but she had been hurt twice in a fairly quick succession in TNA with concussions involved in both cases. And they said she was going to, and this has been all over the internet the past couple of days. They said, I remember it now uh, as I was refreshed on it. They said they were going to pay for her medical bills and then they didn't pay for her medical bills. And then they, the company actually asked her to wait she was getting done with all these notices and past due and all this stuff. And they asked her to wait uh, until it was really past due. And then they could negotiate a lesser amount for the settlement and just all kinds of shit. So they jacked her around and, and I'm not sure what she's had done in the business since then, but I know she'd made appearances, but I think that was her last, you know, regular spot. It probably stemming from, as we've heard from those injuries, but it just, I mean, this girl was like 125 pounds, and supposedly had, they had Abyss choke slam her off the apron of the ring through a table covered in barbed wire. And then were shocked and amazed when she actually got hurt. So, for everybody who's mad at me because I'm not a fan of, you know, girls or guys doing stuff like that. And I believe, from what I remember, and I wasn't really following it closely at the time, but. She didn't want to do it. She was kind of talked into it. And that's an important lesson, too. If you really feel you, you shouldn't do something, don't let someone talk you into it. I mean, and I know everybody wants the job and they don't want to get heat and blah, blah, blah. But at some point, you know, if, if, you, if you can't see in wrestling, if you can't see something in your head, if you can't visualize, I'm going to be involved in this, do this, cooperate with this, and I don't see how it's going to end well, don't do it. But anyway, so as I said, I hadn't seen her in years, but then I, Stacy heard about it yesterday and she was upset. And I said, well, what, you haven't seen this girl in years? And she, no, she had just been talking to her on the internet, like maybe a month ago. Cause I don't know who's all on Facebook and Instagram and all these things. But so she was, you know, really upset by it. And you know, with all the other stuff that's going on, this this should be something that's needless. It's already bad enough when when people go, you know, and and there's no there's no choice and there's no option. But for stuff like this to happen is you know is is ridiculous. And there ought to be. And then here's the, and i've mentioned this before with the wwe wellness program where they offered rehab to people who, on drugs but if you got cancer well you know you're on your own well now that this has happened even though daphne was not a wwe talent but she was in wcw in the attitude era for quite some time 
they announced that they're going to offer any of their, uh, yeah, well, I guess any talent. I don't know how they phrased it. Maybe it's just any talent. I think it may just be anyone who's there, actually. Yeah, any, yeah. anybody, um, you know, counseling, suicide prevention, whatever the case, for free. But why, why does a major company, and it's great, I'm not knocking him for doing that. And other people are saying, well, Ring of Honor ought to do that, and, and, and TNA ought to do that, and AEW ought to do Why do these companies have to offer people in their line of work that may not have even worked for them services like this when the United States government doesn't? That's the thing. I'm not talking about, and you've got a suicide prevention hotline number. We're going to give that in a second. But would it be an idea if it was easier? for people to get help before they're sitting there thinking about doing something, decide they want to call an 800 number at three o'clock in the morning. And that's, it's with all health care. We've talked about the hoops that Stace had to jump through to get surgery on her back. We've talked about the amount of money that we have to pay for insurance. Uh, if we don't get provided by our employer, which millions and millions of people don't. The, then the insurance that you get then you have to find doctors that take that particular insurance and they have to be in a certain clique or network or group or whatever. And then some of it offers mental health counseling and some of it doesn't. And some of it, some of it, you know, well, if you get hurt on a Tuesday, no, we don't cover whatever the case. Most American citizens are not well-versed enough. In some cases, smart enough. It's, it's like learning calculus to figure out all the loopholes and hoops you have to jump through in your medical, in the medical systems we have to find doctors that do things, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I'm talking about because you've been self-employed for much of your entrepreneurial life. And it's fucking ridiculous. So I'm just wondering why it's so, and, and everybody <clears throat> that we we always mention um you know the health care in the united states the problems of getting insurance getting coverage getting this and that and we always say it's because that we have been all sold a bill of goods as the country from primarily the republicans that oh you don't want government messing in your health care and and all the other places that provide it well it sucks there and you have to wait forever and they're all veterinarians but Brian, you've heard some of these emails, read some of these emails. Every time we actually have some of these people that have this socialized medicine in every other civilized country in the world, they say, no, we love it. Saved my life. Had cancer, just had to pay for parking. So is it? Is this not a thing that maybe should be addressed as well as whether we can see a doctor or not? And so... Um, so you could get counseling or not instead of, and then, you know, people, they open up GoFundMes for their medical bills because of this in the United States of America, because if you don't have insurance, you don't have the right kind of insurance or whatever the loophole is. Even if you're a millionaire, if you have a major illness, you can go bankrupt. And Somehow we're being told that this is a good thing, and it's it's this all should be tied together, should it not? And then maybe not only we could prevent suicide, but maybe we could also take an, a, a check a look in on some of these people that don't need to own guns and firearms and are a danger to themselves and other people at the same time and prevent some of that. We'd be keeping an eye on them because it would actually be something where you could actually go to a doctor and tell them you have an issue. What do you think, Brian? Well, there are certainly issues in the American healthcare system, but one good thing is that if someone does feel like they need someone to talk to, they don't have to feel stressed out about finding someone or having to go out there and the insurance or whatever. You can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 800-273-8255. Another way to remember it, 800-273-TALK, T-A-L-K. Once again, 800-273-8255. There's always someone to talk to. There's always someone on the other side of the line that will give you the time, that will listen to you, that will talk to you, that will help you. 
And just remember, things always get better. Uh, anyway, but I just hate to hear something like this. And, and well, you know, I didn't work with Daphne closely or, you know, know her on a social basis. She was, as I said, was always a nice girl and, and you know, always enjoyed working alongside her. And you never want to hear something like this. Um, and we, we should recognize at the top of the program uh, that... Uh, not only a famous wrestling veteran legend, but also the one of the godfathers of the whole wrestling belt business and industry. Reggie Parks passed away just, I guess, yesterday. And gosh, and I forgot to note how old he was, but he would have been in his early 80s at this point, would he not? Or do you know? I'll find his age right now, but that sounds right. Um. And for people who don't recognize the name, Reggie Parks in the 50s and 60s and 70s was a journeyman wrestler that wrestled in, you know, like umpteen territories almost everywhere all across the country. And especially he had spent a lot of time in the AWA for the last half of his career. And he worked uh, toward the end of it under a mask as the Avenger because he... He was always in great shape and had a great looking physique, but as he got into his 40s facially, he looked older, so he put a hood on. Boom. Um, 87. 87. Holy shit. <clears throat> well, there you go. Um, but anyway, um, but he became more integral to the wrestling business uh, toward the latter years of his in ring career than after he retired because he was the guy that made. In the early days, when only a, you could only get them in a few different places and they meant something, he made the title belts for the different wrestling promotions. And gosh, I guess what? Nikita Malkovich is the guy who, the Russian wrestler, who made a lot of the, the 1960s era belts and, and that you still saw in the early 70s. And, and actually, he made the, the belts that, that Crockett used as the NWA World Tag Team belts until 1986 when Rude and Manny made off with them. So those are the original ones that the Midnight held. And a lot of the WWWF uh, belts from the late 60s, early 70s was Nikita Malkovich. That kind of design, I can't describe it verbally, but for those of you who knows what those belts look like. But then pretty much after that, from what, the late 70s, early 80s, Reggie took over. And he made almost all the territory belts. He didn't make the um, the domed globe. They got that done, did they not? Uh, Paul Bosch had a part to play in that and got it in Mexico, right? That sounds right. Um, but he made almost all of the the territory belts that were that looked any decent and were worth anything. I mean, I've said this before. The one thing I complained about the Memphis territory was they would use shit belts and they'd use them until they fell completely apart and with no shame whatsoever, just complete lack of shame. But Reggie's belts were professional and they looked good. And so he did that for, for years and then uh, brought a few other people into the business with him and gradually handed it off to, you know, to Dave Milliken and, and some people that Dave has worked with. Um, but he actually made the Smoky Mountain belts. And it's a funny thing because I, I don't have any real personal anecdotes about Reggie because I never met, I met him once finally at a fan fest somewhere, God, years ago, but in the modern era, right? But at the time that I got the Smoky Mountain belts from him and for years after that, I had never met him. Not in person, I talked to him on the phone. Because you just knew that when you started a company or needed a belt in the, you know, in the 80s and 90s, well, somebody better call Reggie. And, you know, when the territories went out of business, he slowed down there a little while in the early 90s. Thankfully, I was able to get him to do the Smoky Mountain belts. But I, I had no idea of what the process was for making belts. Right. I, you know, I didn't know how that those, the plates are made or shaped or the gold embossing or whatever is put on or the letter. I, you know, I just, I knew what I wanted to, wanted it them to look like based on being a fan of wrestling and seeing belts and knowing belts, but I had no idea how they were made. 
So this is how good Reggie was. I said, I got his number and called him on phone, explained I wanted two tag belts and a singles belt. And I said, Reggie, if I just kind of sketch this out, draw it out on a piece of paper for you, how I kind of want it to look, is that is that good? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, and, you know, I don't like the slick gold. I like the texture, like, you know, the guys wearing the gold. He could identify with this. When the, when the guys in the 80s in the big territory started making all the money, they got the big fucking gold bracelets and watches and that, that textured look to it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I just, on a, with a pen and a piece of paper, drew how I kind of wanted the plates to look and told him that on the phone. And also, for the heavyweight title belt, uh, my mom, I've told this story before, but it's applicable here. My mom used to order in the 70s. It, you, just items from, do you ever, if, do they still, I think they still have a catalog, but have you ever heard of Finger Hut? Of course, yeah. Okay, well, this, it was a small deal in the 70s, but they would send out mail order catalogs and they'd have little cheap items or whatever. I guess it's maybe a bigger deal today. But if you bought something or bought X amount of things or whatever, they'd give you free gifts and they were cheap gifts. And she had somehow amassed a treasure trove of seven giant cubic zirconia fake diamonds as finger hut free gifts i don't and and i saw them when i was visiting one day and uh before when i was setting smoky mountain up i said are you gonna use these fake diamonds right well, what a question she's like no take them so i sent him the fake diamonds and had him put them in the the uh you know the points on the crown in the in the etc the area of the crown in the uh heavyweight title belt and and anyway, that's what I, the point I was going to make. From that, he was so good, boom, it, within a couple of months, he had done the belts, sent them to me in a box in the mail. They looked beautiful. Everybody's obviously seen pictures. And, and, and that was also what made the Smoky Mountain Heavyweight title even more sentimental to me because my mom's fake finger hut diamonds were in it. And his na- and he always stamped his name uh, with the leather stamp on the on the end of the one of the belts where it straps on the back. Reggie Parks and those are stamped on there also. So anyway, uh, eighty seven years old. So I I hope I make it that far. But you, I'm not so sure about Brian. You're not so sure I'll make it, or that you'll hope I'll make it. Either one. Hey. Um. Well, that's, that'd be a long way for you to go. Being as you're only a mere scant of a pup of a lad, should we, we, we should let's mention at the start um, a guy that we both knew and has passed away, and uh, I'm sure 99% of the fans listening or anybody that wasn't in the wrestling business really particularly for about a five or ten year period about 20 years ago may not have ever heard of this guy, but he was one of those unforgettable characters tom Cassati, uh just passed away we understand he was i guess in his late 50s and honestly that surprises me because he looked 50 25 years ago um and we're 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 gonna sound like we're making mockery of tom and we're not actually we are because that's what he would have wanted he was a gimmick he was a a character he didn't he he didn't have a character. He was a character. He was a gimmick that you only find in and around the wrestling business. And when did he start running shows, Brian, actually? Because, of course, he was in New Jersey and in, in that area in the late 90s when I was up in the WWE uh, uh, working for Dennis Corluzzo and booking third-party promotions. I'd booked some guys for him. But was it just right about that time we always heard he – inherited money from his mother and that's how yeah. how he sp- spent money to run wrestling shows to be in the wrestling business he spent money I, to be in the wrestling business yes. yes a lot of money but it was about that same time right he hadn't been around very long or did he manage first as royce prophet the rotund manager of doom which came first the promoting or the managing i'm not sure because all of a sudden he just popped up at shows I was going to for Dennis in Yardville, New Jersey. I was hanging out with Dennis and Mark Carluzzo and Donnie B at these shows. And all of a sudden he was there and he was so, I hate to say it, but 
like you said, he would want this. He was so weird and creepy. I always stayed away yeah. from him because <laughs> he was like, again, he wore a suit at ringside and he had his hair slicked back into a little bit of a ponytail and he looked like a bigger, grosser version of Heyman at that time when he would still wear the suit. Yes, and now he w- he wouldn't be a bigger version of Heyman now because Heyman's pretty good well, size, then, but he'd still be a grosser version. Yeah, he was yeah. a bigger gro. He was shorter, dumpier, with uh, not much more hair then than Paul has now, and it then it was slicked back into ponytail. But also, and he was he was both pale and dark complected at the same time because his natural skin pallor was very pale. He almost looked translucent like he got a moon tan but then on top of that at various points it is no but i'm serious at various parts of his face would be like red like the heartbreak of psoriasis red right especially when he got out of breath and everything so his face was both colorful and glowing and deathly pale at the same time and but but it added to his gimmick because he was, a, you know, he, he was a <laughs> greasy manager you wanted to stay away from. So there were a couple of things specifically I remember that I was around for. So you say that the story went around that he inherited this money. Yes. That's all I knew. That and there were started to be stories that he was booking wrestlers for shows, <laughs> but then there were no shows. It was more like, hey, let's just go hang out at the beach. Well, I, I got I got one of those, but keep going. <laughs> so the, so these stories start going around, and then the word starts going around that he's blowing all of his inheritance on whatever his wrestling exploits are, and no one really could figure out exactly what they were. So one night in Yardville, he's managing someone, and I'm in the back, and Donnie B gets on the house mic, and I know this is unprofessional, but it was Yardville, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, I've been to Yardville. But all of a sudden, he's managing a rig sign, Donnie gets on the mic, Tommy, this is your mommy. Where's my money? I want my money back. He starts selling it from ringside. He starts looking up at the sky and like, talking to the sky. <laughs> it was one of the most surreal things because we didn't know how we would react. We did not expect him to react like that, but that was. Well, he loved it, right? Yeah. He, 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 he thought rib. it was a great rib. <laughs> Well, yeah, you, he started booking <laughs> shows or running shows and he would book some guys. And when I was doing the booking, the third party guys, you know, which was generally the list of guys they didn't, you know, book on the the main tour or, you know, weren't being used too much or whatever, needed some extra dates. And among them were the headbangers, uh, Thrasher and Mosh and uh, Glenn and Jazz. And, you know, and, and those guys, they'd worked for Burt Prentice and they'd, they were old school wrestling, so they could go and easily have spot show matches and not get hurt and whatever. So I'd book them wherever, you know, I could. That they they didn't mind going anywhere. And but every first couple times, and they finally, I can't remember, I think it may have been Glenn that called me and said, This Tom Cassati he keeps he pays us, but he cancels. And I said, Well, you know, do you want me to keep booking he said yeah he said because then we we go and we just hang out and he takes us to dinner and he pays us like we wrestled he said said, but this last one he never actually had us go to a building i don't think he was really running a show he had us go to say they went to his apartment or whatever so then i'm pretty sure they were the ones and i'm not sure they were the only ones this might have been after they were done with the wwf but he booked a number of guys, including the headbangers on like a weekend in the, was it the Bahamas or was it? Yeah, that's what I think it was. St. Martin? Because it wasn't like Don Marie and, um, and what's his name? Um, Lance Diamond. They were part of that too. Simon Diamond. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when they got down there, it turned out there weren't any shows. He just say, Hey, let's hang out on the beach and have a vacation. He (laughs) them to come down and have a vacation with him. And he, I, I'll know, I can tell you who he looked like at ringside. Royce Prophet. I'm not sure what the origination of the name or the gimmick was, but he looked suspiciously like the Penguin. Yes, if more than Heyman had, ever did. More than had Heyman bad ever skin. Did. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, but and now that we've just ripped this guy up one side and down the other, I'm th- people are thinking oh, you must have hated him. No, he was a he was a fun guy, and he would have liked the attention. I stayed away from him. Do you remember the story? 
And it was either Tommy Fierro and Billy Real or Tommy Fierro and the Inferno Kid. And I don't remember, but Tommy and, Infer- and uh, Danny Germundo always hung out together. But I, I want to say Billy Real was a part of this. <laughs> Where somehow they ended up, I want to say in Vegas, but it may have been somewhere else. They ended up in an apartment with Kasadi and he wouldn't let them leave. And he held them at gunpoint. And then finally, either one of them escaped or they got word to the cops. The cops showed up and when they arrived, Kasadi entered the door and he had shaving cream all over his I, I face. Remember, yeah, shaving cream. I remember that now. Not like on his beard area. His whole face was yeah. covered in shaving cream. They won't recognize me if I'm covered in. <laughs> and I know, and now, now rest in peace. <laughs> yes, peace. I know somebody out there is going, wait a minute, what the fuck? They're they're laughing about the shaving cream. They buried the lead. He held him in his in his house at gunpoint. But it was just a you know minor minor thing with Tom, an issue that he had. I'm sure there was apologies given later on. But he he didn't want him to go. He wanted company. It must suck if you're on the way over there and you're like, man, I heard he took fucking headbangers to the Bahamas. I wonder where he's going to take us. Took you to the couch and then he took out his yeah. gun. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. He took the headbangers to Cancun. He took us hostage on the couch. <laughs> Rest in peace, Tom Cassati. Another unforgettable character you know a lot of these people i'm telling you in the wrestling business as they go they're going to be forgotten because you don't find people like this every day and that's what we plugged you know burt prentice's yeah book that uh that scott teal at crowbarpress.com just finished because nobody leads a life like that or tom cassati who i'm sure burt probably figures out he he was he he'd rather have led the life he led than led to the life tom led we had news as we uh have been doing the program and uh we've got to make mention of it at the close of the show apparently angelo mosca has just passed away do you have some more on that brian from the internet i'm just seeing some reports coming in right now as we are recording but angelo king kong mosca of course a big star in canada but throughout the united states he worked for various territories has just passed away i believe he was 84 years old i'm looking for more information right now but i believe he had been in ill health i think I may be wrong, but due to concussions, he was a football player, obviously, for many years. I yeah. believe he had some issues with dementia the last decade or so. But Angelo King Kong Mosca, you know, up until early to mid 80s, still a big star even in the States. And then, of course, Mosca Mania in Canada after WrestleMania. Yeah. Mosca Mania. Um, well, and also, and you mentioned that he was not only up there in years, but also he had played pro football and then wrestled for. 20 or 30 years or whatever. So of course he is, he did have some dementia and he was famous for God. Was it 10 years ago or maybe even a little less? There was a Canadian football league reunion yeah. and he and another football player had a goddamn beef from the sixties and they both were up on stage and started jawing at each other. And Mosca was on a cane. And I guess the other, did he hit the guy first? The guy hit him back or the other guy hit him first. There was a, there was an exchange of blows and Mosca tripped and fell down and his cane was underneath him and they were having to pull these I don't think he tripped and fell down. 70 something year old fucking men. What now? I don't think he tripped and fell down. I think the other guy slugged him. Well, the other guy did slug him. I don't I mean he it wasn't like it was a fucking Joe Frazier right cross, but it, it with the elderly age of both guys, Mosca went down and and it was just, it was a sad scene because there was these two senior citizens. But Mosca was a badass. It, besides professional football, he was, what, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, 270, 280, that fucking face. He looked like, he looked not quite as big, but very much like Abyss. Just a big guy with big hands and big feet and a big face. and. Obviously, King Kong Mosca was, you know, uh, like you said, a star for the AWA, and he was huge in Florida at one time, and he had wrestled all over the country, but since he was Canadian, and he was from, I think the team that he played for was was Hamilton, right? I'm not certain. Um, I'm not up on my Canadian Canadian Football football League either. But point is, 
the Mosca Mania shows drew like crazy because of his name. And Mosca Mania, the, the one they did, I remember, was the same day as the taping of the uh, first TBS primetime wrestling special, the Superstars on the Superstation. It was February 2nd, 1986. We were in Charlotte with the Rock and Roll Express. That was when we sold out Charlotte Coliseum with no Dusty, no Flair, no Road Warriors for the afternoon show. And then because they were all at the Cops Coliseum in Hamilton for Mosca Mania, which drew, as I recall, between ten and 12,000 people. It was a hundred and something thousand dollar gate. And Angelo Mosca was the local promoter. That's how Crockett was getting back at Tunney in Toronto for going with uh, Vince by having Angelo Mosca be his local promoter in Hamilton, Ontario, just right down the road and running these big events in Hamilton. And they did several of them and they drew well because Mosca was such a name. But, uh, you know, so I hate to hear that he's passed away, but obviously at that age and with that type of career and everything, we can't all of us live forever, but he was another one of the, a guy is an original. You don't find people like that anymore walking around. And that was the kind of characters that were in the wrestling business. And a great example of a guy who was a big star could do a promo. He could be a heel, could be a baby face, was a badass, And then his son got involved in the wrestling business. And boy, Angelo Mosca Jr. in 83. There's footage around of him trying to apply the figure four. That is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Yes. Well, there's footage of him trying to do promos where it's like that he's just hearing the English words that he's speaking for the first time. And the look on his face is like a surprise that they're coming out. He was a nice kid. He just wasn't a good, good wrestler or good public speaker. But he was... He was a nice kid, but it, it the the uh, the acorn fell a distance from the tree, then rolled down the hill and was sl- swept away in the stream. All right, all right then, there you have it. Uh, but our condolences to Mosca's fans, friends, family, and and etc. Again, another Hall of Famer, Angelo Mosca. Did you ever lost. see him live? Oh God, yes. Um, I. I want to say the first time I saw him was when Crockett was running the Cincinnati gardens. Maybe I'm misremembering when I went up as a fan before I was in the business. And then I saw him somehow two or three times. Uh, Not, not often, but a couple of times. Follow up, (laughs) follow up. (laughs) That seemed to, that seemed to placate your curiosity. That placated my curiosity. And of course, we all send our condolences to the family and friends of Angelo King Kong Mosca, a legend in wrestling and, of course, in Canadian football. Well, you gave us the bad news about Michael Nesmith. Um, and we had some bad news we wanted to address, not at the top of the program anymore, but before we go any further, um, Black Jack Lanza passed away this past week. Uh, I, at the age of, I, heard, I saw 86 and 87. And if obviously either is is an advanced age, and you know, it just it occurred to me that even Pat Patterson gets a lot of recognition for his contribution because he's acknowledged he was on the creative team and he was the creative guy behind the Royal Rumble, and you know, some of the other guys that have passed have gotten more response from the fans. In this case, Jack Lanza's response was more from people in the business. Did you notice that? Because it's been so long since the, he was a public figure for the fans, they don't realize how, how at one time, what the size of a uh, level of star he was, but also how respected he was, how over he was with the boys in the locker room uh, as an agent, what would now be called a producer in in the WWF for so many years from well from the time that he retired and got off the road uh, through god he he was still up there when I moved back to Louisville in 1999 so he didn't retire until he was in his late 60s and universally every one of the boys liked and respected and looked up to and enjoyed being around at various points Jack Lanza I can't remember anybody 
having a problem with Jack Lanza. He, you know, he's just one of those guys. And still he was an authority figure and he didn't let the guys run over him and they didn't even try because it's fucking Jack Lanza, right? But I, I guess what I'm saying is that you, a lot of the fans didn't go, oh my gosh, like it would have been for anybody else but the 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 guys, the boys in the business up to and including Vince, which a lot of times when Vince tweets stuff, you think, well, maybe somebody wrote that for him or he approved it or whatever. But I can hear Vince saying the words about Jack Lanza that he said in that tweet. So I think I think it's something that respond resonated more inside the business just because of the time it's been since since Jack had been in the ring. What do you think? Yeah, and you know, I think also because of what footage is out there and the careers they had, to fans who aren't from the AWA, it's funny, but Blackjack Mulligan became famous as the Blackjack. Yeah. To a lot of people. And Blackjack Lanza never, I mean, he had the one run with Mulligan as the tag team here, which went awry because Mulligan decided to leave. <laughs> and he had a major run in the AWA. I mean, he's, he's one of the all-time legends of the AWA. But outside of there, St. Louis and St. Louis. I mean, he got to go with Heenan to St. Louis, which was well, weird. Heenan got to go with Lanza. That's true. See, a lot of a lot That's of true. people That's don't true. remember that. It it wasn't like oh, Bobby Heenan's managing this guy, so let's bring him too. It was like Jack Lanza is a a top heel, and he says that he works better with this manager that he uses elsewhere. So let's bring Heenan in, and he and developed that, the blackjack gimmick. Yes. See, that's a, and. With with Mulligan, and uh, of course, Blackjack Mulligan is Barry Windham's father, as we've mentioned, just for the younger listeners. And, well, Blackjack Mulligan was the father of Barry Windham and his brother, Kendall Windham. And then what is the relationship? Bray Wyatt is the grandson. Yes. And, and, and also, Mike Rotunda became a son-in-law and married into the family. So that bloodline, there's been several third generation Wyndham's involved in the business, but I first saw it. You skipped one place. Cause I first saw the blackjacks. They were Bobby Heenan's team. When I first started watching Indianapolis, Indianapolis wrestling yeah. when, and they were working for bruiser and to see those guys because Jack was legitimately. And as he got older, he, started stooping over a little bit but he legitimately at his in his day was 6465 and 260 265 or 70 and he was the small one cuz Mulligan they used to bill him at anywhere at 610 350 or whatever but he legitimately 6768 you it looked like it and every bit of 320 325 and so they were fucking huge and the black glove and the black hat, the black mustache. I mean, you know, Gunsmoke was almost still on television. Gunsmoke went, no, it still was. Gunsmoke wasn't canceled till 1975. Bonanza was still on TV. So cowboys were a big fucking deal. And, uh, and it was just, it was a great, and, and you could believe that these two guys could beat up Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher almost kind of. Nobody, no other regular humans could, but that's at that point, Jack Lanza had been a top heel in not only in Indiana, but as, as we mentioned all over the Midwest and different places. And he worked with Heenan and they had that run for what? 72 through 75 as the black Jacks. And then Mulligan left because George Scott offered him a spot to be a top single star because Mulligan was was younger than Lanza and came along afterwards and had never really been a top single star. But in the Carolinas, that's where Blackjack Mulligan got over. And because of all the the video and the film and everything that still exists, that's people think Blackjack Mulligan, right? Does Mulligan get the call if Johnny Valentine isn't hurt in the plane crash? Probably not. Not not right at the end. He wouldn't have left if. if Unless it was the absolute top spot that George Scott was promising him in the Carolinas, he wouldn't have left being a WWF tag team champion to just, you know, go work on the card or somewhere or whatever. It would have to be a spot like that. It happened more often than not. I mean, Victor Rivera did it a few years later. Actually, not even that long later. A year later, Victor Rivera did it and he went to the IWA. 
Well, it's two different because <laughs> Blackjack Mulligan what wasn't going to leave the W. He had been around in and around the business for a while. He was not going to quit be quit while he was a WWF tag team champion. Um, to go, you know, just somewhere and do something. Victor Rivera, sad fact that he didn't have the upside or people calling for him in different territories that Mulligan did, probably also had something personal going on with the office and or fell for this is the IWA and we're all going to, the same new promotion thing that a lot of guys fall for. I'm just saying. Still. <laughs> but anyway, nevertheless. Um, but Lanza, that's the thing is, is that I guess he, he had runs in Georgia also, uh, as a single and he and Heenan went down there some, because a lot of the AWA guys, you mentioned he was in the AWA for the bulk of the latter half of the seventies, since they only ran 16, 18 days a month because they didn't do a lot of spot shows. They did the big markets and it was spread out geographically. The guys that wanted to there could book themselves in other territories. That's why Bockwinkle started making so many shots in Houston later on in Memphis, because he would make good money on nights that Vern wasn't even running shows. But I guess what would he have been? You mentioned the footage that's available also. They had some nice still pictures, but they did a tribute video to Jack, and there was like two or three clips of Black Jack's matches because the that was the era of the horrible looking potato shaped job guys, the shitty TV matches, the, the rubber band ropes. And I'm, I would imagine the glory days, the glory days. And now to a lot of people's, you know, eyes, that shit would, Oh boy. But, um, but I guess it was probably what after 80 one, two would Jack have transitioned out of the ring. Or was it? Was oh no! It, maybe it was a little bit after, after that because was it after that? Remember, he was still there when Vern started to go to war with Vince because it created and to me it didn't work at that point in his life. The way he looked, he looked older. He was covered in hair. He had the mustache, and he became a baby face. And he started wearing oh, all white. white. That's right. Oh, it was it was not a good choice. <laughs> and then he went to yeah. work for Vince. And because Jack and I, I loved him to death. He was so much. He made the TVs a lot more fun. And the and the time after the production meeting, before he had to do shit, because he loved to talk and tell stories. And he was just a fun guy anyway. And like I said, he'd be an authority figure in all business if he needed to be. But also, you know, he had a million stories. But I'm I'm thinking of him in the all white because he was one of the guys that had the spray on hair the spray can of spray on hair for a bald spot on top because his hair, he had to be still to dying it at that point. Cause he's in his mid sixties, you know, 20 years ago when I, 25 years ago when I'm dealing with him and it's still just so black lightning bugs are following him around in the daytime, but he had the can of spray on cause it had gotten thin on the top and you could see the, the bald spot. But Jack was the lead agent. He was the head, except Pat Patterson had a different responsibility when he was on the creative team and he would sit down with the main event guys on the pay-per-views and on the big shows, et cetera. That's where you hear Pat being the agent and helping the Hearts and Michaels and thing with their matches. But Jack Lanza was the lead agent that I said now is called a producer that was on the road every night. You know, there was Tony Gurria and there was Dave Hebner and there was George the Animal Steel. And, I, you know, I'm leaving some people out. And but but Jack was always the top agent in the house shows. And he was obviously utilized high up on the pay-per-views as well. You know, some of the matches. But he would not only. Because a lot of the a lot of times in those days on the house shows, they just send an agent for the locker room and an agent for the box office so if dave hebner was checking up jack lanza was the guy that you were dealing with getting your finishes getting a draw any other issues whatever and then he's the one that would call in and do the the agent report they had a special number at titan tower that you would call and it was hooked up to a recording machine with no no time limit like if you leave a voicemail on a 
recording uh, answering machine is like after three minutes a beep it's full whatever no this was you could leave however long a message you wanted and that's what the agents did when they would call in after the shows and they do the agent report and they would give the the house and the you know reaction from the building if there was one and any issues and they would run down each match and they would they would say enough about each match so that Vince and everybody in the office would know that they actually watched it and every once in a while if they just if they couldn't or didn't watch it they would say I was held up in the back doing something else and I didn't see that but blah 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 but Jack I mean some others were were perfunctory but Jack would someday he wouldn't come out and just bury anybody but he would every once in a while he would place responsibility where it belonged but he always had the uplifting but it'll be another day tomorrow and they're looking better and the kids are learning or some you know platitude afterwards or whatever and poor old Howard Finkel that's one thing he would get in at five o'clock in the morning because he's sitting there with his typewriter fucking transcribing whatever agent it was in this case it'd be Jack all these things and it would be like four or five single spaced typewritten pages of the agent report from a town. And I wish I'd saved all of those. I probably have a few in the drawer here somewhere, but I mean, the amount of paper that we were inundated with was ridiculous. So for people who think I saved everything, um, but yeah, but Jack was, you know, he, he was a great guy. He'd seen everything and met everybody, had great stories didn't get upset, didn't yell, but put his foot down if he had to and did his job. And, and everybody came to him to ask what, what should I do here? Or what do you think about this? Or blah, blah, blah. It wasn't like you hear somebody knocking George Steele and other people knocking Tony Gurria and whatever, but you didn't hear anybody burying Jack Lance. Hello, friends. Cutting in one last time here as we get towards the end of this omnibus, those we lost in 2021, so many different wrestling stars, so many people from around the wrestling business. Of course, some stories that make you laugh and some that really tug at the heartstrings, really make the, I guess it wouldn't have anything to do with the cockles of the heart, but the heartstrings, whatever they might be. (laughs) Well, (laughs) boy, you're just... You're just not a warm-hearted individual, Brian. You just, you you can do anything except just be be nice and warm. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. No, um, no. Some of the stories are are classic, and you, it always you know makes you laugh. Some of the stories are a little harder to get through. Depends on the topic and who's involved and etc. And uh, we saved one specific one for the last part of the program here for obvious reasons um and we'll say right before we go to that that uh, uh again a reminder you know if you want some more frivolous uh and and uh, entertaining content uh look for the other omnibuses and the compilations everything we're going to have on the youtube channel at official jim cornett this week and we hope you enjoy those and uh we wanted to say happy new year from all of us again here uh for Everybody at the Arcadian Vanguard Network, all the minions, uh, J Sharknado, Kippelman, uh, Hotchkiss, and everybody. The hardworking people, I wouldn't say minions, yes. the hardworking, intelligent, diligent people at Arcadian Vanguard. Well, they can be diligent on their own time. But anyway, um, but yeah, the one we've saved uh, is, of course, the one that that we had most comments about, most feedback about. Uh, the most, I guess it was the most listened to individual podcast we did this past year, and certainly one of the most seen or listened to YouTube clips, but uh, the show we did, well, here I go again, the week after Bobby Eaton passed away. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to that, and we're not going to come back after it because you can't follow beautiful Bobby. And we will see you guys uh, next week on whatever show we do. Brian, what show are we doing from here? Uh, we have a drive through coming up, a brand new drive through coming up. But I guess the big thing is we will see everyone in 2022. But let's now go to our final segment, of course, the tribute to beautiful Bobby Eaton. Hello, everybody. This is a different kind of Jim Cornette experience today. And... 
We've already started it once and didn't get this far. Um, it, we're not going to review any wrestling. And we're not going to talk about bullshit. And there's no commercials. And I don't actually know if we're going to finish this at this point. I don't know if we're going to get anything that we can air. I would like to. Because I truthfully want to get this over with. And I can't do another podcast in my life without talking about this. So the option was do this or never do another podcast again, which was heavily considered over the last couple of days, rather than do this. But we're going to try... Um. If you're listening to this, then you probably know that Bobby Eaton passed away this past Wednesday night, and obviously everybody, as soon as they got the news, were on social media and et cetera. And a lot of people were paying tribute to him, but everybody knows that I have a hard time talking about stuff like this with about certain people. And so I wasn't sure exactly what we might do here today. And I'm still not. Um, and that's why Brian last is here try to keep me on some kind of coherent train of thought, Brian, which you've already lost that battle. Um, but what we're going to try to do, because the words that I just got out may have been the hardest, we're going to, I'm not going to say those again, but we're going to try to just talk today about Bobby and what he meant to everybody and some of the <laughs> cool things about him and how much that, he helped not only me, but a lot of people and the, the respect that they had for him. And Brian, I'll let you talk in a minute, but obviously a lot of people are like, what happened? What happened? <clears throat> well, we already talked about on the shows here last month, Bobby's wife, Donna passed away. She was Bill Dundee's daughter and they'd, obviously been married uh well they got married in what was it 1981 ish i i can't remember but anyway um and the story went out that they donna had always been forbidden to uh to date any wrestlers because she's the daughter of a wrestler and dundee knew what was going on and then he found out without finding out who it was just that she'd been behind his back. She'd been seeing one of the boys and she, he's like, Oh, I'm going to kill the motherfucker. And she says, Bobby Eaton. And he's, like, uh, well, all right. God damn it. If you had to pick one, you picked the right one. And so Donna had passed away. She'd had breast cancer, uh, before, and then it had come back and it had been, you know, she knew what was going on, um, but it was just last month, and then a few weeks later, and I don't think we've even talked about this on the show because I didn't want to alarm people, um, but Bobby had gotten dizzy, fallen some kind of way at at his at his house in Nashville, uh, his daughter Taryn was moving over from North Carolina to uh, to live there so that she could monitor Bobby's medicines and you know the issues he's had. We everybody knows he's had so many health issues. He's had a couple of heart attacks. He had a pacemaker put in. He was diabetic. Um, I mean, honestly, like most of the boys. Uh, his age that have worked for so long, he'd been having issues back and forth with his memory. And maybe, you know, it wasn't a serious situation, you know, all the time, but 
you know, point is, needed somebody to make sure he was taking his medicine, et cetera. Taryn was in the process of moving over. And I think she completed that. But anyway, they took him to the hospital because he fell and banged himself up and he was dizzy and they couldn't get him upright. So um, they kept him in, for, I guess he was there for about 10 days because they were monitoring his various signs um, they even at, at one point they asked him what kind of pacemaker he had and he it, it might as well have asked him, you know, what battery they use on the Challenger space shuttle. Right. He, I, I, you know, and they, I think they called the hospital over in Jonesboro where he got it. And, but at one point also they'd mentioned that they, uh, and I was getting this from, from Bobby told me a little bit on the times I talked to him, but his friend, Brian Thompson went over and saw him and, and got some of this information and I'm trying to relay it properly, but they had mentioned they might send him to a, from the hospital to a physical rehab center because of his hip. They were concerned about his hip in the fall, but I still, as, as we were thinking about it further i don't know whether he injured his hip particularly in that fall or whether they just actually x-rayed bobby eaton and said my god how are what's the matter here how are you walking we need to do something immediately i don't know right um but at any rate then they decided to uh send him home and have a physical therapist come to his house uh, to work on his hip and et cetera. And they revamped his medicines and sent him home on Saturday afternoon. And I talked to him right as they were, he was like, well, Gordon, you're going to let me go home. I'm going to get off of here. Um, and he has been there with, you know, his daughter and I think grandson is there and people, you know, been, He's been on the medicine. People were around him. His physical therapist came on Wednesday afternoon and worked with him. And it was like, okay, you know. And then Wednesday night, something happened. So, you know, Brian, say something. Well, obviously, Jim, uh, I don't know how much of it you've seen. I know you've seen some of it, but the outpouring of support and love, the condolences coming in from all across professional wrestling, from fans, from people involved with wrestling companies, from wrestlers. You know, he was one of those guys, especially to a lot of the guys in the locker room of Crockett Promotions, the favorite wrestler of the wrestlers. You know, you hear Ric Flair or any of these guys talk about Bobby Eaton or working with Bobby Eaton, and it says a lot, but, you know, we're not just celebrating... Bobby Eaton, the wrestler, Bobby Eaton from the Midnight Express, we're celebrating Bobby Eaton, the person, and you got to, better than anyone, know every side of Bobby Eaton, you got to ride with him, you got to, when you were a photographer, you got to take pictures, and uh, I was actually going to ask you about that, because... First first time I ever went to court, I went with Bobby Eaton. I wasn't even in the business yet. What happened? I was a witness. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? So we're in Rupp Arena in Lexington, Kentucky. One night, it's 1981. And I'm shooting pictures. It's Bobby's in a match with somebody. I can't remember who is not pertinent to the fucking story, right? But Dream Machine's in the first family also. Jimmy Art's first family. He's got to do a run-in on this match. So they're fucking, they're going into the finish and the shit's going on. Here comes Dream down the aisle hauling ass to do this run-in. And this big old fucking corn-fed farm boy in about the fourth row on the end, got I saw Dream go by and jumped up and fucking waistlock tackled him, trying to keep him from getting in the ring. Cause you know, the fucking team, his team was in need, right? The boy, he, he had to come to fucking babyface's rescue. <clears throat> so God Dream keeps running, but now he's got a guy hanging on him and the guy's feet are dragging. I looked around <laughs> and saw this. Cause and there he comes, and Dream is over leaning behind him. Whack, whack, hitting the guy while still running, hitting him to get him to turn loose, right? So he wasn't really punched him in the face or anything. He just whacking on him, and, and the, he lost the guy and rolled in the ring, did the run in. The Bobby started to come out, as a matter of fact, to see if he needed any help. And so the cops grabbed the guy, but of course he pressed charges because the dream machine beat him up, and me and Bobby were the witnesses. So the court is in Lexington. I think they managed to get it 
booked or in some kind of way where they were in Louisville here the night before, and then we got to go over the next day to court, right? And that's where the dream that on the trip that gave me the story about now don't don't expose the business, say what you know, tell the truth what happened, but nothing about anything you know about whether you know. He said, it's more important that we protect the baby. He's the one going to court, right? He's more important we protect the business. I said, I got you, Troy, right? I, I, I got it. But And then Bobby, because <laughs> he's a witness, but he wanted to dress up. He'd gotten a fucking uh, brand new white shirt, but it was still in the package. So we actually opened it up in the car on the way over there. He put it on and it's like wrinkled because it's all it's literally he's just taking the collar thing and everything so it looks like it it was carried in his wallet and none of the three of us because i hadn't become a manager yet none of the three of us knew how to tie a tie we had to stop at a gas station <laughs> have the fucking gas station guy tie the fucking i think dream didn't have a shirt that he could fucking wear a tie with i don't anyway um and that, and that, so we and it, he got off. It was it was uh, self defense on the part of the dream machine, and and thankfully they didn't ask Bobby a lot of questions. I was gonna say, what was Bobby like on the stand? Well, it was just, he looked out and saw, yeah, the guy tackled him. You know, <laughs> got tackled him. Uh, he was just trying to get away. That was it. Wasn't <laughs> like he was. You know, the attorneys tell fucking when you're given testimony, don't give too many details. They didn't have to worry with Bobby. He stuck straight to the meat of the matter. He just tried to get away. I was going to ask you before, and, you know, I would love to hear what you want to say about Bobby's early days, how he got into the business, because, you know, one of the great mysteries is how did he end up so good? <laughs> it's really hard to explain, but just the other day after the news you know, Bobby was one of my favorites, and I put up some pictures on the Wrestling News Twitter account, and there were photos you took of Bobby when yep. you were a photographer, and I was looking at those and comparing them. He's 15 them. feet in the air. That's what I was going to say. I was comparing those to other photos of other wrestlers from the same time period of Memphis that you took. You don't have action shots like that of too many other guys. He's 15 feet in the air doing everything on those shitty Memphis rings that the mats never got cleaned, the boards never got changed, the padding was indoor-outdoor carpeting. And he's fucking, if he took a slam off the top, he landed two-thirds of the way across the ring. If he was dropping the knee off the top, he was three feet above the top turnbuckle. If he was getting backdropped over the top rope, you couldn't see him grabbing anything. He was just going. It was, it was just, you know, it, he was a step. And he, in those days, and, and especially we'll talk about this in a minute, the early Mid-South stuff too, but he was like 210 pounds. He's six feet one or whatever, but he was lean. And then that's the thing, he, no physique. When he gained weight, he got chubby. When he was, when he was 18 years old, main event for Nick Goulas, he was chubby. And when he got in shape, he had no discernible muscle tone at all, but he was hard as a rock and he was lean like a greyhound. And he could, and then when he tried to gain weight again to get, you know, with the, working with the road warriors and guys like that, he would just get a bit chubby. But, it, it, you know, that was, it's not like he, he didn't work out in the gym regularly, but my guy, it's not like he wasn't doing more cardio than anybody else in the business every night. And he did go to the gym on occasion and he did a lot of squats. He was just always in shape except when he tried to gain weight to look bigger than, you know, some of the other guys. And then he, you know, it just slowed him down. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What were you going to say? No, well, like I said, I'd want to certainly hear what you have to say about Bobby breaking into the business in his early days. But in terms of you and Bobby, what was it like for you to shoot him at ringside? And also when did you actually get to know him? Because, he was obviously a regular for Nick Goulas after the split. When did you first meet Bobby? Well, that's the thing. <laughs> I, I Again, Dennis Condry comes into this just because it's a funny story. <clears throat> because I met Dennis five and a half years, almost six years before I met Bobby. Because Bobby had never worked for Jarrett until Nick went out of business. But Dennis Condry came in in 1975 to or late 74 to the Tennessee territory as a baby face for, his, for the very first time he was there. And he was one of the first wrestlers that when I started taking my Kodak Instamatic 
and started hanging out by where they came out to, you know, look for girls or whatever. I took, I, he was one of the first guys I took a posed picture of and actually like, Hey, can I take a picture of you? Sure. Go ahead. Right. Boom. At the very almost same time, probably as a matter of fact, yeah, pretty much at that same time, a kid in Huntsville that's helping set the ring up so he can get into the matches for free. Dennis would see him at the other end of the territory. I was 13. The ring boy is 16. If you'd have walked up to Dennis and said, Hey, that fucking 13 year old goofy kid that just took your picture with the Kodak <laughs> Instamatic and the 16 year old chubby kid putting a ring up in Huntsville last night in nine years, you guys are going to main event to Superdome. What the fuck do you think he would have said? He would have said, I can't believe it. Me, Jim Cornette, and Orville Hutto? I don't believe it. <laughs> but but that's, that's the thing. So I never met Bobby. Uh, I had seen him. And obviously, um, Nick's TV, briefly, he got TV on here in 1978 and tried to come in and run opposition. And I saw Bobby on the TV there. And actually, uh, I went to Nick's first show. I knew I couldn't go to all of them or they'd get hot at me over, uh, you know, the, uh, the other side of the fence. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, my photography job and et cetera. And also I knew that Nick was not going to win this war, but I wanted to see the Sheik and Fargo right live. So I went to the first show and Bobby was on, I think the second match, uh, preliminary where they, he beat the beast with a cross body or something off the, turnbuckle and it was you know nothing particularly spectacular because and there was like 300 people there but then i got to see him a little bit on nick's tv that that year but more the following year especially when i got my battery operated television i'd take in the car when we were going to spot shows i could pick up wbko 13 out of bowling green you could see nick's tv saturday nights from 10 30 to 11 30 on the way back from the one of those spot shows uh, but really then he got booked in Atlanta and was on Georgia TV for a while after Nick closed in 1980. And then finally Jarrett brought him in and that's where I first met him. And he was the mid America champion cause he'd had that belt for, for Nick. And, um, and I mean, he was, you know, one of Jimmy Hart's first family. And of course, instantly I'm taking pictures of all of Jimmy Hart's guys. Cause Jimmy loved to have pictures taken. And Bobby, he was just the nicest guy in the world, but those matches him, Singles matches with Bill Dundee, uh, Bobby and, and Coco Ware when he was Sweet Brown Sugar as heels. They were the one of the most exciting tag teams in the business. And that's what 1981, I was watching every territory's television show. And there were bigger drawing teams and bigger name teams, but you weren't seeing any tag teams that were doing it. Coco was going crazy then because that was his first big push so he was doing the fucking missile drop kicks off the top rope and the fist drops because he was you know he was Lawler was his hero growing up too in Union City so he's doing the fist drop off the top Coco but he's doing it like Bobby 15 feet in the air and they were just tremendous together um but Bobby had you know he had great matches he had a good match with me and Jimmy Hart People have seen that fucking video where all the fans hit the ring when he's throwing Hart's supposed $5,000 out to the crowd and we got mobbed and started a riot. I got knocked out by a fucking unseen fan when there was 40 of them in the ring. Uh, but Bobby could make us look good. And that was the thing. People would come through the Tennessee Territory names that were guesting in and out of the AWA or Florida or whatever. And people kind of had started hearing, Hey, there's this kid in Memphis. You wouldn't believe how good he is. But it, it, Bobby never, he never, he wasn't an assertive person or a confrontational person. He didn't, he didn't try to get booked. And he, he got discovered by just doing his job. But when Watts came to Memphis, Bobby was just on the card doing what he'd done. But really he worked for Nick all his life because he was from Huntsville and he grew up there. And I, I mean, you know, he's, he got started when he was 16, him and Orville Hutto as the Brown bombers doing jobs on TV, but they got to see what was going on. And Orville didn't make it necessarily, but, um, 
but Bobby became Nick Goulas' son, George's tag team partner, because Bobby was the baby face that could work and could sell, and he could tag George. George would make a comeback, and the heels could bump for him. And and The jet set. As, yeah, the jet set. Because one of them <laughs> could come off the top rope, and the other well, one. Well, see, Nick, <laughs> Nick had heard about, you know, somebody had said to Nick, well, you need younger talent. You need these young people, right? So the – Last pop culture reference that Nick had had referred to from, you know, people referring to young people. Oh, they're the jet set. So he made his young team the jet set. But but when when Nick went under, like I said, you know, Bobby went to Atlanta, I think probably as much. And they didn't use he was on the card and he I think it had the TV title maybe for a week or two or whatever. But it was probably just because somebody had seen him. He needed a place to go. And then, you know, Jarrett realized, well, whatever, but he didn't actively try to go places because he never, until the midnight express started, he never viewed himself as a main event guy. He just liked being a wrestler and was happy to, to be a wrestler and doing it and in the business, but he didn't have the confidence that, you know, that he'd be a, that he'd main event Superdome one of those days. And he had all the talent in the world, but then when, when finally when we got that spot, and then all of a sudden, he got the confidence to go with it, and so it was it was all about us. This is our turn to get over, and you can do your shit, and we appreciate it. Well, then he just fucking blew up, and and you know that's uh well, some of the people that tweeted, um, Ric Flair. Not only did he tweet about Bobby, but also uh, this Ric Flair in 1989 was not only the world champion, he was the booker in WCW. He was in charge of, of matchmaking for fuck's sake. He'd, uh, in 1989, he had worked a program with Ricky Steamboat. He'd worked a program with Terry Funk. He's fixed to go into a program with Sting before Sting got hurt later on. Um, but he's the booker also, and when he wants to defend the world title on television just for ratings and to have a good match and show that WCW is a superior product to the WWF, he picked Bobby Eaton. And and, and not only did he pick Bobby, he didn't want to beat him. And even us, I, I, I'm on the fucking booking team with Rick. I said, what he told me, he said, we'll do a DQ. I said, what? He said, I don't need to beat him. I said, but, but Rick, you know, it, you, it, it's a no, he didn't want to beat Bobby. It, he just, he had never had a chance to have a singles match with Bobby. And of anybody on the roster at the time in what was it, December of 1989, Rick Flair wanted to wrestle Bobby Eaton and didn't want to beat him on TV when he was a world champion. And as I've told the story, then Heard got hot. Well, how did Bobby Eaton get a title match? He dropped in out of a helicopter and he, you couldn't even beat him? So then Flair's all right. And and I pitched him the idea, to be honest with you, because Flair said, I'll work with him again. And he, I'll, this time I'll beat him. I said, I got an idea. Beat all of us up. Make the old fart happy. So we did the rematch. And he not only jerked me in the ring, grabbed, hit me with my own racket, knocked me out, fucking hit Stan, knocked him out, and fucking hit Bobby with a racket, knocked him out, and fucking pinned the one, two, three. And I don't think Heard was still happy about that, but it, but then that's he, that's the extent that Flair resented that anybody would question why he would want to work with Bobby Eaton on. And by the way, it, from the Midnight Express scrapbook, the first. Uh, Flair versus Eaton match we did in Columbus, Ohio on actually November 20th, 1989. And it was the Sunday night main event show, which as you'll recall, Brian was on so TBS on Sunday nights at six o'clock Eastern, 3 p 3 p.m. Sunday afternoon on the West Coast, right? It did a 3.3 rating, a 5.6 share, and was seen in one point one million seven hundred and thirty two thousand homes and in 89 they figured what just under or just over two people per home so say three and a half million people and it was the highest rated sunday tbs show in a year with a cold match with rick flair and bobby eaton that jim Hurd got hot about so he had the rematch 
And we did that in fucking brutally cold, goddamn, miserable Peoria, Illinois on December 14th. And that match I just described, and that did a 3.2 rating, a 5.0 share in 1,667,000 homes, the highest rated Sunday night TBS wrestling program since the previous Ric Flair Bobby Eaton match. And anyway, um, but not only Flair. Uh, somebody actually retweeted a clip of the match that I'd forgotten about. I remembered at the time, I forgot about it since it's been 25 or more years. But remember Randy Savage versus Bobby Eaton on WCW syndication in its dying days of its syndicated show where it was all the stars were getting fucking four minute squashes or whatever over whoever. And that's where they weren't using Bobby at the time. Well, but he gets booked with Randy Savage and Savage works competitive with him and fucking che heals him to fucking beat him. Cause it was Bobby Eaton. He, and I, we've talked about how business Randy Savage was when he came to Knoxville, things he did for me and what he would do something that was right for the business, but he wasn't going to go treat Bobby Eaton like a job guy because it was what 1979 that had been 15 years before that. Nobody in wrestling would hire Randy Savage except for Nick Goulas, and he and Bobby Eaton were doing our broadways in front of no people over the Mid-America title, having some of the best matches in the business, and, you know, 300 people seeing them. In the 80s, when Savage was doing revolutionary stuff in the WWF and Bobby was doing revolutionary stuff in Crockett Promotions... They stole it from each other. That's what I was going to ask. How much of that was stuff they learned against each other working for Goulas? Well... Bobby was mad because he could never do correctly or felt proper about doing it. The thing where you grab the guy's hair that Savage would do, you grab the guy's hair and you run across the ring, jump over the top rope and spring his neck on the yeah. fucking rope. He said, yeah, one time in the car, he said, God damn it, Corny. He said, I could never get that. He said, fucking Savage, I could never get that. But also, think about what was Savage's fucking premier deal, the elbow off the top. It was a great elbow, and, and it was definitely stiffer than Bobby's, but Savage couldn't come off the top like Bobby Eaton could, But they were, except for that double sledge off the top to the floor, which is why that Savage ended up having more knee problems than Bobby did. But they fucking they invented that shit with each other, a lot of it, when they were working those matches, because who else was Savage going to do a lot of that stuff with at that point in time? It's amazing how many of the best guys of the 80s came out of really ghoulous at the end. Right? Terry Gordy, Randy Savage, yeah. Bobby Eaton. Well, you can't you can't really give uh Nick credit for Gordy and Hayes because they stopped in there on the way to uh on the way to Jarrett and then really mid south where they got over. But that's where Bobby met Terry and Michael and they used to ride around together. He told me this one day, I mean, when he went to Georgia, he'd already known him from up there, right? And, and fucking, they're they're driving back from a town in Georgia. Bobby Eaton, Terry Gordy, Michael Hayes, Buddy Roberts, and there's beer cans, literally, especially in the back seat. He said up to people's fucking knees, empty beer cans, and they get pulled over for speeding by the cops, and the fucking cop comes up on the side of the road, and I don't, it might have been Gordy driving, I don't know, but he opened the door, <laughs> and when he opened the fucking driver's door to get out to meet the cop not only did all those beer cans start falling out onto the fucking pavement but the whole interior door panel of his old beat up fucking Cadillac <laughs> red fell out in the fucking street and the cop looked at it, and there's the fabulous Freebirds. they're on goddamn Atlanta TV right and is like fuck you guys just get the fuck out of here it's my county right he didn't even give them a ticket which would happen back in those days Hey, you, you bring um, up Georgia. I actually found one of the first photos that Gene Gordon sent to the Wrestling News of Bobby Eaton when he got to Georgia. And the caption that Gene Gordon wrote is, Bobby Eaton, who is from Nashville, Tennessee, a young Matt Ace, who is rapidly gaining recognition in Georgia rings, photo by Gene Gordon, March 1981. <laughs> well, and uh, he wasn't there too much longer. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? As a matter of fact, that's what it was. Bobby, when Nick folded up, Bobby came over to work for Jarrett for a couple months, went to Georgia for a few months, and then came back to Memphis. 
That's the way it happened and teamed up with Coco. Nevertheless, um, and you know, you, you asked earlier on um, how Bobby got so good, right? And what, because what had happened was, and because, I mean, I asked the same thing, well, I, you know, years ago I asked him, well, how did you get started, and et cetera, but nobody trained him till he started doing jobs on TV. Because, as we said, he back in those days, they had wrestling every week at your local arena, and Huntsville, it was the Huntsville Coliseum, and Coliseum is probably an inappropriate word for this building, right? But it sounds good <laughs> on paper. But kids would hang out at the back door and see if Pat Malone in Memphis would have five or six of them go, go sell programs for me, boy, I'll give you a nickel a piece or whatever. Or somebody need to help Holland setting the ring up with the posts. Hey, I'll let you in free in the bleachers if you carry these ring posts. And then whoever was hauling the ring, this was a classic Buddy Wayne ploy. Whoever was hauling the ring would then sit and point a lot and drink a bottle of pop while these kids he's going to let in free carried the ring post. But anyway, and Bobby and his friend Orville Hutto started getting in the ring and imitating the shit that they'd seen on television. And it got to the point where some of the boys, when they would get, if they got there early enough, because they wouldn't let them do it when the people were in the in the building before they opened the doors, you know, whatever. But some of the boys that would get there would go, what, what the fuck? He's he's, he's kind of good enough to be on fucking television. So they had him start doing jobs, the Brown Bombers. There are pictures of him and Orville as the Brown Bombers. <clears throat> and then, um, obviously, being around Bobby, everybody, you know, took a liking to him. And, and you know, I'm not saying that Nick immediately wanted to put him in the will and, you know, adopt him alongside George. But they obviously, they let Tojo start working with him because Tojo and I'd, a lot of modern fans or people that weren't there and didn't experience it will look at a picture of Tojo Yamamoto and go, what the fuck? But Tojo was not only the guy that going back to the early 60s that Nick Goulas would have if Japanese wrestlers came over, the Anoki, and and uh, all the way through Onita and Fuchi and et cetera, they put him with Tojo to teach him how to work more of an American style, how to think about the crowds, and also to, you know, it was kind of like the deal. Tojo will take the young guys, but as, uh, not only the Japanese guys, but Tojo worked with Jerry Jarrett, Tommy Rich, he was the first partner of Jerry Jarrett, first partner of Tommy Rich, but he'd been riding with them before that. He did the same thing with Bobby. He started, even though Bobby was a baby face, he started working with him as far as, you know, verbally telling him things. And then they switched Bobby heel for a run. So he could, when Tojo was a manager, so he could actually work, you know, alongside him. Tojo wasn't training guys how to fucking take backdrops. Tojo would train the guys how to think, how to understand the wrestling business, how to play their part. Um, Jerry Jarrett would tell a famous story that he'd ride down the road. He was be he would be driving. Tojo would be in the passenger seat, and he said, "Let me see your ear." And Tojo with that accent, and Tojo would grab and he'd take his fingernails and he would dig his fucking thumbnail as hard as he could into fucking Jerry Jarrett's earlobe. And he said, look in the mirror of your face. Ah, I told you to quit. What the fuck? He said, okay. He said, now, give me your ear. No, 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 give me your ear. And then he would take, and he would work, and he'd take the meat of his finger, and he'd just barely squeeze, and he'd say, you make same face and mirror as I do before, that working. And over a period of time, and plus sometimes Tojo would take some of the young guys in the ring and beat the shit out of them too uh, to see whether they, you know, had it in them. But he was always the guy that polished Nick's projects. And Bobby loved Tojo for that. But that was the, that's why he learned, he, he was a natural. You couldn't, he just saw it and got it and understood how to do it performing the moves but from the time he was a teenager not only was he a fan he watched what went on 
He saw the way the baby faces did the promos and made the fiery comebacks. He saw the way the heels got heat. He said, Kurt and Carl Von Braun are scared the shit out of him. He thought they were going to kick shit out of him when he was 13. Um, but he got instructed early on in how to think about the wrestling business and how to have matches. And he's in there working with the best guys, veterans, you know, who knew how to call matches and put matches together where it kept everybody uh, strong unless they didn't want to, unless they wanted to bury somebody. And then he learned how to bury people on purpose. Not that he would do it, but he learned how to nip up out from under it. Uh, but that's that kind of, you know, that was the education. And that's why so many, so many of the, the guys that worked with him in the ring just respected him so much because not only did he, did he do things that in no way were going to injure them, but he did things that made them look better, even if he was going over them. And that wasn't the case, you know, with a lot of guys. Um, and you know, that's when I talk about the education that some of the modern guys miss and I'm not even being ornery now. I'm just, that's the kind of education that a lot of the guys miss and you can't get, and it's been misinterpreted or et cetera. But, but I'm not going to be ornery today. And as a matter of fact, I want to say this also, um, a lot of people tweeted, including the folks at AEW tweeted a nice graphic and a respectful message about Bobby. And I know that some of the AEW personnel in various positions listen to the show and I'm not, that's not a snide comment either. Um, because I'm wondering if, if, if anybody with the uh, access to Tony Khan can get to him, tell him that I've heard everything that he said about Bobby and how respectful it was and how nice it was. And I thank you, Tony. Uh, Tony Khan is not a horrible human being. We may see way far apart on wrestling and a variety of issues, but that was a cool thing to do, Tony. So I hope somebody will deliver that message to him. Um, but anyway, so then Bobby gets into business, as I said, and you know, that's why he was figured in for Nick all that time, because not only could Nick, I mean, he was such a dependable guy and you wanted to use him and what a talent he was, but also at the same time, he's home. He's, he doesn't want to leave. He's not trying to leave. He's not trying to hold anybody up. You know, Bobby just wanted to be a wrestler. And that, uh, until the, until we got the spot in the midnight express, I don't, he never realized how, valuable he was or how good he was or that he was a top guy uh he wouldn't put himself you know me bobby eaton i'm on the same plane as the road warriors or this or that but but he started to get an idea of how to carry himself and gave him even more confidence when we got the spot with the midnight express well speaking of that spot with the midnight express i am curious about another thing you were relatively new to the performance side of the business. You got involved in 82. You guys go to Mid-South at the end of 83. Dennis had been a veteran. He'd been around for years all over the South. Every, Really, every promotion in the South, Dennis had worked for. Bobby, similar thing. I can't think of where either guy would have worked, and you'll correct me where I'm wrong, where they had killer road trips. What was the adjustment to Mid-South like for the three of you? Well, um... Well, first of all, Dennis had not worked all over the South. Think about this. And this is another reason why, and it's a shame that Dennis is so underappreciated today. And also he left right before the pay-per-view era where those big main event matches and quality video would be replayed over and over. Dennis was another guy. He was a different case than Bobby in that he was – he was so good. He was fixed in the Tennessee territories and he had worked Georgia, but he, he didn't get a spot to go to Florida. He didn't get a spot to go to the Carolinas. Actually, I've told a story. Joe Turner was his brother-in-law and he'd really broken in in the Carolinas as a, as a referee just for a, a bit, but he never got to, he always wanted to Dennis Condry always wanted to work the Carolinas because he had seen the territory and how, 
big and profitable it was and everything. But when Dennis had gotten a spot in later on in 75 as partners with Phil Hickerson in for Nick, then he really spent most of the rest of the next three years. He and, and Phil would go to work for Ron Fuller in Knoxville and Ron Wright would manage him. And then they'd come back to work for Nick and then they, when Jarrett split off, they'd come to work for Jarrett. And one time, Rock Hunter was their manager for very briefly. Did not work out. But they could both talk on their own. Um, and they bounced around the ten of the three Tennessee territories until Phil got hurt, had to quit the business for a while. And then Dennis still, that's when he got with uh, Randy Rose and... Norvell Austin in 81 and 82, and they did the Midnight Express only in Continental and in, in Memphis. And that's, you know, Dennis had never been a top, top spot in a money drawing territory, except, you know, Memphis did good, but they were never figured in really he and Phil as far as major payoffs. So he had all the experience in the world. And, and and what an impeccable worker. And I'll tell you, I've gone back and looked some stuff in the past couple of days in both of them. But they just hadn't had the the exposure in a major territory. It said, I'm going to put you guys as I'm going to use you guys as main event attractions and I'm going to give you a push. Um, And until we all went to work for Watts. And so the question you asked, what kind of transition was it? The, the trips were the I mean, the trips were a big deal, but the trips were the least of it. But what I did, uh, honestly, I got the news overnight, Wednesday night, and Thursday, besides being on the phone with Dennis Condry and Stan Lane and, and Bobby's friend Brian Thompson and Matt Sigmund who, uh, of the Heat Seekers who organized the Don't Tell Bobby show that we did about a year and a half ago in Knoxville where we – K faved him and just advertised it on the internet because he wouldn't see it there. Um, I talked to those guys and, and by the way, and, and Matt Sigmund was behind the go. There was a GoFundMe that was put up, uh, for about, I don't even know if it was up for 24 hours and that was by Matt Sigmund and it's for Bobby's funeral expenses and any medical and money, rest of the money would be going to the kids, whatever. But, they took it down after only a day because I think they were wanting 10 grand and they got over 20 that quick. And they took it down because at first the kids had, had not wanted any, you know, type of fundraiser or thing or whatever. And, and Dundee's going to be pitching in. But then when they were, Matt said, no, we want to do it and everybody wants to do it. But then they took it down point being after they'd raised over, over twice as much as they were looking for, because they didn't want it to look like they were just trying to raise money. And, uh, you know, and, and honestly, I bet they would have got a hundred thousand dollars and it's, you know, it's not like it was a shady deal. So I wish they'd have left it up, but that just goes to show you, they didn't, they didn't want anybody to have a ill memory of anything Bobby was associated with. Anyway, where was I going with all of this? What was I saying? Oh, so we went to Louisiana. And that was the thing. <sighs> After I talked to those people the other day, a fan here several years ago had gotten me a 30-something disc Midnight Express compilation. And it's in fairly chronological order, start to finish. And and I mentioned on the drive through that we did this earlier this week, Stacy's in California because her mother's had heart surgery and she's doing better and fine and appreciates everybody talking about that. And then I hurt my back, although on further reflection, it is my hip that I've had issues with before in a major way. And, and so since I, it was a struggle to walk from room to room and I couldn't get in any position besides flat that wasn't painful, I said, I'm going to watch these. DVDs and curl up on the bed with Harley Quinn. And that's where I realized, because when you look at something, even that yeah, we, I was there, I was in the middle of it, but it's 38 years later, seven years later, whatever. And you look at things with fresh eyes and you understand things better. And I realize now that 
for one thing, I sucked when I got to Mid-South. For me. And I don't mean this to sound egotistical, but yes, everybody's like, oh, that kid, he can talk his ass off. No, it wasn't. I am shooting holes in a lot of my promos in Mid-South. And But... It, 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 if I could have if, if I could have gone to Mid South like I was when I went to Dallas a year later after having that course in wrestling from Bobby and Dennis and Bill Watts and Bill Dundee, I believe they probably would have killed me because I started kind of figuring out how to fucking actually do this right for me. But anyway, all of us and Bobby in particular realize that this was a big opportunity because it, I mean me I've only been to business 16 months so I'm like somebody else besides who I was just working for wants me that's a big opportunity uh, but Dennis knew especially that he'd been around that long and no promoter of that level had ever come and said I'm going to build around you we're going to give you a push you are going to be a main event fucking talent we're going to protect you <clears throat> so as I said Dennis's work was always impeccable it was never flashy and it wasn't big things it was always being in the right place never being lost never making a mistake uh, the timing the uh, etc and the psychology and he was the one that was telling both of us how to think but going back and watching Bobby it was incredible because I'd seen him have all these matches in Memphis and I knew what he could do, but I'd never seen him do all of it that much that well in front of that many people. He was just on every night and watching the crowd react to, or the crowds on these videos, like I've, one of our first matches and probably the first time he dropped a knee off the top rope in Houston at Sam Houston Coliseum was against Magnum TA and wrestling too in that program. And the people are already, you know, hot into it and they're reacting and it's Houston. It's a hot crowd anyway. But Brian, you know, the, you know, the, the pop that they get now these days, when you show a video where somebody fucks up and misses a dive or fall, it's, it's that person is obviously fucked up. That sound, not a boo or a yay, or a wow, but a oh, like, oh, shit. You know what I'm talking about. Of course. That was the kind of reaction that Bobby was getting. And this is in Houston, Texas. They've seen all the best talent. They've had weekly or bi-weekly matches for 50 years at that point in the Sam Houston Coliseum. Bobby's knee drop off the top rope or some of the other shit, the bumps that he would take, were getting on purpose and done correctly, we're getting the pop like, oh, he just fucked that guy up. Those people had still never seen anything like that. And, I mean, you know, <clears throat> with wrestling too, it, it was it was like Bobby and Dennis were both in, until we got with the rock and roll, were both in with guys that they had either ever, never worked with or barely ever worked with before, right? Uh, Dennis had had passing you know, contact with wrestling too in Georgia or whatever, but, um, but it, it, the midnight were having their matches and they were calling the matches because it was, I, it was the midnight's job to get over. But at the same time, they were going in with guys like Magnum, who was so green. I'm watching now. And, and some of the things I haven't seen for 30 years, I'm seeing, Magnum being totally lost and just actually turn around at one point out of frustration. You just walk out of the ring and get back on the apron. He just got just everybody else is where they're supposed to be. And he just got lost as <laughs> oh fuck it. I'm just leaving, but he'd only been in business a year and a half, right? He's in the main events. People loved him, but he's green, but they're calling these matches for these guys. They've never worked with and never been with it, it, to do all of their, all of those guys stuff to them and taking bumps for it and getting those guys over. And in the process, Dennis explained it. We get over by getting the match over. And then, good Lord, there's a goddamn 
giant motorcycle rally with police escorts going down the street outside the castle here. Um, Dennis's philosophy was we go out and we get over by getting the match over and then getting the heat at the end, whether it's because we fucked them on the finish or if we put them over, we get heat after, or the obviously I go out on TV and get the heat back verbally. And another thing, well, we can, we can do the fucking happy horse shit where the baby faces are kicking the shit out of us at the start and everybody's happy because we make them laugh and then we make them mad because we made them quit laughing when we take over and we're kicking the shit out of their, their fucking guys. So Bobby's in there with two and two's in his early fifties. So it's not like he's going to keep up a running race with fucking Bobby Eaton, but Bobby wants to get all of, you know, he wants to get over and he knows that two's knee lift is over. So this was great. Bobby was like a greyhound running the ropes and he would just call a simple spot with two where two could just stay in the middle of the ring and Bobby do all the fucking work. And two was a pro. He'd been a veteran for 30 years, Johnny Walker. He knew how to give you a hip toss. He knew how to give you an arm drag. He knew how to fucking give you a knee lift. He knew how to, you call a spot to him. He can remember it. So in one of these Houston matches, they lock up and two gets the fucking head or Bobby gets the headlock. And two shoots him off, and it's one tackle, drop down, arm drag, arm drag, hip toss, knee lift. Just that simple, where two can just stay in the middle of the ring, and Bobby's the one crossing the fucking ring and doing all the work. But it's at 100 miles an hour. It's flawless. And then not only does when – two, when two gives him the knee lift, Bobby has taken the arm drag, arm drag, hip toss. He's come up, bent over, selling his face and his back where he's been tossed around in perfect position as two hits him with the knee lift. He turns and flies over the fucking top rope, barely touching anything. It lands on the goddamn floor outside and the place blows because he would figure out a way to take a bump and land in a place that you would never expect. So it, it surprised people as well as popping them at the same time. So he could have taken a bump from the fucking knee lift and the place would have popped, but he takes a bump and flies over the top rope when it doesn't look humanly possible that somebody could have done that from that direction. And the place goes batshit. And you ought to see the poor, I think Alice Marie Nelson was the photographer in Houston. I'm watching these matches and I'm thinking, you know, we've talked about Mid-South was, was, had been down because the guys were a little bigger and a little slower, Right. And they weren't having matches like this, and they weren't doing these Tennessee spots. And the photographers and the ring seconds, they're all running because they can't figure out which direction one member of the Midnight Express is going to take a bump on top of them next. Because it's it's completely different style of spots and style of tag team matches than they'd been seeing, and, and everybody was, you know, flipped out by it. But anyway, that's where, you know, you go back and look at, and some of this stuff's on YouTube for, for folks. And I, I don't know what's on the network or the peacock or whatever, but watch Bobby Eaton in 1984 mid South and, and watch Dennis Condry too, while you're at it. Um, there's nobody doing anything like either one of them today. And that's not knocking the modern wrestling. That's when you watch this with a critical eye, you can see nobody takes bumps this and they're calling it all in the ring. There's nothing pre-planned except the finish, and that's probably been handed to us verbally by a referee or a go-between. So you can tell when things don't quite work out because the guy that they're doing it with has heard it just now for the first time, but they cover it. You can't tell. They were just so smooth. And that's uh, – I was talking to Dennis Condry, obviously, Thursday morning, and, you know, he was, I'll be, <laughs> this is something funny. He said, he said, Cordy, I've gone from a semi badass to an old maid because we were both crying ridiculously to the point where we had to hang up at one point because we were embarrassed for each other. Um, but I've never, I've seen Dennis of, of the recent years, the kinder, gentler Dennis Condry tear up a little bit at a banquet speech or whatever or is or something, but I've never heard Dennis uh, or seen Dennis cry actually out loud before, but I've only known him 45 years. So there's a first time for everything, but 
he was he he was we were all thanking each other for what we'd done for each other etc but i told him i said that was the thing when we all got there bobby and and to our first obviously first break bobby and dennis had the talent and the experience and dennis could cut a promo and i always was entertained by his promos even more so in person but it, it the only thing they couldn't do was talk and the only thing that I could do was talk. Because we mentioned I've never had any, the first time I ever took any bump in a wrestling ring, the first 10 years of my career, the first time I ever took that bump was in front of people. Because there was no practice. And you, if you couldn't figure out how you were going to do something, you asked somebody in the locker room, then they'd tell you verbally, do this. Yeah, Memphis wasn't known for training their managers <laughs> how to take bumps. Well, n nobody was. You didn't have goddamn nobody. I've said this before. We didn't get there early enough to practice. You were in. If you were in a business, well, okay. But anyway, um, but also as far as Watts was so strict, he wanted wrestling in his matches more so than in the Tennessee territory or some other territories, but Bobby and Dennis could adapt to that, but I'm seeing them kind of work a different style. And then I start to understand the difference in the styles of the different territories and how you would adapt. Cause then when we went to Dallas, it was a different thing entirely because they had, they didn't care about so much wrestling, wrestling in the matches as Watts did. Uh, it was, it, it was more, high spots and or just solid work but the rings were harder and you had to adapt <laughs> and even bobby had to adapt because those rings were fucking ridiculously stiff they were padded to the hilt and had no give so that's the exact opposite of a good bumping ring but that's the point i'm making is that that bobby and dennis were able to either just in the car or after we'd get a finish explain to me just little bits of timing or little things or we just talk about what other people i'd hear them talk about what other people were doing wrong and and plus i got more confident also from being there and doing it and say okay this is working uh, they're not going to send us home so i was able as i said in a year there a lot of learning a lot of things from watts and being able to do the promos transform from night and day i'm more jim cornett when i get to dallas of the people that would know what jim cornett was and really the midnight express was more as well because they'd had that we'd ha all had that year to to not only figure each other out but them to help bring me along cuz i knew how to talk and almost nothing else about serious in ring psychology or how to put the matches together or what the fuck's stupid to do or not to do. And that was, you know, where being in a car with Bobby and Dennis was, was him. And Dennis would sit there and plainly lay something out. Whereas it was with Bobby, it was just like, he'd have observations or he'd just say things or make a joke or something. And you'd kind of pick it up. You know, one of the great things about Mid-South in 84 was the introduction of Power Pro Wrestling, which meant house show matches got on TV. And there's a few that always stay with me, maybe because parts of those matches were used in the opening of the show eventually, but it's two Bobby bumps. One is simple, just him selling a punch and the way he would grab his jaw and kind of go on to one foot for a second. It was yeah. perfect. And the other was... I don't remember if it had the orange canvas or not, but it was a Jim Duggan clothesline to Bobby. The spear. The spear. One of the, Wasn't it? Or it was was a, no, it was the clothesline and he went over backwards. He went over backwards. And we've seen yeah. like acrobatic wrestlers do that where it looks flashy, but it looked there. It's so impressive. He knocked him over backwards. It looks like Jim Duggan's power knocked him over backwards. It looks so you know, incredible. You, you know why? Because he did. Because Jim Duggan's power knocked him over backward. No, it, I've got, uh, I've just watched five matches with Bobby take the bump the exact same way. Because what he would do is when Duggan, and actually I think somebody, who else, somebody else clothesline took the same bump. But when the guy would come with the clothesline with the right arm, Bobby would not only kick his feet out, but he would fucking have his left arm in front of the guy clotheslining him 
Can you see there? Wait a minute. Left. I'm trying. Well, he'd have his arm in front of the guy clothesline and he would hook the guy as the guy ran past him. He'd give himself a little spin and it would knock him literally fucking upside down. And sometimes he landed on the side of his fucking head because it was literally knocking him upside, you know, upside down and ass over tea kettle. But yeah, it was fucking. It, oh, yeah, that's with the, just the selling of the face. Yeah. If, if if normally a guy might give somebody a shoulder tackle and the guy take a flat back bump, but if you gave Bobby a shoulder tackle or you punched him in the face or whatever the fuck it may be, he made you boom. He'd, he'd and he had the slap before anybody did, and you couldn't. It took me a while to figure out Bobby's slap, right? So it wasn't like the fucking leg slap class these days, but. He would, if you hit him with the tackle, boom, he'd fucking grab his face. He would spit up in the air. He'd sell his fucking face. His feet would go bing, 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 like he's off balance. And then he would go fucking down to a knee and then bounce to his face. He would take a different kind of bump every time. And it looked like he'd got the shit knocked out of him. When I would, you know, he'd be holding the baby face and I'd swing the racket and the baby face moves and whack, whack him. And all I, I knew the sweet spot to exactly where to swing because when that baby face moved Bobby like a magician was going to turn his head a certain way and put his hand up and I would smack the fucking hand and uh and then when he got to trust me then he would stop putting the fucking hand up and I would just you know I would know the spot and I don't remember ever potatoing him but the spit would fly and it would look like I'd fucking killed him um Whose idea was the crawling and the hugging and the kissing? Dennis Condry and Phil Higgerson used to do that. But, th- I mean, it's not like they invented it. Right. That's right. classic Southern heel wrestling, right? Goddamn, um, Dennis is the more stern one. And obviously Stan figured into all of this later on with a different type of personality. But just ta- starting how we originated the flavor of the thing. Dennis has that stern personality and that stern face. And he's the one that, whereas Bobby, you know, was just the maniac, right? So Bobby get boom, boom, boom. He take three or four bumps and he get up on his knees and run on his knees. Wee, 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 all the way over and, and hug Dennis. And he's on his knees in front of Dennis. And of course the predominantly Southern working class, potentially homophobic audiences would have a field day with this. And then Dennis would, goddamn look at the baby face with a pissed off look and he'd reach down and he'd hold his hand out and bobby'd tag it and he'd get in like i'll do something about this and then one it was early on in in louisiana at one of the towns bobby and dennis would give each other a high five before they would at the start of the match right and one in and one out and they'd start the match well, so then one time we started doing it. We're okay. Bobby and Dennis high five each other. I high five Dennis. I high five Bobby. And I've got the racket in my hand. So one of the fives is the racket. And I ju- and then at a spot show, at some point, I just, you know what? As me and Bobby go to high five, I stop and I go, come here. And I give him a big hug, right? And he gives me a big hug. And the place goes ballistic. For, okay, this is a lot easier than taking bumps for this reaction. So immediately I turn around like, what? What's the matter? What are you talking trying to wish him well and play <laughs> innocent, right? What? And they're throwing shit. And so th- it, it, I don't know if it was that night. We started doing that for a while. And then one night I added the kiss on the cheek. We go to high five, stop, hug instead. The people are fucking screaming. I'm like, what? what? What's the matter? What's the matter? I'm like, okay, Bobby, go in there and break him in half. And I've cup his chin like christine jarrett used to with the grip but not hard (laughs) and turn his head and kiss him on the cheek and my god i've heard finishes that didn't get that much of response and everybody today is gonna be saying oh my god that's horrible i'm just telling you what the fucking people did and what we did in those days was run across shit that people reacted to that we're just doing and do more of it so that became and that even that outlet after Dennis, when Stan became a part of the team, we still did that same pre-match thing. Bobby and Dennis, or Bobby and Stan, high five. Me and Stan, high five. Me and Bobby, oh, whoops, hug, kiss on the cheek. Go get him, Tiger. What was a tougher move for Bobby? The move from the Tennessee Territory to Mid South, or the move from Huntsville to the Dark Side? 
<laughs> well, well, see, it didn't pay as well of uh, the move from Huntsville <laughs> to the dark side, but the move to, <clears throat> um, but anyway, that's, uh, and, and also you talked about getting a chance to ride with Bobby and, and just be around it. The, the car trips there were insane and we've told stories. I'm not going to beat everybody up on the horrible trips in mid South, but I've told stories about we would be broke down on the side of the road or with the night we rode to the back of the Baton Rouge Centroplex in a fucking chicken truck with feathers fucking coming off of us. I've told those stories. Um, but just riding with Bobby was better than, and, and once again, I was lucky because if, if they had all things been equal, Watts had said, Hey, this Jim Cornette, I want to use him as a top manager and just brought me to his territory and stuck me with two guys I didn't know and that didn't also have a vested interest in this working, then I would have you know, been, been back in Memphis or back here at home probably in six months. Because, I, like I said, I, not only did I not know anything, but also if you couldn't have coexisted with people that you needed to work with and ride with in those days in that territory, you were fucked. And... A lot of the other guys in those days had had habits that uh, that I would not have been able to coexist with. So it, it was lucky, and and just being able to you know eight hundred miles in a car with Bobby Eaton, there's been worse things to happen. And it, it just we could talk about wrestling from when we were both kids, because he'd been you know a fan since he was a kid. Or we knew this, you know, if you made a joke about somebody looks like so-and-so, we didn't even, either one have to Google that, right? But also Bobby would do the, and we've talked about Stan's ribs. Dennis wasn't a big river. Dennis liked to laugh. Dennis make jokes. Dennis loved to, you know, knock people. We cut promos on everybody in the world in the car, but he wasn't a river. Stan was the guy that would come up with these well thought out, you know, pre-planned and built up ribs, but Bobby just went with the simple stuff. If you had the fucking large gulp from Wendy's and you hadn't finished it yet, and you get out of the car to go in the gas station, take a piss. When you come back, you will find that he's taken the cap and the straw out and tied a knot in the bottom of the straw and put the cap back on. So when you try to take a drink, the top of your head caves in. He always had the gimmicks from the stores, the fake vomit, and the the fucking uh, oh goddamn what was that um shit the uh, the not the uh, water squirting flower but oh he got a water squirting cigarette and people knew he didn't smoke right so he's got it in the locker room and everybody would come up and say Bobby you smoke he went, well <laughs> and he would squirt him with the water squirting cigarette um uh, but it was just you know it was fun. It was fun and it kept you from going insane. And then Bobby was just funny to be around. I got, I got to, I got to read you this. We've told you the story about Bobby's weak stomach, right? Of course. You've heard some of these. Yeah. Well, somebody tweeted this and this is from Arn Anderson. And I, it it's actually, I think it was in a, it's in a magazine, probably the WCW magazines. I don't know how long ago this was, but it's a, it was a tweet out of a column of, of that magazine. Anyway, Bobby Eaton and I used to play this game called Burp and Blow, which I'm sure every egghead in the business has done. You burp and then blow on your buddy. You know what I'm talking about. And then let the, yeah. One Sunday, we were on Interstate 70 in Missouri. It was pouring rain. I was driving and Bobby was sitting in the passenger seat. He leaned over to burp and blow. Bobby, being a drinking man, didn't anticipate that when he burped, he would throw up. But sure enough, he did all over my chest now I realize i'm doing 70 miles per hour in a monsoon and when the funk hit me in the nose i started puking and when i started puking bobby started puking again i jerked the car off the road and got out i jerked my shirt over my head to take it off which made me even sicker then i jerked my pants off i'm on a major u.s highway buck naked puking all over the, the road bobby was in the same situation out the passenger door and to top it off, ring announcer Tony Gillum was in the back seat, <laughs> and he was laughing so hard he pissed in his pants. <laughs> this is not a unique occurrence, but Bobby usually wasn't uh, wasn't the first one to instigate the the burp and blow or whatever. Um, but there was I've I think I've told this story before, but it's been a long time. 
me, Bobby, Stan, and Bubba Rogers are in Memphis one time. And Dundee is there also, and we're we're at the hot we're staying at the, like the Holiday Inn at the airport. So Dundee's got a rental car. He's going to follow us back to the hotel in our car, or not follow us in our car back to the hotel. So there's two cars. Dundee's following us is what I'm trying to say. Well, as I recall, it was either cold weather or whatever. But me and Bubba were both sick with colds, and I'm driving, and Bobby's in the front seat, and Stan and Bubba are in the back seat. And I start coughing and get choked with phlegm, right? And you hear, you know, when you hear the phlegm noise, because Bobby had such a weak stomach, you could actually show him a booger and he would just start throwing up. Just show it on the end of your finger. Hey, Bobby, here's a booger. So I start coughing and I'm phlegmy. And it's causing Bobby to start doing that like that. And it, corn. When Bubba sees that Bobby is getting sick because he hears my phlegm, Bubba starts laughing, which causes because he's sick, starts him to get phlegmy and he starts coughing. Now me and and now I'm laughing, which is making me cough more. Bubba and I are both phlegm coughing <laughs> and laughing at the same time, and Bobby's getting sicker. Now Stan is starting to fucking laugh and he doesn't even really need to puke he's just laughing so hard he can't fucking control himself and he's afraid he might shit himself <laughs> and so <laughs> bobby's quarter pull over I, I pull over on the side of the road off the interstate dundee pulls in behind us and you see all four doors of our car at the same time opens up and everybody jumps out <laughs> and starts throwing up on the ground <laughs> Yeah, I guess you had to be there. You know, um, there's a reputation Bobby has. You hear guys from WCW. Wait a minute, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one more. Hold on, I'll tell you one more. Yeah. We're in Louisiana with Dennis, and the, the, the trip back from Little Rock, Arkansas, to Alexandria, Louisiana, was the worst one in the territory, really, because you left, and I think we were usually there on, on Sunday nights, but you left the Barton Coliseum in Little Rock at 10 o'clock, at night and you had 275 miles of two lane state highway to drive. So you, it's going to take you five and a half hours. At least you're not going to get back home till three 34 in the morning. And in those days from the Coliseum to get on the highway to go South, there was no fast food places open. This was no 24 hour drive through. So long story short, we would stop at a gas station on the Arkansas, Louisiana state line that had a counter with barbecue, smoked sausage, barbecue sauce, chicken, fried chicken breasts, uh, goddamn tater wedges, the whole nine yards, and stock up for dinner. And they also had a liquor store. And one night, since Bobby was driving, I'm in the back seat. Dennis decides he's going to get a bottle of fucking whiskey. Well, by the time he finishes alternating between the bottle of whiskey and the fucking barbecue we got, he's... (laughs) Barney, he, you're gassed. So Dennis <laughs> finishes with his box of barbecue and this sauce that we it gave us a big jug of this sauce. And he tried to throw it out the window <laughs> and the wind caught it and blew it back in the back seat all over me and all over Bobby's white interior of his car. <laughs> right? And it looked like I'd been machine gunned. My brains had been blown out. And of course, it, we're still fucking, it's two o'clock in the morning. We're still however far from home. Bobby, the next day, by the time that he had let the the heat set set in on it, had to get in there and clean all that barbecue sauce. He said he made him puke cleaning up the hot barbecue sauce. And another time, we had the Colonel Sanders gravy. And we finished with dumping the d- dunking the the old Colonel Sanders nuggets in the gravy. I tried to throw my gravy out so we wouldn't spill it in the car, and the wind blew it back in on the steering wheel. And Bobby had just had Taryn, his second baby. And Stan is Stan is I'm sitting there with the shit in front of me, right, and <laughs> all over the steering wheel. And Bobby's looking at it, and Stan from the back seat says, "Bobby, that looks like baby shit." He started puking at the KFC gravy because it had been likened to baby shit. Anyway, go ahead. What were you going to say? What I was going to say is he had a reputation. You would hear from guys in WCW. He always had a bag with everything you could ever need. (laughs) Was that the case early on? When did that start that he always had so much stuff with him to the point where if anyone in the locker room needed a towel, a piece of gum, whatever it was, he was always ready. 
Well, he always had big bags and he was always prepared. Um, it, 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 as we started going on the road and being gone more, cause like in the Memphis territory, I, and, and another one was Jimmy Hart. Jimmy Hart would come into the towns and this is when you weren't even staying in a hotel. You're just driving from home and then going back. Jimmy would come in with two bags, three hats on top of his head, holding two canes. Bobby would have a couple of large size duffel bags anyway. But when we started going on the road and being gone, you know, more, more days in a row, it just got ridiculous where he was carrying body bags around and he would pick up, if you know, extra hotel towels and and or washcloths but he'd always have a sewing kit because he might need to to you know mend his tights and well he'd have extra thread in case somebody else needed something well then we're doing so much fucking eating on the road and and drive throughs and everything he's got some cutlery he's got and, and maybe a salt and pepper shaker we got from wendy's he's got the salt and pepper he's got some cutlery he's got some napkins with well, it just it started growing to the point with socks. Everybody always needs some socks. Here you need some icy hot. You know, it, he was a convenience store, and it just it just started that way. And by, by the time that it was you know it was over with, everybody knew Bobby. What he as the Steiners used to go up and ask him for weird shit just to see how close he could get to it. But that was you know, and he was always happy. And he'd sew your tights for you if he had time before his match. Um, when did he become such good friends with Arn? Well, uh, when we went to, um, to work for Crockett, it ended up, and I don't know whether this was by design, but I mean, at Arn, um, he, he was an easy guy to like also the life of the locker room and, the, you know, great jokes and promos and et cetera. Uh, but it ended up that Arn and Bobby, lived in we lived in pineville louisiana i lived of god i can't even remember what's what the street was at this point but i was down about a half a mile and and to the right two blocks from bobby and arn was down the hill and down the street from bobby's house and they lived there next to each other for years and years so and just being on the road together all the time they just naturally gravitated both of them southern guys and so they, you know, they were close friends for a long time. And that's what, you know, that's what made that uh, aborted angle we had with Tully and Arn even more attractive is we could talk about real shit in it. And, you know, friends have split up and there's jealousy and et cetera. But I, I mean, it, it, I don't know anybody that wasn't friendly to Bobby, except Jim Hurd and George Scott. We're the only two, I believe, that ever in history. But, but you know that was that was the thing is that with Bobby's work, everybody wanted to be in the ring with him, not only because he was a nice guy, but because he made them look so good and it was so easy, and they didn't have to worry about getting hurt, and you could have fun. I've told you about him working with Barry Windham, them having the, the doing the matches on their knees. And that just came up as something at a show one night, just to keep their their minds occupied. Because, well, Barry Windham in 1987 was, if he wasn't the best babyface in ring wrestler in the business, he was close, right? And when we worked with him and Ronnie Garvin, the U.S. Tag Team Title matches, I remember I think it was the first time they did this was in Fayetteville. And it just happened that Bobby was taking one of those off balance tackles or things. And he went back and hit the second rope instead of the top rope. His, uh, his, his right arm was over the second rope and his ass was really bounced off the mat. And, but he hit the ropes like you're coming back and ended up him and Wyndham were on their knees doing spots and they did it. And the people didn't know that anything was wrong. That was the beauty. It sounds like silly bullshit, but it would be a deal like if Bobby grabbed a headlock on Barry, because Barry was, what, 6'6"? Six, six. So Barry's on his knees. Bobby's got the headlock. Barry slings Bobby off and shoves him into the ropes. Bobby hits the second rope and bounces back, but Barry hadn't had time to get up, so Barry either picked him up and gave him a scoop slam while he was still on his knees or would hip toss him or arm drag him while he was still on his knees. And then Bobby get back up and he'd come for another hip toss or whatever. And it looked like Barry was fighting from underneath 
went and trying to get up while Bobby's taking these bumps, but they're having a match on their fucking knees just to make it a little more difficult and keep themselves occupied because the regular shit was too easy for them. And no, and the fans are popping like it's a normal fucking spots in a normal match. They don't notice the difference because they were able to work it into the fucking thing. Who was Bobby's actual favorite guy to work with or team to work with? Uh, I, he, he probably in his life, I don't think he ever said those words. My favorite so-and-so to work with or to wrestle or whatever is so, cause I mean, it, that would be, that would be knocking somebody else for one thing, but also he loved working with Ricky and Robert, obviously. He loved working with the Fantastic because they were so easy and they were so adaptable and they were so athletic and they, you know, um, there were guys that he were, it wasn't easy to work with Dusty, with Bobby's style and Dusty's style. It wasn't complimentary to have great art, but at the same time, Bobby loved working with Dusty because he knew how to do it. It was easy, you know, and, and it was the main event spot. So, you know, he never had a blow up with anybody like you. Yeah, there was never any Sonny King, Buddy Landell situation or just like somebody, I don't want to be in a ring with them fucking guys. He got, he got testy with the Freebirds that time in Boston, just because Jimmy Garvin. And he wasn't a fan of working with Samu, Samu and Fatu, the Samoan SWAT team, because of the way that we were being used versus the way they were being used and not in a jealous way, but in a, it was no fun because we couldn't lead the match. We couldn't have a good match. We were just getting a shit kicked out of us and the matches were not good because of George Scott and that hierarchy, but he didn't hold it against those, those guys personally. Um, but I mean, you know, Bobby, he obviously liked working with flair Wyndham. He liked one night. He told me, see in Dallas, he said, I like working with Scott Casey. You know, because Scott was old school and liked to lay shit in in safe places and work solid and struggle and shit to some of the things that he didn't get to do when he was getting to do the the high spot matches with Ricky and Robert. Um, but he could do everything, you know, as far as have a match with anybody and do their stuff to to, you know, if if they weren't able to do anything else. When was the first time Bobby was frustrated with Crockett Promotions or if it's after Crockett Promotions was sold. Oh, well, I mean, we were frustrated at, at the checks that we were getting in early 1988 just because business was down, but he wasn't it, like wanting to leave or anything. And, mad and that's Crockett when you renegotiated. Just, that's when we renegotiated. And then he was happy until, until here came, you know, Turner Broadcasting and here came Jim Hurd and here came George Scott. And even then, I don't think he ever had to pass five words with Jim Hurd. And he tried to with George Scott, and George Scott wouldn't speak to him. So he was happy that we were leaving when we were because that first time in early 89 because he thought that, like we all did, that George Scott would be out and we would come back, which is and that's what happened. But then it was just... He was the last one to show frustration, but even he was grumpy all of 1990. You know, whenever the rotating booking committees, just when we thought we had something going with, you know, with Flair, then he's, he quit. And I, and I quit shortly after because he quit the booking committee and then multiple hierarchies and you can't win a match on TV and we could never be featured. But every time we are, you know, we're still tearing the house down. It was frustrating. And of course, before you officially gave up on the booking there, the plan was for Bobby and Stan to join the Horsemen. Yeah, and I mean that we got as far as as I've been reminded when they tweeted the first the first interview that we did to lead in that direction, and Flair had woman Nancy with him also, and et cetera, and we were leading in that direction, and that got cut off. It was just like I, you know, Bobby never complained hardly about anything, but you could just see frustration, and also we'd we'd make jokes about it. You know, like <laughs> the corn, go see how many jobs we're going to do tonight at the TV taping or whatever, you know, but, uh, but he just, he, he loved wrestling and he was always happy to be in the business. And even when things weren't working out, he could have fun with it. He had fun being around the boys. That was, I think that's been the biggest problem of the last, you know, 20 years of his life or whatever is that. 
you know, that's what he did from the time he was a teenager. He went to the towns, he sat with the boys, he had fun, he laughed, he went out, and he was the best in the world at what he did naturally without, you know, I mean, he had verbal training more than he had physical training, but he was just a, a natural and got it and could do it. And that's why, you know, a lot of people said Bobby should have been a, a, a trainer and they did try him in developmental. And I think he had issues with transitioning anywhere, anything that disrupted his schedule. He had, you know, not schedule, but his, his routine, it threw him for a loop when Stan and I left. He told me, you know, years later that he, he didn't, feel right because he had gotten in that groove and he didn't feel right after that even though he liked everybody he was working with it just was different and and with training in develop you could learn a lot from sitting in the locker room with bobby and he by asking him questions or him just saying things or you could learn by watching him but he couldn't he was not a person that was going to get in there and instruct you up one side and down the other because sometimes how does Oh, let me go get Albert Einstein to teach me how to be smart. You kind of got it. It's just it. He did it. Yeah, I always told guys. I said, and a lot more. You can get a lot more out of watching Bobby and seeing what he does than maybe asking him how to do it or why he did it because he doesn't really know. He just does it instinctually. And what the first time he was in OVW training in developmental and this was over 20 years ago I, I asked him i said we had a crash pad i didn't want to hurt you so i said bobby with the crash pad can you show these guys how to do the knee and he said i think i can you know because he was having problems bending one of his knees at that point but he got up there but he he came off but he realized he had never paid attention to how he did the knee to tell somebody, well, when you push off, you know, your left knee, he called it his heavy knee, but your left knee is going to go a little bit to the side and it's going to land, but this is going to go there. But if you tuck the shoulder, all the shit that I figured out in slow motion by watching him do it, he, he just started doing the knee off the top one day and people reacted to it. So he kept doing it. It's not like he ever sat there and thought, how do I do this to be able to explain it to somebody else? So 1990, the end of the year, you and Stan finally have had enough of Heard and Ole Anderson, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. And you guys leave, even though you're still under contract until I think May. Yeah. Bobby stays. We've talked about in the past how at the time the plans were certainly for a Midnight Express reunion come May. But well, Dusty we had, we, came we back. Had, yeah, we had the conference before me and Stan left in the hallway at center stage. Because we told him we said we can't take it anymore. Well, I said I can't take it anymore. I'm fucking done. Because I'd call, I'd ask Stan. I said, Stan, give me your car keys. We had his car. I said, I, why? I need to get my bag. I'm fucking going home. Well, fuck. Hold on. I'll go with you. But then we turn around and look at Bobby, and Bobby's kind of like, uh, because we had six figure contracts, and Bobby had three kids and was married. Stan was not married. I was married. I was didn't have any kids and honestly saved a little bit more money at that point and knew I had something going on and was going to figure the midnight in on it with Smoky Mountain wrestling and the preliminary talks with Ruben and et cetera. But we said, uh, Bobby stay and get your money. They at least they can't beat the midnight express anymore. And it's, it's six months, right? Cause we assumed since herd wasn't going anywhere that we knew of and nothing was going to change that, they just released Bobby in six months. And as you said, that's when Dusty came back in. And then it ended up they didn't release Bobby until 2000, which was fucking 10 years later. Um, but originally, yes, the top heel team in Smoky Mountain Wrestling was going to be the Midnight Express. And then also to – that's where the talk of Japan came in because I, they could have gone to Japan and got – you know, Fantastics kind of the Fantastics were on four or five grand a week with Baba at that point. We'd had a bunch of television. So I thought that it would be feasible for the midnight to work Smoky Mountain and do Japan. And in, until we saw what was going on with this crazy business, because all the territories were folding up. But 
it didn't it didn't work that way and then you know japan never came up for stan and tom because stan wouldn't really at that point as you know uh he was like i i think i'm going to transition and got into boat racing but originally that's what it would have been if all things had had gone as we thought they might and of course in 92 bobby actually had a pretty fun year because he teamed up with arn anderson he was a part of the dangerous alliance which was just a great crew Heyman with medusa Rick Rude, Steve Austin, Larry Zabisco, Arn Anderson, and Bobby. But then like, after 1993, and I know there are fans of the Blue Bloods, and maybe because I liked Bobby so much before that, it was hard for me to accept the Blue Bloods of him and William Regal or Stephen Regal. And I like Stephen yeah. Regal, but it was just, it was a gimmick on Bobby. And and really, they, and, and Regal loved it. Regal came to the show that, uh, in Knoxville to honor Bobby. Um, Regal loved it. Bobby liked it too. Bobby liked it. Regal, but Regal got a huge kick out of Bobby. And that was, you know, that, that's the thing is that they, they tried to find other things to do with him. And because, and he, it was great in the dangerous Alliance and et cetera. But then toward that period of time where Bischoff and, and the idea was to poach all the WC or WWE guys, WWF then, and Hogan comes in and they're changing the style. They're trying to compete with Vince and with kind of the same product. It, 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 it Bobby had meant so much to the previous ad, administrations because he was that link to when the reason why TBS bought the company to begin with, because it was a hugely popular wrestling company. And then they'd proceeded to tank it over the previous few years. And then a bunch of new people came in and the boys still had respect. Well, remember, Goldberg, they were at Huntsville one night, and this Goldberg told the story, and somebody brought it up on the drive-thru not long ago. The Goldberg suggested, why don't we let Bobby Eaton in the streak here in Huntsville? Because everybody, all the boys loved him, but management had moved on, and it was a whole different product, and it was it was just too long. There was Bobby would have never fit at all in the WWE. Not only the he wouldn't have. He wouldn't like the the road schedule and the and the the towns were more up up north and unfamiliar and foreboding. But also the 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 culture in the locker room where everybody had little groups that was so pronounced. It would just and and that the hard rings up until ninety seven, and then the the temper tantrums and political ploys and the. All that other stuff, it wouldn't have been the rest fun wrestling business to Bobby Eaton. I don't even think the last few years of WCW was the fun wrestling business to Bobby Eaton. Two of the um, coolest things he did after 1992, though, were outside of WCW. In 93, we got to see him once again with you and Stan and with Tom Pritchard, and including that legendary match at the Bluegrass Brawl, which is one of the classic Smoky Mountain wrestling matches ever. And... In ECW in 94, the surprise appearance, which was really cool because that Philly crowd always loved the Midnight Express. Yeah. And for one last time, I mean, did a couple dates there, but especially that surprise first appearance, they got to see beautiful Bobby. Not WCW's beautiful Bobby, but Philadelphia's beautiful Bobby. Yeah. And they exploded for him. Well, and that was, um, obviously, he got the ECW spot because Paulie sued him and got him and Arn Anderson in a settlement. Um, I got him and Arn Anderson. Funny how, you know, everybody that wanted WCW talent wanted Bobby Eaton and Arn Anderson. Um, because Watts was there and that's where we had started the, the exchange and the, the super brawl thing. And we, you know, et cetera, the way it came about was that Watts had seen that they had been using Bobby in different ways and they wanted to repackage him. He wanted to leave him off television for a few months and then bring him back because Bo obviously Bill Watts wants to use Bobby Eaton, but he felt that he'd been devalued the way he'd been presented. So he said, how about I've sent him up to you for uh, the next few months? You know, you can use him on your TV. They were still paying him, as I understand, on his contract. And th but then we'll bring him in and, and, you know, put a fresh coat of paint on him and present him in a more positive fashion. And then... I'd asked and got the dates, asked for and got the dates on Arn because that was a perfect, you know, way to complete the Rock and Roll Express team. If I've got three heavenly bodies, Stan Lane, Tom Pritchard, and 
Bobby Eaton, then if I get three members of the Rock and Roll Express and it's Arn Anderson, Arn not only knows the business and would understand how to have this match, but is close friends with Bobby. And so they cleared me for those, what, uh, three or four dates on Arn that we got. And that was going to be the start of similar shit where Watts would send guys that he wanted to give a new look to. He'd send them to me for a few months, or I would be sure to funnel my promising young talent to him. And it's the same thing we ended up doing with the WWE. We just didn't get a chance to do it with WCW because they fucked Watts and I wasn't going to deal with anybody else. But that was, and then Bobby apologized to me for that, uh, that run. He was there. What was it? Eight weeks, 10 weeks. But he said corn because he had been real sick with the flu or something right before he came in and he'd still had a problem with his breathing and he said, Corn, I don't really, I didn't hardly get my win back until the last couple of weeks I was there. I don't think I did a good enough job for Bobby. Bobby, as long as you showed up, you did a great enough job for me. Let's fast forward, if you don't mind. I'd like to know what it was like for the Midnight Express reunion shows that you started doing in what, 2003, 2004? 2004. 2004. 2004. Two, two weeks after Bubba passed away was our first one. Because that's what upset me then was that you know, we would have got a chance to be all together, but, um, well, it, here's the thing and trying to go back and do this as uh, clearly and concisely as possible. Dennis left in March of 1987. Nobody ever knew why, including me and Bobby for a long time. As a result, there was never heat amongst the team. There was consternation, befuddlement. Where the fuck did Dennis go? And then there was some element of how could he have done this? Because we're still, and, and you know, a main event fucking earning six figures plus each <clears throat> attraction. And suddenly we turn around and he just ain't there. And we don't see him for a year and a half. So, but there was no heat, there was no fight, there was no, you know, disagreements or whatever. So we soldiered on with Stan and Stan fit right in because we'd all known each other again and he was smart to tag team wrestling and it fit and he was in need of a spot then. So he was anxious to prove himself because that was, it was going to end up being his fairly, fairly much his last big run there because normally the Fabs was a pretty big run, and you would have thought that would have been the one you get, but he got a second one even bigger. But anyway, um, when Dennis came back at the, to do the original Midnight Midnight Angle, as we mentioned, he, he showed back up in the AWA back in the wrestling business because when he left us for a year, he was nowhere. We didn't know where he was, and then – all that we knew was the travel agent found that he had some tickets that Crockett had already given him for the towns he's booked in, and he changed them for a ticket to Denver, Colorado. So that's all we knew for a long time was that Dennis is in Denver some kind of way. Well, then the AWA had started. They needed talent. They were on their dying days. They were doing the TV in Las Vegas as close to Denver, and they needed quality guys, so they made a deal with Dennis to come back and work with Randy Rose and Paul Lee as the original Midnight, and they had the run on TV as the AWA Tag Team Champions. We still didn't have a phone number or anything on Dennis, and, you know, we didn't know at the time, so we're not, well, not going to fucking find him. But then when, you know, the AWA was... It, but the the original Midnight, I can't remember now chapter and verse, but the original Midnight was finished with the AWA, even if the AWA wasn't completely finished at that point. Paul Lee had called me, because of course we knew each other, and I said, well, you want to fucking come in if we can work it out? And so that's when I went and pitched the angle to Dusty, um, have them come in, let's do the feud over the name, hit me with the phone. Uh, I've told this story before. Dusty asked me and Bobby, he didn't ask Stan because Stan it wouldn't have had a vested interest in this. He said, I won't bring Dennis Condry back unless you and Bobby say yes, because he left before. I said, no, this is, isn't good. We've, we've talked, uh, I've talked to Paul Lee. They're all on board. 
And the first time that me and Bobby actually saw Dennis, that time was when he got to Atlanta TV that day. And he still didn't explain to us what had gone on because there was kind of a little cold. But then we did the angle and everybody went crazy over it and blah, blah, blah. We didn't know it was going to be fucked up shortly afterwards. But anyway, that lasted, as we've talked about, 10 or 12 weeks or whatever it was. And then <laughs> Dusty loses the book. Crockett gets it, books us a loser leave town match because he doesn't like Randy Rose's work, wants to get Dennis a new partner. George Scott comes in, says he'd rather keep the original Midnight and get rid of me and fucking Bobby and Stan. It was a goddamn clusterfuck. And then, because Dennis didn't, agree to come in for a different partner because Crockett didn't realize that the whole deal was that Randy and Dennis were the original Midnight Express. It fucked the whole thing up and Dennis no-showed again. And we didn't say that was 1989 and we didn't see him again until 2004. And then he had made an appearance uh, at, at one of the wrestling shows in Birmingham and gave his phone number to several people and he was in the process of moving back from Denver to Alabama, and that's when uh, we were we got his number, and I called. We all everybody called and talked to each other, and that's when he was able to tell me and Bobby what it was, and and I'm not going to say that now. What it was, it was nothing to do with the wrestling business, and it was nothing to do with us. And we would have understood if he told us, and that he said that was his one regret that he didn't. So then we started doing the reunions and the first one was in Kingsport, Tennessee at the, at the old civic auditorium up there, Ron Wright country, um, a match with the rock and roll express. And then the following week, uh, that was just Bobby and Dennis and I, and then the following week, it was all four of us with Stan at ring of honor in Philly for that big return. And then with the fan fests and, legend shows and et cetera for several years. I wasn't at, at most of them cause I was, I was doing OVW and then I went to TNA, but I was at a lot of the bigger ones, especially the fan fest, but Bobby and Dennis, especially wrestled quite on quite a few shows and, and drew some money into Carol. I think they did a show in the Carolinas with the rock and roll in Lenore. Well, they did. I know they did three or four sellouts at that Lenore rec center, 2000 people. Uh, three or four sellouts in a row, but I think most of those matches were with the Rock and Roll Express. They were, uh, they were doing good business at that point. But you know, Dennis was in better shape than most everybody else because he took a significant chunk of time off. So, but anyway, that you know, that was the that was more fun because we used to joke about it. We used to say, "Jesus Christ." these fan fests, everybody's so happy to see us and so happy to get their pictures taken. And we make the same thing. We used to have to drive a 500 mile round trip, take bumps, get beat up and potentially stabbed or jumped on by fans and, uh, you know, have our cars trashed. Then <laughs> the fans at Alexandria, Louisiana found out after the, the uh, tape aired where we tarred and feathered, magnum ta on television in order to shame them into giving us a shot of the titles calling him a chicken the fans recognized bobby's car outside the hotel we were staying at in alexandria the week after that tv show played and they tarred and feathered his car but anyway uh so we used to get oh in lake charles they took dennis condry's van that he bought from stan lane and almost doomed us all in lake charles they took uh, glue and shot it in all the door keyholes back when your door <laughs> still had keyholes and they took lipstick and they would color over the, the headlights so that you couldn't see out on the highway. And that's the place where they used to put, uh, Drano and water pistols to be able to, because the cops were so good, they had the heels surrounded. So they would try to shoot you in the eyes with the Drano with the water pistol. They were creative, but yeah, Bobby, uh, uh, he took forever to get the tarred feathers off his car at Alexandria and Dennis had to have, I can't remember what he had to have done to get the, uh, glue out of the keyholes. We all had to get key locking gas tank lids to, uh, custom on our cars because people would sugar the fucking tank. Jim, I had a question for you, but before I get to that, I just want to let the listeners know, let the people who are on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel know that we're going to be doing a compilation of some of the great 
stories you've told in the past about Bobby. We're compiling them, and over the next several days, we hope to have an omnibus of Bobby Eaton stories up on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. So be on the lookout for that. And and that and that that's kind of tough because of, so many of them are sprinkled in and other conversations. But we you know we've got some good stuff out there, and I don't know whether I've told some of these again today or whether the but we wanted to find some to get as much out there as we could. So there you go. What was your question? Well, I was going to ask you because we've seen a lot of active wrestlers talk about Bobby since his passing. And there are a lot of younger wrestlers out there who may have never worked with Bobby, probably never saw him live. Everything you watch with him, you could learn something, but are there any specific matches or things in matches that you think wrestlers could learn from that they should be learning from? I think if 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 you're a professional wrestler and you want to study Bobby Eaton, there's different eras and different different versions of the Midnight Express. In Louisiana, we were it was an old fashioned heat territory where we were heels on top, expected to fucking draw and to have heat and to get the baby faces over, and it was personal issues and angles and a lot more, you know, just wildness in the matches, and you can really see the young Bobby Eaton, if you go back and like I said, the the matches with the Rock and Roll Express, a lot of the Houston stuff is still out there because Paul taped his house shows, Paul Bosch. Um, I, I know there's some stuff with uh, Magnum and Wrestling 2 on YouTube, but watch. I won't say everything that it, it, I mean, there was some stuff even in Mid-South in 84. There, uh, <laughs> I watched one match we had with Brickhouse Brown and George Wells, and I was like, oh, my God. Um, Go find a Sonny King match. Well, yeah, thankfully we did. Only in the Superdome did we cross <laughs> paths with Sonny, and I liked Sonny as a person. But, um, but Magnum TA and Wrestling Two watch the crowd react to what Bobby's doing. The Rock and Roll Express not only watch Bobby's work with both Ricky and Robert, but how the crowd reacted to him. Then in in Crockett, it depends on if you do you want to watch. You know, it's not as beautiful and technically perfect tag team matches, but that match with the Road Warriors from Raleigh that was on television with Baby Doll punches me in the back of the head to finish that one. But it, it shows Bobby working with guys like Hawk and Animal that did absolutely nothing related to his style, but he fit what he did to them. Um, obviously anything in Crockett with the rock and roll express, but also the Southern boys, great American bash. If you want to see how to put a tag team match together, that's not a grudge match and it's not a bloody fight. It's just to get people excited in, in an arena. That Southern boys match was tremendous. All the matches with the fantastics, um, and Brian Pillman and zinc for that matter. Uh, Brian Pillman, the only other guy I was with, Flair, when he was Booker and I was on his team for six months, and the only two guys he specifically wanted to have singles matches with that he asked for were Bobby Eaton and Brian Pillman. So not only watch the way Bobby did things, but watch the way the people reacted to it because of the way he reacted to what the other guys did. Not just selling, but selling it. The, the, uh, the, the definition of selling something is you make somebody else buy it. The people bought what was going on because he was, he made it his own and got it over. Um, so any of those matches and, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's so much out there, but uh, obviously I wouldn't, I know most of the younger generation, if they saw the midnight and rock and roll in person at all, saw the reunion matches and I'm not going to say those were bad matches because the people in every venue enjoyed seeing it. But what you were getting was, you know, a, a legends match and not all of those guys in their in their prime when they shocked everybody with what was going on. But, uh, you know, that's that's the thing is they could adapt. Not only the, the rock and roll are still going because they they adapted to what they could do rather than you know, uh, trying to do things they couldn't do anymore. And it's, so it still worked. And with Ricky's, he's, he's insane. But, uh, but I would suggest matches like those, if you wanted to, uh, especially all the pay-per-view stuff is out there, thankfully, you know, from WCW, but, uh, some of the house show matches 
and some of the the uh, stuff that was only VHS taped or whatever, or the you know the stray things that you find out there that weren't ever released, like the Houston stuff in their entirety. That's some of the best indication of Bobby Eaton because whether he was on pay per view or whether he was in Fayetteville at the Cumberland County Memorial Arena, uh, he worked the same way in large part because he was a professional. It just, I've told you the story before. I know I've told you this from the time that we were after we went to, after we were in Louisiana, right? When we got to Crockett was really when I started doing this a lot, but we started a little bit in Louisiana. As soon as they'd start the match, Bobby would get in the ring and he'd lock up with somebody and he'd grab a hold. And he would look at me. If I was leaning on my right hand, my chin on my right hand, I'd have like three fingers up on the, I meant we were getting a $300 payoff. And he might crank up on the headlock and call one tackle, drop down, hip toss, get it again. But if I've got all five fingers up, he's going to call, uh-oh, one tackle, drop down, hip toss, knee lift, over the top rope. (laughs) And if I'm leaning on my left hand and I've got a one finger up, that means a grand. And then he's taking every bump in sight. But he always gave everybody his his best effort. He was just judicious sometimes with how badly he was going to destroy himself. Did he ever mess up the Alabama Jam? You know, there there was, as a matter of fact, there was one. I'll tell you where it was. It was the it was the match with Flair and Wyndham at the Clash of Champions. Where, if you notice, when he does the Alabama Jam, he doesn't get any height, and he kind of does a double thumbs up kind of maneuver as he's coming off. That's because he had a crossed rib that now he thought it was broken, but it was crossed. You know, when your rib gets crossed, it Ooh. fucking feels like a broke rib, right? He'd been working with a crossed rib for like a week or two at that. <laughs> so, so he didn't get the height on that one, but mess one up, mess anything up. I mean, there were missed spots sometimes, but anything he did off the top rope, he never heard anybody any time that I was ever in his presence, and it usually looked good. I don't recall him ever really messing anything off the top rope up. Uh, every once in a while, a spot's going to go awry, miss the third arm drag or whatever. But, um, well, it, the the match, and I'll tell you, here's, and this, uh, I think it was Dax, it may have been Cash too, but both of them tweeted out that their favorite midnight match was, because they're tag team specialists, and this was a, as far as a tag team match goes, this was probably better than anything with the rock and roll from a pure technical standpoint. Rock and roll just brought so much emotion from the people. But the one hour that we did on Worldwide Wrestling, the U.S. tag team title match where they beat us in Chattanooga, it was the whole hour. It was a 40-something minute match, but it went the whole hour of the syndicated TV show. All day uh that day was when i believe yeah that was the match bobby was he had 102 degree fever and he'd been puking in the locker room already at the building much less being sick before we got there and that's the big time where dusty is because dusty would only do the one match goes the whole show with people that he not only trusted to do it, but people that were really figured in, he wanted to get something over. Nobody got that much time on TV in those days, except Ric Flair or the Midnight Express. So he wasn't going to fucking say, no, can we do it in 20 minutes? So he went out there after he had been puking and had a fever and had, what was it, voted third best match of the year in three different bulletins or whatever the fuck. And it's still the favorite match of tag teams today. But that's just because he wasn't going to fucking let anybody down. And he never did. And anyone who saw the Midnight Express or Bobby Eaton wrestle, it's always a memorable experience. And I only got to see Bobby live once. And it was memorable because it was Philadelphia, an awful show, Halloween Havoc 92. And the opening match was the babyface, this poor team. Tom Zink, Shane Douglas, and Johnny Gunn, Tom Brandy. Oh, who that Philadelphia crowd just loathed. And then out to Bad Street, USA, Michael Hayes, Arn and Bobby. And it was like, a you know, other than Hayes, who people like because he was the Freebirds, but Arn and Bobby had that Philadelphia history. It was like a homecoming. It was the place went nuts for Arn and Bobby and Hayes. You know, I I think that's (sighs) the last 20 years or however long it's been. And I mean, Bobby's been going and he's been 
doing independent shows. He obviously hasn't been able to wrestle for the last several years, but he would make appearances, do fan fests. He's done seminars. And I just think that I wish that he could have had something to transition into. I think he lost something when he couldn't wrestle anymore that he couldn't, he couldn't get back in his life. I mean, he loved his grandkids. And he loved his kids and he's, he was, you know, you'd always see him happy. One of the younger guys mentioned, Hey, I saw this legend, Bobby Eaton, a few years ago, come into this podunk town. And it was just like, he was happy as to be there as he was happy to be anywhere in his whole life. It's because he was, he was in the locker room and he came to a wrestling show. And I mean, I'm not going to tell you that he didn't either laugh or roll his eyes at all the things that's going on with wrestling. Bobby never really knocked anybody, but he, you know, it wasn't the business he got in. He wasn't the business that he grew up on or whatever, but he was, he just wanted to be a part of wrestling and be that, you know, when you do that from the time he was 16, like I said, you go to the locker room, you hang out with the boys, you have fun and you go out and you be the best in the world at what you do. It it just hadn't been the same on him, and I don't think he had anything else in his life to transition to on a professional basis or a, otherwise in his family that that you know he either had the aptitude for the or the interest in or just the you know it just it, it seems like when somebody is that far ahead of almost everybody else at one thing that they do sometimes you know it's a shortcoming that they don't have. Uh, something else to fall back on. Um, but I think he's missed that because still, you know, you, if like, he, I've got messages where he, I've still got them on my voicemail and, and I won't erase them where he would call me. If, he wouldn't call me and say, corny is Bobby. He'd call me and say, Jim Cornette is Sterling Brewer. Who was the announcer for the Birmingham TV in the seventies that nobody in the world, but me and him still remembers. Or he, if he'd call it Cordy, how big's George Hultz? I'd say six, six, two seventy six, Cause that's the way the big George Hultz was announced in 1974 in Birmingham or whatever. Um, and he was the first, was he the first person to call you corny? Yes. <laughs> corny <laughs> or corn. And then Stan, uh, elongated it to Cornelius J. Cornette. Uh, but yeah, corn, Hey corn. Uh, but yeah, you know, he, he, he just call you on the phone and just, it would be something that would pop me and him, but nobody else would get it. But that's what he did in, in his time at home these days, or, you know, before he was, had his grandkids around, that was the happiest he'd get. He'd be sitting with a, some, you know, bubble gum and a, a bottle of pop and watching wrestling on TV, whether it's old wrestling or new wrestling, whether it's something with a ring. And, but anyway, I was, I talked to him Saturday afternoon and he sounded like himself. I talked to him the previous, what was it, Wednesday, and he obviously was not happy about being in the hospital and didn't seem to feel too good. But Saturday he was perky and he sounded like Bob. And I was trying to pump him up a little bit because, you know, with Donna just going and uh, uh, being in turmoil, and I think that had a lot to do with it. Probably is his routine, his schedule got all upended. People coming and going and, and you know, Bobby never let anything get on him or le never bother him outwardly. I mean, one time I'll, I'll back this up and I'll come back to the talk on Saturday and second, but when he was living in Charlotte in Pineville down the street from Arn and me, I went over there one day and this, when he had all three kids, I think I was setting up Smoky mountain, but I hadn't moved to Tennessee yet. And I pull up out in front of his house and he, oh, he had a couch and, and an easy chair on his front porch. So he could sit out on a front porch when he was home. Right. And he, they had a couple cars in a driveway and I guess there's, Dylan, what well, Dustin, his oldest, was on a skateboard, and Donna had Elvis music playing and a speaker in the window, and Taryn was playing with some of the neighborhood kids, and and Dylan, the little one, was something else was going on, and, and there was some dogs running around, 
it was like the center of activity in the whole neighborhood. I said, and he's just sitting there drinking his beer. I said, Bobby, when do the dancing bears show up? What the fuck's going on here? It's a goddamn concert and a garden party. It just, and it, but he's just sitting, you know, having a good time. But so Saturday, I was trying to, you know, uh, pep you up a little bit, getting out of the hospital, take care of yourself and take your medicine because <sighs> I was going to talk about this later on and I will talk about it later on another time. We were making plans for some stuff for the midnight Express's 40th anniversary, which is going to be 2023 and was going to be 2023, 2024. And we did the book for the 25th anniversary. We did a live tour of some shows for 35th. And this time we'd uh, been putting together a, merchandise deal and some cool one of a kind shit and stuff that hadn't been done before. And, and there may still be a way we can do that and benefit Bobby's kids, or grandkids or whatever, but anyway, and explaining to him that, Hey, we're going to, you know, this cameo thing as uh, I'd mentioned to, we were going to maybe think about doing some cameos with all four of us. Um, if we got together to do a signing thing, we were talking about, anyway, I was giving him, the point is, you know, he was excited about that. He still had some stuff. Obviously if he's, the was the kind of guy where uh, Bobby people all over the world love you. Oh, come on corn. No, but you know, shh. and I wanted to let him know people still remembered and had, you know, these feelings for him. And anyway, so he seemed excited about all that. And and that's when I got a chance to tell him thank you for everything that he had done for me. And I said that, you know, we would be getting together in a month or two and, and doing this other shit and just take care of himself. And that's at least that's the last time I got to talk to him. And it was all positive And he was in a good mood and Brian Thompson had taken him from the hospital home and said that he talked about it a couple of different times. Wow. It was a good call. You know, we're going to have some things happening or whatever. And I just hope that, you know, he kept that, you know, that in his mind and kept that, that mood going. Um, <clears throat> I love you, Bobby Lee. And I always will. Thank you for everything.